Start the camera. Camera. Good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, we delayed a little for a few minutes so that everyone can log in. I, I'm sure the rest of the participants are going to continue logging in. So on the first and foremost, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the online symposium on molecular imaging and stem cells organized by Department of Biophysics of the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. This symposium is a sequel to our workshop on molecular imaging and stem cells we had held in the year 2018. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic year and lockdowns, we had to shift it into the online symposium. Stem cell biology is a rapidly developing field and a lot of it is due to the advancement in a modern day microscopic techniques. Images observed in real time reveal much about physiology and pathology. So despite its short history, rapid developments in molecular imaging have revolutionized our ability to visualize the intricate cellular machinery of macromolecular complexes, organelles and subcellular events. The symposium is a one-of-a-kind effort trying to bring together ideas and inspirations from the work of eminent research practitioners in imaging methods. The objective is to exhibit cutting-edge application and thus demonstrate how imaging can answer many biological questions. We will focus on modern-day microscopic techniques, probes and optical sensors, near infrared in vivo imaging, et cetera, and they've become integral part of research for both in vivo studies and in vitro work. The need for seeing is believing is further woven in stem cell research, not only to perform basic characterization of stem cells, but also as a key tool for understanding biodistribution, survival, engraftment of transplanted stem cells or their progeny. Sessions will include recent exciting examples of technology that can distill life down to its natural dynamic forms and at the subcellular level. I hope we all can derive the most value out of this symposium in the upcoming two days as our eminent speakers share the secrets of the knowledge and experience with us. With this, we will move on to our plenary talk. Here, I will give a brief introduction to our eminent scientist and speaker, Dr. Mahendra Rao. He is a pioneer and an eminent scientist in the field of stem cell biology. Dr. Rao received his MD from Bombay University and his PhD in developmental neurobiology from California Institute of Technology. He is internationally known for his research on human embryonic stem cells and other somatic stem cells for over two decades not only in the academic aspects of the field, but also in government, regulation, and industrial and clinical applications of stem cells. His association with academia includes prestigious faculty positions in renowned institutions such as National Institute of Health and the Buck Institute for Age Research, as the founding member of the Center for regenerative medicine at NIH. He oversaw the generation of 400 induced pluripotent stem cell lines for use in clinical therapies in a range of degenerative disorders. Dr. Rao has published more than 300 papers on stem cell research and, in the, and is the co-founder of the neural stem cell companies IQ Therapeutics based in Salt Lake City, Utah and NXL in California. He has also served as a scientific advisor to several stem cell and regenerative medicine companies and foundations such as Life Technologies, New York Stem Cell Foundation, Thermogenesis, Astrom, Stemputics, Q Therapeutics, and the list goes on. Dr. Rao has served in advisory panels to the government of the US, Singapore, and India on HSC and IPSC policy and continues to work with the FDA and other regulatory authorities on PSC related issues, most recently as the CIRM and ISSCR liaison to, be, to the ISCD. 
Dr. Rao also serves on several scientific advisory boards of pharmaceutical companies, editorial boards of journals and oversight committees, and advisory panels on large-scale projects related to stem cell biology. In addition, he is at present the Chief Executive Officer at Pansala, Maryland, USA. Dr. Rao is an accomplished leader in the field of stem cell biology and was recently named as one of the top 10 influential people in the field of stem cells. He was honored recently by the Federation of Biologists in India for his achievements in the field of stem cells and awarded the NBRI medal for his contributions to neuroscience research. With this introduction, I would request Dr. Rao to start out the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Indrani, for that kind introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. If you can, just give me a thumbs up, Indrani, so that I know that you can hear me. Yes, you're, we can hear you. Great. You can go ahead, sir. So just thank you, everyone, for the introduction. I just wanted to highlight one more thing before I start on my talk. Perhaps one achievement that you didn't hear about was that I've been fortunate to be interacting with Nimhans on the work that's being done on iPSC generation and looking at uh, hereditary uh, gene effects on uh, mental disorders. But I won't talk about any of that today. Today, what I'm going to try and focus on is on work that we have been trying to do with using stem cells for therapy. And the work that I'm going to talk about is work that we've done to a large extent at a company called Implant Therapeutics. Implant Therapeutics is a subsidiary of Pancella, where I am the CEO. And I'm going to use iPSC-derived MSC and islets as examples of what can be done with the newer versions of therapy that are now in place. But I want to emphasize one thing before I talk about our own work, and that is that many other companies and many other groups are doing similar work. So this is not to say that what we are doing is the first or the best. It's simply to point out that these are examples of what where we have data. So this I know this is a busy slide, but I'm going to try and walk you through this carefully, uh, and I hope it makes sense. So. The biggest problem with using cells for therapy is what we've learned from transplanting adult stem cells into humans. And what we've learned are that there are two major problems with doing this. One problem is that the immune system recognizes self from non-self. And when it does that, it mounts an immune response and causes rejection. A second big problem with using dividing cells in transplanting them in vivo has been the issue of them continuing to divide because they don't recognize stop signals which are present at the site of transplantation. And so you can get a tumor. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cancer because a tumor is a growing mass and it can have mass effects as well as the capability of being transformed so that you can subsequently get a tumor. And you've probably heard of many of these complications that have occurred which have resulted in a failure to be able to use cells for therapy. So our company and many other different groups have been trying to approach this and see if this can be solved. And I'm going to highlight the basic idea. So one idea was, look, we can't make individual cells for everyone in a personalized way, but perhaps we can make cells which can be used in every individual. And the way to do that is to make them universal by bypassing the immune system. And the two basic strategies that have been used are highlighted in the top two parts of the slide. One is you can make them universal by overexpressing immune suppressive genes. And Dr. Andras Naj, uh, who's at the University of Toronto pioneered this method. He used a set of eight different genes without knocking out HLA loci and showed that just overexpressing these set of eight immune suppressive genes 
was sufficient to fool the immune system so that foreign cells could be transplanted into that individual for a period of up to eight, two years when he was doing the work with mice. And uh, similar work has been done in marmosets in a primate and shown that that would allow the cells to survive for indefinitely in such an individual. A second strategy which was pioneered by a company called Universal Cells, which was subsequently bought by Estellus, was to say, well, we can act, inactivate the immune system by just knocking out class one and class two HLA loci. Luckily for us, both of those uh, HLA loci on the same chromosome, chromosome six, and there are simple strategies for being able to knock them out. And once you knock them out, then T cells and B cells can't recognize the cells that are transplanted. However, we have additional pathways uh, which need to, which can still attack the cells, and that includes the innate immune response. And what people figured out were different ways to be able to do it. I won't go into many of the methods that were used to do that, except to point out that basically the idea was either you can add one of the atypical HLA genes back, such as HLA G or HLA E or you can express a subset of some of these immune suppressive factors like PDL1 or uh, CCL12 or CD200 or CD47, which, is, which specifically inhibits some aspects of the uh, innate immune pathway. At Pencella, we have done both. We've done this. And here, instead of expressing HLAG or HLAE to make them universal, we've expressed uh, two cytokines called IL-10 and MIF-1-alpha. However, once you do this, you do get universal cells, but it causes another problem. And that problem is that the immune system is your primary system to protect you from cancer. And so now you have cells which are capable of dividing. You've made them immune to being recognized by the immune system. And perhaps if they get transformed, then they will form a truly sort of aggressive cancer. And that's known uh, to happen. And so one has to figure out a way to be able to control that problem. And what people have done is to try and use something called um, suicide gene therapy. And different strategies exist. And I'm just going to point out one that we have used. And what we have decided to do was to use take advantage of the fact that we have cell cycle genes and cell cycle genes are only active during the time when cells are cycling. So if you were to put in a suicide gene downstream of a cell cycling gene, then you would be able to kill the cells that are dividing, but because you don't have the gene being expressed in non-dividing cells, the functionally effective mature cells from these parent cells would continue to survive. So you wouldn't lose the effectiveness of your therapy but you would maybe perhaps kill the transformed cells. So that uh, was we called fail safe. So now you can imagine that these two technologies going together could give you a truly off the shelf safe therapy that could work. And so that's what we have been trying to do. And at Pencella, we have made what we call fail safe cloaked cells. Okay. So again, as I pointed out earlier, several companies have been working on this and I don't want to uh, try and give you examples from every one of them. So I'll just use our work as an example and I'll remind you that this does not mean that we are either first or the best. It simply means that's the data I have to be able to show to you. So we then sat down and as a company, you always have to think about what do you want to do first? And we decided that we would try and make iPSC derived MSC but do it from universal cloaked cells. And the reason we did that was simply because we knew that many other companies had already been working on mesenchymal stem cells. There had been clinical trials done. Adult cells had been shown to be safe, but clearly there were problems with using adult stem cells because we didn't have really successful use as, as what people call a home run with using these cells. And the reason for that was very simple. Initially, people had thought that MSCs are immune privileged. Subsequent papers, which I've shown on the right, showed that these are not really truly immune privileged. And we know that you can develop antibodies and you can get rejection. And therefore, MSC therapy 
can be used for short-term use of cells, but you can't do multiple injections and you can't uh, do long-term implantation of bone cartilage or connective tissue, even though these cells can successfully be uh, used to generate therapeutically useful quantities of these cell types. So we decided if that's the case, then if we could make MSC in a reasonable way, we would have a reasonable chance of being able to move forward as a product. And you know, as a company, you always have to worry about whether this can be done in a sufficiently efficient way and can you make multiple products from the same uh, cell type that you're manufacturing. And so that's what I've tried to summarize in this slide. So you can imagine we could start with an IPSC cell. We could engineer it in some way to make it HLA null or hypoimmunogenic or make them sort of universal by overexpressing candidate genes or knocking out class one or class two. We could then put in a targeted gene which we needed to express at high quantity so that we could use it for ex vivo gene therapy. We could either make exosomes from them and use them as therapy. We could make cytokines and growth factors and use the cell as a delivery agent, or we could use it to deliver vaccine. And in fact, some people have actually used this for COVID-19 uh, antigen or antibody delivery uh, in terms of uh, therapy. Or you could take the MSC and you could differentiate it into all the cells it can is known to differentiate into. Notice I've only put the mesenchymal uh, derivatives because that's what I think MSC can really make. And you can now uh, get differentiated cells which can incorporate and survive for a really long time. So we think that this is how one could use it. And we could just simply make sure that we can manufacture and engineer these cells effectively. And so that's what we did. We just simply took pluripotent stem cells we made a master cell bank of those cells. We subcloned that bank. We edited it, found the right clone. We took that and made a master cell bank of that. We made MSC from that. We made a progenitor of the MSC so that we would have a large number of cells. And we showed that not only could we engineer at this stage, but we could engineer at the MSC progenitor stage so that we could get multiple products relatively quickly. We could get unmodified cells, we could engineer so that we could express genes at a safe harbor locus, we could make hypoimmunogenic class one, class two null, uh, overexpressing IL-10, MIF-1 alpha, or we could do further engineering and enhance the differentiation and be able to make multiple differentiated cell products. So common manufacturing protocol, we could use a closed system for being able to do this. This is quite scalable. And since we can use downstream engineering, so regulatory process and approval would be easier, and we could make a cryopreserved uh, product that can be shipped relatively easily. What's also important here, which I want to emphasize is, all of these technologies are relatively straightforward. So whether one did this in the United States or done, did it in India, or you did it somewhere else, where you wanted to, this should all be possible to do. So of course, when you come up with an idea like this and you make a process like this, you as a company or when you really want to go to the clinic, you want to make sure you have all the licenses and freedom to operate. And I, I'm not going to go through all of this except to say it takes a village. You need multiple uh, technologies and multiple licenses to be able to do it. And what I've highlighted in this slide is simply different companies that we had to go get licenses to, whether it was to using transposons, which we use, or CRISPR-Cas9, which we use, or the ability to differentiate using known patented technology, or whether we had to use uh, specific cell types for which we had to get a license for. As you can see, senses as well. But we got all of these things together. So we knew that we could make MSC and that we could make them with freedom to operate so that we could take them to the clinic. The next step, of course, here is not only do you know, need to know how to make it, you need to be able to make it in a cost-effective, scalable way, which is GMP-able, so that you can use good manufacturing practices to manufacture the cells. And again, all of these slides are complicated slides, but the basic idea is always been the same. You have to figure out whether you have a system, how much time does it take to grow the cells, and how do you test it so that you can do the appropriate tests in a quick and reliable way to define the cell for a release assay that you have. 
we chose to use a system which is made by a company called Terumo BCT. BCT stands for Canadian uh, system. And uh, the advantage of this is it's a hollow fiber perfusion system, which I may, may describe in detail if I have time. And you can control the loading of the cells and the number of cells that you get in, so it's quite consistent. And because it's a closed system, you can keep it on a lab a bench and you don't need to have that really high expense that you would have if you were using a true GMP suite. So you start with MSC in a flask, you put them through this system, you get a large number of cells and the total process takes between 10 to 12 days. So you have a manufactured cell that uh, in sufficient numbers that you can use it for a wide variety of therapy. We have standard animal models that you can use for being able to test the ability of the cell and markers and uh, using either antibodies or facts to be able to define the cell quality. And you have standard growth kinetics that you can test and you can test the differentiation and ability so that you have good release criteria for the kind of cell you want to make. So now I just want to very quickly point out a couple of additional things here to just say that since you're using the system, you can imagine that you want to harvest the cell, you want to harvest the cytokines, you want to harvest the exosome, but the manufacturing process should be more or less similar when you're doing this. And the reason I point this out was, we think that you can make exosomes as well using exactly the same process. However, because you can engineer the MSC, you can make specialized exosomes or super exosomes if you like, where you can load them with a known candidate by just expressing it at high levels so that the cell works as an exosome factory in packaging what you need into the right exosome structure. And again, this is not novel. There are different companies who have shown that this can be used. And what you now always have to decide is, do I want to use exosomes or do I want to use cells and which is more cost effective to manufacture? Okay. So now we know that we can make the cells we know how to manufacture them in a reasonable way. We know that there are different steps in engineering and we have the licenses and freedom to operate to be able to do that with all of these different engineering techniques. So I just want to point out what were the engineering techniques and remind you about them and then highlight why we use different ones to be able to do this. So ignore all the detailed characteristics, they're there in case people with the requisite expertise have want to ask me specific questions. The important thing is that we're not using lentivirus, we're not using adenovirus, but we're using gene engineering uh, and we're using transposon technology. And the reason for that is that transposons generally enter the genome, but at non-active sites. So the chance of hitting an active gene or causing a mutation is much lower compared to using lentivirus or other integrating retroviruses. And instead of doing it randomly, we can also go into a specific site. These are known as safe harbor sites. Safe harbor sites are well-tested sites. We know that you can get expression and that even if you use different cell lines, you can get expression of exactly the same amount in the same way at different stages of differentiation of the cells so that uh, you can get very good consistency when you're manufacturing. So many years ago, my lab had identified a safe harbor site in chromosome 13. This is very similar to the well-known site in chromosome 19, which is the adeno-associated uh, safe harbor site. This chromosome 13 site is near a gene called Clibel. And what we did was we showed that we can insert this complicated construct. It doesn't matter what the construct really looks like. I'll highlight a couple of important pieces of this construct. A couple of important pieces are that there's an insulator, what that does is it makes sure that the gene is insulated from uh, silencing. And so you get uh, reasonable high levels of expression, even when the cells differentiate and when the cells recognize foreign DNA, they don't methylate and silence it. We put in some LOXP sites. So LOXP allows for cassette mediated exchange. So you can put in a selection vector and then remove it. So that allows you to do the engineering relatively quickly. But if you notice, we don't have just one set of LOXP sites, we actually have two sets of LOXP sites. And the reason for that is this can be also used to do what's called cassette mediated exchange so that we can replace what we want 
with any new gene so that you're using the same manufacturing process and you can now make multiple clones expressing different factors in a very quick way. We use CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out B2M and C2TA. This is the class one and class two HLA genes that are really critical in terms of making them hypoimmunogenic. And we got a license from Sigma Merck, which allows us to do that. And uh, that means that this is, becomes relatively easy to do. CRISPR-Cas9 is much cheaper than using other methods and is much quicker than using other methods of being able to do this. Okay. So, okay, you know, it's, I, I presented all this to you and I've said that this is a great idea and this should work and look, we can make it and we can make it in large quantities and we have all of this freedom to operate. But success only comes when other people believe what you're doing actually works. And so, again, without going through a lot of this in detail, we were very pleasantly surprised and very pleased that when we went out and we tried to get partners to be able to do it, all of these people were quite convinced that what we were doing was the right way to go. And we were able to sign up either research agreements or licenses with many. I want to emphasize that not all of these people are companies that we've already signed license with, but maybe 90% of these we've already have signed agreements with the others are either in the process of negotiation or uh, close okay, to being able to do that. Okay. So I just want to then give you one example of how one could use this and that's uh, and how quickly one can go to the clinic. And I just want to give you an example of what are called lysosomal storage diseases. Lysosomal storage diseases are hereditary disorders. There are more than 200 of them. All of them require a missing enzyme of some kind. And uh, people know that these mutations uh, invariably lead to death, but it's long and prolonged. And we know that we can treat these individuals, except that the treatment is quite expensive because when you make the missing enzyme, you have to give either daily or weekly injections. And those injections cost a lot of money. And the average cost for treating somebody with, say, Fabry's disease is maybe like $200,000 or $300,000 a year. And so the idea just was, well, if we could use cells, cells could be these little factories which made these uh, enzymes, and we should be able to transplant these cells. And if they were universal cells, it should be very cheap to do this for all the individuals that have them. And if you remember, I said cassette media data exchange, so we could do all 200 uh, different uh, diseases in a relatively straightforward way by making 200 different subclones if we needed to. So we have been working with companies to be able to do that. Question, of course, is, is MSC a good cell to use or should we be using some other cell type? And that's the power of iPSC. If it turns out that using MSC is not a good way to go, we should be able to make another appropriate differentiated cell type that can be used to perform that kind of disease treatment. Okay. I, I want to then switch gears a little bit to say, once you have an appropriate idea and you know that it can be used in a particular system or for a particular indication, it's always important to see if your idea can be generalized so that you can use it for other cell types as well. And one obvious thing was that we might be able to use the same thing, not just for lysosomal storage disorders, but also for hemoglobinopathies. And here we could maybe imagine that for these sort of factor eight, factor nine deficiency and others, that we don't simply uh, try to treat the entire disease, though we could by making stem cells and transplanting them, maybe a short-term focus could be treating a joint where we could put the cells in so that you prevent bleeding in a joint, which is an important complication of the disease that you have been uh, treated. And the importance of mentioning something like this is to say, even though you might have a big goal in mind, when you're performing a therapeutic effort, you might want to take a small, easily manageable, uh, disease with a clear-cut readout to see whether your therapy is really actually effective or not effective. Okay. In the last few slides, I want to point out that even though you may have all of these things, it may not be easy to move forward towards the clinic with the technology that you have and the idea you have and the safety you have. And that's because all of these are essentially new things and they're experiments that you're going to be doing on human beings and who are patients. And so you, not just yourself, but also the regulators who are going to look at this will want to know and worry. 
So in our case, we were now using something which was relatively new in making hypoimmunogenic or cloaked or stealthed cells. And we were putting in a suicide gene and nobody knew how well or how effectively this would work. And we were saying, we're going to put them into humans and they're going to last forever in humans. Uh, and of course, it's going to treat this disease and it's going to cure people. But it all sounds exciting. We don't know what could go wrong. And so when we went to the regulators, they said, well, you know, this is a really great idea, but can you think of some intermediate where you can test all of this in a reasonable way where there's some level of safety as well? And so we thought about this a lot and we looked at what people had been doing with pancreatic islets. And there, there have been two different strategies on how they want to do work in pancreatic islets. One of them has been to say, look, we're going to uh, just transplant them into the liver, which is called the Edmonton protocol. And the other has been to say, well, once we make islets, we're not sure that they'll survive well, so we're going to put them into some kind of delivery vehicle. And there are several different uh, systems that have been used. I'm going to broadly classify them into pouches and encapsulation. And here is a list of different companies that make different kinds of pouches or, and different kinds of technology that's been used to be able to do this. So we had this aha moment and we said, great, as a test, as an intermediate, rather than saying we're going to put our cells in vivo, even though we're using them as delivery and we don't really need a pouch, maybe the safe first step is to really put the cells into a pouch and see how well they survive so that if there is a risk and something goes bad, we can take them out. And maybe we can use it uh, nevertheless and get a test by doing this in a safe way in humans. And so that's what we've been planning to do. And that meant we had to find a partner, a partner who has a pouch or who knows how to encapsulate cells. Or we had to find a partner who knew how to make pancreatic islets because we ourselves did not know how to do that. Luckily for us, we found partners for both, and I won't go into the, all of that detail, but that's what we've been trying to do. So there's a company here whose data I'm going to show, so I'm going to mention it. They're called Regenerative Medicine Solution. They had, uh, they're based out of Madison, Wisconsin. They had developed a four-step, actually they call it a seven-stage protocol, but it's really four major steps in which they were able to differentiate the cells so that they got what they call islet-like clusters. So we asked them whether they could take our cells, make islet-like clusters. So now we would have universal islet-like clusters and then see whether they could transplant them in a pouch. I won't show you all of the data, but I'll just give you the take-home message in the interest of time to say that this turned out to work. We were able to collect cells, send them to them, they were able to differentiate them, and those cells differentiated as effectively as unmodified parent cells that we also sent to them. And with that, we were able to show that we could get hypoimmunogenic pancreatic islets, which could be transplanted. We've just done the experiments by transplanting also into the liver in an animal model. Uh, we don't have the data yet. So hopefully we'll be able to tell you that some other time. So I'm going to end here by thanking everyone for the time and I'll leave myself open to any questions but before I go there I just wanted to tell you that I use remind you that I use these two cell types and the way we are trying to do this as examples so that you'd get the idea of what's happening we may be one of maybe a hundred companies which is doing that and I didn't have time to mention all of them but there's one set of experiments that are being done by different companies that I'd really like to emphasize because this may be important even when you think about what's being done for the nervous system. And that is using macrophages and NK cells for therapy. And there are some groups in India who are, being, who are trying to do that using iPSC-derived NK cells or iPSC-derived macrophages for therapy. So I'll stop here. And thank you for your time. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful presentation. It's not only that we got to know about universal cells, derived MSCs, so the product being universal MSCs, but also about uh, how NK cells and uh, macrophages are getting used or are 
good products for such kind of uh, attacking debilitating diseases. So uh, the session is open for questions. Till we get a few questions from the audience. Um, I would like your opinion a little more about uh, what would you state about using exosomes versus the using the cells themselves? So I have mixed feelings because it everything depends on the data, right? So exosomes have a certain advantage is that they're much smaller. You don't have to worry about HLA and rejection and they're widely distributed, right? On the other hand, if it costs you a lot of effort to purify exosomes, and if the amount that you can deliver is not much larger, and if the half-life of the exosome is shorter than the half-life of a cell, then it's just going to be one more step without any necessary advantage of using an exosome over using a cell. So you have to always weigh those sorts of things. And there's another big piece that people forget about using exosomes versus using cells is the body makes a huge amount of exosomes which are present in the serum, right? So when you add your own exosomes, it's just going to be diluted by the exosomes which are already there in the circulation. So yeah, you've got specialized exosomes, but you know, it's like if you add a little bit of color to a glass of milk, it's still going to look white, right? Yes. You'd have to add a lot of color before it starts looking different or making an effect that you can see. And that's been a big problem with when you try to do these things. True. A big challenge might be to shift it from preclinical to the clinical trial mode. So, and uh, about the um, retention of these cells, uh, these fail safe cloaked cells, which uh, Pansala and your company has come up with. So, uh, it's safe for any disease uh, model, be it in um, diabetes or be it in any disease model. What is the X number of retention days which you'll get to find uh, with a first administration? So that's really exciting work that was done with the embryonic stem cells made fail safe and cloaked, not with the IPSC lines that we have been testing ourselves. This was done by Dr. Naji before uh, we licensed the technology from his lab. But he took a mouse model and he put the cells in there and they survived for a period of two years, uh, which is pretty much the lifespan of the animal uh, yeah. without rejection. And so the route of administration was? So in this case, they did a subcutaneous implantation of a okay. mass of cells which had already been differentiated so that okay. they could test whether they would survive and you could use them to deliver a trophic molecule or a therapeutic product to be able to do. Okay, so uh, there are a few questions which has, uh, they're in the chat box. So I'll ask a few of them. Um, Ramya, uh, she's asking their thoughts of deriving iPSC glial cells. What are the major hurdles in doing so? There aren't many hurdles in doing so. And there's actually a company which has already had clinical trials using ESC derived glial cells that in that's a company, in fact, whose name was on the list that I showed in my slide deck, a company by the name of Kadima Stem. And they now are moving towards using iPSC-derived glial cells rather than embryonic stem cell-derived glial cells for therapy. There are several companies which offer commercial sale of uh, astrocytes derived from iPSC, which you can just buy off the shelf. That's been done. And here's a plug for the, uh, you know, in stem, in stem scientists have a protocol for making iPSC derived oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. And your very own you know, Biju has been doing some of that work with making iPSC derived oligodendrocytes. Okay. So, uh, next question is from Pragna. Uh, how different are iPSC derived MSCs from adult tissue derived MSCs with respect to immunomodulation? So, all the standard tests that are done, which are these in vitro assays with a mixed lymphocyte reaction, the, the behavior seems similar. The single most important difference between iPSC-derived MSC, 
uh, and adult MSC seems to simply be in the number of cell divisions and population doublings that they can undergo, but there doesn't seem to be any significant difference otherwise in, when you're looking at the cells. Thank you, sir. Another question just I'll, uh, Dr. Dandakumar. Sir, you can go ahead. Yeah. Please ask. Thank you. Me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Rao, it is an excellent talk. Uh, very highly informative. I have a question. Uh, we are uh, planning to do, uh, use uh, for uh, glymotherapy. So, uh, procure the embassies from. Uh, can you hear? Yeah, now Hello. I can hear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we want to use mesocomy stem cells for uh, glyomotherapy. And uh, our plan is to procure the MSCs uh, commercially. Do you, uh, after listening to your talk, I have a doubt that can still we need to uh, knock out HLA1, HLA2, even after procuring this commercial MSCs? Uh, so the issue always is whether you're using them as hit and run therapy, so you only want to use it one time, and then mm -hmm. you're not, not going to use them again. Because if that's the case, then you don't worry about the immune response that much because the, you're not giving it again. But if you have to give it several times, then the second time, the cells will be rejected and they won't be very effective. And using MS... Okay, as such... Yeah, I mean, since MS is lack immunogenicity, still even a multiple therapy, you suggest us to knock out HL1, HL2 in MSs? Yes, because they're not truly hypoimmunogenic. And that was why I showed that paper in the slide deck that I presented on why we need to use hypoimmunogenic. Several more detailed studies showed that while they're hypoimmunogenic, they're not truly uh, immune evasive and the body does reject them. And in fact, if you do an MLR reaction with the MSC, which are, and you use primed NK cells and other cells, then they get killed. Uh, by those cells. And there's some very nice data from several different groups on doing that. So you're absolutely right. If you're really trying to do multiple injections, even though MSC is supposedly, everybody thought that they were truly hypoimmunogenic, they're not hypoimmunogenic in the long run. And in an inflammatory environment, they overexpress inflammatory cytokines and they can actually provoke inflammation and they can certainly be rejected uh, if you're doing multiple injections. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, one last question I ask you. This is from Swapna. My, uh, so her question is on the suicide gene introduction. At what stage do you introduce the suicide gene? It's fair that if you have a pool of cycling cells in your differentiated cell pool, the cycling cells die. If you introduce in the iPSC stage, does it not affect the expansion of iPSC cells for differentiation? A very important question. And so we don't introduce the yeah. drug itself. We introduce the prodrug, which uh, we, we introduce an enzyme which converts a prodrug into a toxic drug. So we use the old, old, the old well-known system, which has already been used in human clinical trials with thymidine kinase. So thymidine kinase can take GAN cyclovir and convert it into a toxic product, which then kills the cells but it's only converted into a toxic product when you uh, have thymidine kinase. So if other cells don't have thymidine kinase, they don't die, and the cells which have thymidine kinase die. So when we are growing the cells in culture, we don't have any prodrug there, so they don't die. And then when we want to kill them, we add the prodrug, and then they die. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, it was really enriching listening to this side of uh, science and it's a truly translational science from academia to industry and back into the bedside and um, thanks for signing in and logging in and with your patients at this hour from your place in USA and uh, we are we really acknowledge and appreciate your uh, participation here for our symposium thank you sir yeah. Welcome and all the best, everyone. Hope you have a Thank great symposium. Thank you, sir. So here on, we will start with the morning session of uh, pluripotent uh, so imaging in stem cells. So within a few minutes, we will start 
with the next speaker. So we'll just take a few minutes in doing the co-hosting. It all work. In the meanwhile, I will go ahead to introduce our next speaker. So he is Dr. Rajesh Shipal. He is currently the chief scientist of iSTEM Research a biotechnology company incubated at Center for Cellular and Molecular Platforms, that is CCAMP, NCBS DIFR campus, Bangalore. Besides, he is associated with the University of Transdisciplinary Health Sciences and Technology, TDU, Bangalore, as a visiting professor running academic grants and supervising research students. Prior to this, he was engaged as an assistant professor at Manipal Institute of Regenerative Medicine, Bangalore. Between 2001 to 2010, he worked at the National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi, Reliance Life Sciences, Navi Mumbai, and Stemputics Research, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. In 2014, he completed an Indo-US fellowship with, visit, with Professor Kapil Bharti, Senior Investigator at National Eye Institute, NIH, Bethesda, MD USA. He was selected for the International Award for Young Biomedical Scientists by ICMR in 2013. Dr. Pal has published over 50 papers in peer reviewed journals of high international repute, has six patents to its credit, and has contributed for eight book and protocol chapters. With this, I would like Dr. Pal to start with his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Indrani, for giving this opportunity and this uh, uh, introduction. Uh, uh, can you uh, start the slides, please? I'm somehow unable to share it, share the presentation. Hello, am I audible? Oh yeah, great. Can you make it uh, full screen, please? Am I audible? Uh, can I start? Yes, you are audible, you can start. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you again and uh, Thank you, Dr. Rao. I think he has already logged in. It's pretty late there in Maryland, Baltimore. So uh, it's always uh, difficult to, uh, you know, talk and uh, keep up that uh, tempo after uh, Dr. Rao had spoken in the morning. Uh, so good morning to everybody. I'll try my best uh, in the next uh, 30, 35 odd minutes. Uh, so I work uh, for a company called iSTEM Research Private Limited, which is incubated at uh, CCAMP, which is a biotechnology incubator under the DBT and uh, or BIRAC, whatever you call uh, the government of India. And uh, we are incubated here since 2017. And so basically we are a company who are looking as the iSTEM name suggests. So we are looking at uh, uh, you know, retinal disorders to be more precise rather than the eye disorders. And uh, we have done a decent amount of work in the last uh, three odd years. And so I'm going to present some of the data, uh, uh, some of the scientific data that we have generated in the last three years. Uh, we work on induced pluripotent stem cells, human induced pluripotent stem cells, as Dr. Rao had mentioned. Uh, and uh, the, 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 diseases that we are looking at are retinal disorders. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the background, I'll give a, a brief background on the couple of diseases that we are looking at. One of the diseases that we are looking at is dry age uh, related uh, macular degeneration or uh, you know, widely known as uh, AMD. Uh, so the dry AMD occurs uh, when the macular degenerates with age. If you look at the uh, right side of the slide, uh, the anatomical uh, sections of uh, the retina, you look at early intermediate AMD and geographical atrophy. These are two different stages of the AMD. 
And uh, what happens essentially is the macula, which is located at the center of the retina, fails to receive the nutrients and the support uh, and uh, uh, thus causes impairment and degeneration resulting in loss of the central vision. And if you see the pictures, uh, the bottom of the sections, uh, uh, illustration uh, with respect to the sections, you see the central vision is lost. Left is the normal vision and the right side is the central vision. So this, is hap this happens when there is geographical atrophy or AMD, uh, which, is, uh, which mostly happens after the age of 60 to 65. And currently, as per the Lancet calculation in 2019, uh, we have uh, most uh, more than 176 million people across the world who are affected with uh, AMD. So there are two kinds of AMD, dry AMD and wet AMD. Wet AMD is uh, mostly about, it's a neovasculation, a neovasculature related disorder where there is a treatment. Uh, you give, uh, you can actually inject anti-VEGF injections, uh, inject an anti-VEGF recombinant, which uh, can take care of uh, this uh, disease. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the dis AMD is contributed by dry AMD. Wet AMD is around uh, 10 to 15 percent, which eventually could also become dry AMD. Uh, so that's about the AMD. The other next slide, please. So the other disorder that we are looking at uh, is called retinitis pigmentosa, which causes. Uh, the vision loss, the peripheral vision is lost. It's the most common form of inherited blindness, uh, which actually affects uh, the children, uh, which is uh, very, very critical uh, in terms of uh, the loss or the impact on the society. Uh, incidence varies from one in 3,000 to one in 500. So this is also uh, in uh, accordance with, uh, in South India, it is a little, uh, more the incidence because of uh, consanguineal marriage and so on uh, causes progressive loss of light sensing cells, which are the photoreceptors, including the rods and the cones uh, in the retina, which can begin as early as 10 years. And by 20 to 25 uh, person uh, with severe retinitis pigmentosa goes blind. So <clears throat> um, rod cells are degenerated first, uh, which are responsible for the peripheral peripheral and dim light vision, and then the cone cells are lost. And uh, more than 200 genes are associated with this disorder, but there are four to five genes which are uh, like, uh, I, I don't want to go into the genes, the name of the genes, but there are more than 200 genes and there are four or five genes which are very predominantly affected. Uh, mutation has been seen in, in India or in the Indian subcontinent. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to set the stage for what we do now. So what we do is we make these cells which are lost, as I have shown in the last two slides, that essentially we are looking at loss of photoreceptor, loss or damage of photoreceptors in retinitis pigmentosa and the loss of retinal pigment epithelial cells or RPE in the dry AMD uh, scenario. So, when you set a protocol for differentiation ex vivo, what you look at is the first lessons you learn from the uh, retinal development or the development of that particular tissue or the organ uh, in vivo. So this is a slide uh, uh, borrowed from Sally Temple's paper in 2017, where we look at the stages in the development of retina or retinogenesis, starting from the blastocyst, formation of the neural plate, uh, induction of optic vesicle, then the bilayered optic cup develops. And if you see uh, the mesenchyme, the outer layer, inner layer, lens vesicle, they, this is the cup that we are looking at. Uh, the, you know, the violet colored, this cup is what we are looking at. And then uh, the RP develops because the RP and photoreceptor, this constitutes the outer part of the retina. So you have this RPE and uh, closely opposed to that is the photoreceptor layer. And the different uh, pathways that are important in terms of being able to uh, inactivate, uh, silence them or activate them are the BMP, TGF beta and the wind pathway. And uh, this is more or less what is happening in vivo in a human being. And simulating these conditions, next slide please. So we have developed our protocol in ISTEM uh, to be able to uh, differentiate uh, them into a specific uh, group of cells that we are interested in. 
so before that, I just want to give an overview about uh, what is happening around the world with respect to uh, stem cells or progenitor cell-based <clears throat> clinical trials for the treatment of retinal degeneration because with respect to a company, as Dr. Rao mentioned, it's very important for a company to be able to do something or do it in a particular way that it has a, a uh, it has a scalable product which is GMP compliant and which can be uh, actually showcased in front of the regulatory agencies for approval in for clinical trials at the end of the day. So uh, right now there are uh, uh, there are clinical trials those are going on using human embryonic stem cell derived RP as well as human induced pluripotent stem cell derived RP. These are the two kinds of pluripotent stem cells, as we all know. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that we all know this, that there are two kinds of these uh, pluripotent stem cells. So if you see the most, uh, the first uh, was from Riken by Masao Takahashi. Uh, uh, that is from Riken. There is one more trial with IPSCRP going on in Moorfields Hospital in London. Uh, then uh, the few others which are worth mentioning are by Advanced Cell Technologies, which is in California. There is one by a company called Cellcure, which is now, uh, Cellcure is now known as Biotime because they have got bought over, you know, they just got acquired by Biotime. And so, and they are now actually known as Lineage Therapeutics. So, so that's one uh, that originated from Israel, Jerusalem, um, but now they are doing the things in the US. So there are five to six, and also Kapil Bharti, of course, where, where I have worked for some time. So uh, there are uh, these allogenic as well as autologous, a combination of allogenic and autologous therapies which are uh, undergoing uh, phase one, phase two clinical trials at different stages at different parts of the world. So the next slide, please. Can we go back to the um, full vision? Yeah, so then uh, let's now look at, so we know the landscape, the landscape of what is going on, uh, as, I, as I would like to mention, that this is not, I again want to reiterate what Dr. Rao said, that here we are not going to say that, okay, this is the first time we are doing this uh, uh, in the world. There are, as I showed you, there are five to six groups who are ahead of us, but we call us as fast followers. We are the first in India, of course. And, uh, uh, you know, this is not as, this is not a very, uh, short term process it takes a long time so over if it is a long process there is a chance that you can uh, you know either pull back i mean in terms of uh, the movement towards the clinic or you can overtake people so uh, we are at the stage where we are now doing uh, you know the safety and toxicological studies which you will see over the period of time so to so start with uh, this is the rp or the photoreceptor differentiation protocol which is uh, 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 that we have developed in-house. Uh, the approach that what iSTEM looks at is that if you look at the developmental biology, you have these optic vesicle cells which are marked by PAC6 and MITEF. And uh, um, from that point in time, we uh, there are two different pathways that give rise to the photoreceptor, which we use to treat, uh, which we use uh, to treat the retinitis pigmentosa and there are the RPEs where we are using them to treat AMD or uh, dry AMD rather. So the protocol in details, uh, if you start from the left side, IPSC, you do the neural induction. If you remember the slides, two slides back, I showed the in vivo development. So we simulate those uh, milestones of in vivo development and neural induction. Uh, then we induce, uh, form, uh, help them to form optic cup. And from the optic cup, we do a rosette selection neural rosettes or then they become retinal uh, in retinal fate committed rosettes or whatever one would like to call them and these optic cup cells are induced or further mature and differentiated towards rpe and uh, rod cells and cone cells which are uh, the photoreceptors basically so it's uh, a day 90 i would say uh, day 75 to 90 day protocol because it, uh, it, it there is um, sometimes we have a criteria, release criteria, where we call them as a batch pass or a batch fail. So it reaches uh, faster and sometimes a little bit. So it's like plus minus 10 days. So this is the protocol that we have developed. We have an Indian patent. We are very close to uh, getting a US patent on this and uh, the paper 
uh, multiple papers published on this protocol that we have developed. Next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, so the differentiation of RPE cells with respect to morphology uh, uh, or phase contrast bright field, uh, the, the illustration shows that we start with clinical grade. Well, so the clinical grade IPSC, we have a working cell bank of a clinical grade IPSC because we are looking at allogenic therapy, so which is going to be off the shelf uh, because that's scalable. So we have uh, this uh, mess, uh, you know, master cell bank, which we have procured from the NIH. And we have a working cell bank, so all our R&D work has been used, has been done using this working cell bank, which is nothing but a same clone of the master cell bank. And all the clinical work would be done using the master cell bank. So you need not do it again and again. Uh, it is the same cell line, so it should be able to reproduce everything that we have done uh, in terms of the assays and the differentiation. So. We use these uh, working cell bank form neural rosettes. We have a set protocol. It is the dual SMAD inhibition that we use in addition to a uh, couple of other growth factors that we use for this protocol. So RP monolayer post selection. So what we do is neural rosettes are selected and the neural rosettes are uh, plated on an, a separate, de separate dish where we take them towards photoreceptors and the cells which are remaining epithelial like are again replated and then they move towards the RPE. And here I'm looking at the RPE, so I'm showing you the RPE specifically, and then you get mature hexagonal RPE, which are polarized. And uh, this is the way it looks like. The beautiful thing about RPE is that they are pigmented. So you can, uh, from a naked eye, understand that, well, you are going in the right path or not in terms of being able to uh, you know, do a successful experiment. And it can, uh, it actually, can go up till we have done uh, till day 120, 125. But uh, what we desired, the cell type and the stage that we desire to do our preclinical and clinical experiments, we it, it 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 is done as early as maybe 65 to 70 days. Next slide, please. Oh, well, yeah, this is the way the eyesight RP we call our uh, you know the product that we are developing as eyesight RPE. So you can see uh, it's hexagonal and it is pigmented and uh, they also uh, produce melanin pigmentation very quick. Uh, they produce basically melanin pigmentation and this is the morphology at 40x uh, magnifications. Next slide. Mm, effective, as I said, that the neural induction because uh, the, in, the lineage from where these RP cells are coming from is the neuroectoderm. So it's very important that you are able to induce uh, the uh, effective neural induction is happening, which is very crucial. So if you look at the retinal progenitors, we have these checkpoints. Uh, we call them as checkpoints, and we can actually freeze the cells at these checkpoints, especially at a day 20 or 25. We call them retinal progenitors. At that time, they are bipotential because they can give rise to both the photoreceptors as well as the retinal pigment epithelial cells. So you see these are early neuroectoderm or retinal uh, progenitor markers, PAC6, SOX2, uh, co-stained with SOX1. On the right-hand panel, you see the RX. So the left-hand panel, it's mostly the uh, neuroectodermal markers, which uh, transiently uh, express. And then gradually, after 25 to 30 days, it is taken over by the retinal progenitor markers, which is uh, Rx, CRX, LHX2, and OTX2. And uh, uh, bottom panel shows the PCR of several markers. I'm not going into details. So it's the data is published recently in, uh, in stem cell research and therapy. So what I want to uh, indicate here is that the neural induction is very critical because uh, the success of the protocol depends on how well uh, the neural rosettes are coming up and how many of them and the quality of them. So these markers, uh, this markers and this stage is an important checkpoint. And we are able to also freeze these cells at this time point. So when uh, differentiation fails, you need not go back to day zero. You are at day 20 or 25 and start from there because scalability is a very important thing. Time is also a very important thing for a startup company. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
Well, so these are the mature markers, and it shows an accurate localization of the RP proteins, uh, co staining of ZO1, which is a tight junction protein, with PMEL17, which is a pre melanosome uh, marker, and uh, you can see the staining very clearly. Again, we uh, co stained RP65, uh, which is a very important marker for RP, and uh, RP65 gene mutation actually causes star disease and uh, several other retinal degenerative disorders. Tyrosinase is an important protein and enzyme, uh, which is uh, produced by the RPE cells, produced by the pigmented RPE cells, which is uh, hosted with MITEF. MITEF is a very, uh, very significantly uh, expressed, uh, considerably expressed marker right from the early stage, and it retains still the mature uh, RPE cells. Phalloidin, and then you have this acetylated tubulin and ARL13B. So the significance of these two markers are uh, uh, wind pathway activation is very, inhibition rather, is very important for the formation of the RPE because it's also important for ciliogenesis of the polarized RPE. So uh, these uh, two markers actually show the expression of the uh, ciliary bodies, you know, the primary ciliary bodies. If you see from, this is a 2D uh, cell culture. So from the top, you can look at these dots very clearly, both in these two kinds of staining, which shows that your cells are expressing the cilia. We also have done transmission electron microscopy and uh, scanning electron microscopy, which says that they form cilia once they are mature, which indicates that, yes, these cells are authenticated in terms of uh, their stage uh, for further uh, experiments. Next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I'm also going to show you uh, the differentiation of photoreceptors. We just completed the RP. So you we that uh, what we indicate is that yes, we can get RPE. Uh, sorry. Uh, can we go to the last slide? Last slide, okay. Yeah. So the photoreceptor differentiation, uh, we also show similarly the different stages of photoreceptor differentiation along with the markers. Well, uh, you know, this, com this uh, symposium is on molecular imaging. So if you see, we have, uh, you know, mostly we do imaging uh, of, uh, of these, cells using different kind of markers, co-staining, single staining, and so on. So uh, the last slide showed you about the differentiation of photoreceptors into different cell types, uh, sorry, into photoreceptors, including the rods and cones, which included early markers as well as late markers, rod cell markers, cone cell markers. Here is the quantification of the RP and photoreceptor markers, which gives you an idea about the Compositions, uh, composition of the of the RP, IRPE or the IPRP product that we have, which is a combination of early, late markers, and also, um, you know, both in terms of taking them towards the photoreceptor progenitor lineage, photoreceptor lineage, and the RPE lineage. This is the quantify, quantifiable data, which is an important uh, uh, criteria for our uh, certificate of analysis using flow cytometry. Next slide, please. We also have done um, uh, next generation sequencing, basically total RNA sequencing, uh, mRNA sequencing rather to be able to show that uh, what is the composition of the cell uh, products that we are developing. Not going to de details, you see different kinds of graphs. This is a volcano graph to show and the butterfly graph to show what are the different signaling pathways which are involved because it is important to authenticate that uh, the signaling pathways are activated, which we are activating. Uh, with using us the small molecules and the growth factors. And it shows uh, that the retinal progenitors, signaling molecules that are involved, the pathway genes and the retinal pigment epithelial cells and the photoreceptor cells. Uh, the differential, uh, differentially regulated genes are at the bottom, which uh, represent different pathways which are involved in the in vivo development of, of retina in human beings. Next slide, please. And uh, the transcriptome uh, profile here uh, on the left panel, you see the fold enrichment in the PRP. We call the photoreceptors as photoreceptor progenitors of PRP versus the IPSC and the fold enrichment of RP versus the IPSC. On the right hand panel, you look at the unique set of markers. I'm sorry, you can't see the name of all the markers here, but 
this represents a, a unique gene signature in terms of uh, mature RP. Uh, it, it combines both fetal and mature RP and both fetal and mature PRP markers in common, uh, you know, when you compare it with IPSC as a negative control and a positive control being a, a retinal tissue. Uh, so this is the unique uh, gene signature that we have for the RP and photoreceptor progenitors, another layer of confirmation that what we are generating our authenticated cells uh, specifically uh, for the particular cell type we are interested in. Next slide. Uh, yes, the functional correct characterization is also important. Uh, we, we look at ELISA for the RP. Uh, RP secretes PDF, uh, which is pigment epithelial derived factor and VEGF. And we show that uh, these are secreted both the freeze thaw cells. Uh, the important thing here to be, uh, I want to uh, want everybody to notice that uh, we are, uh, we were one of the first groups uh, who were able to actually freeze thaw these cells, which are mature cells. Yes, there was some loss, but uh, since we did our animal studies in the US and then away from uh, one of the animal study was done in the US, the other one in Delhi. So we had no other choice than to be able to freeze these cells and thaw them and make them work. So uh, if you see the PDF VEGF data, it is also using the RP after freeze thaw and it shows significant amount of secretion compared to NARP19, which is a primary RPE line. Uh, for the photoreceptors, we had done uh, calcium imaging, looked at the calcium imaging, very preliminary experiments with help from uh, NCBS, uh, Dr. Gethiazan's lab. And we did uh, look at the RP, PRP cultures and it showed that uh, it looked at, look, we found that it responds to KCL induced depolarization. Uh, if you see uh, on the right panel and the left panel, the cells start glowing after one minute, 70 seconds. So this is, uh, we use some 300 cells, looked at some 300 cells, which shows that uh, functionally they are active, functionally they are doing what they are supposed to do, which is encouraging in terms of being able to move forward, right? Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so I just wanted to incorporate this because this is a specific uh, conference, uh, in a meeting on, on molecular imaging. So I'm going to get into the in vivo data now. We now know that, well, we have in vitro cells which are good uh, and we can go forward and do transplantation and see uh, the efficacy and the uh, safety biodistribution and all. So uh, I want to just uh, emphasize on the role of, we basically do indirect molecular imaging techniques in in vivo. In vitro, we do molecular imaging, obviously everybody is doing, I mean, that is very standard like on focal imaging and so on. Um, but here we do uh, indirect molecular imaging like Reporter, we are mostly dependent on the reporter gene technology, which offers promising option. And it's interesting because it engages transcription as well as the synthesis within the cell. And it conclusively, uh, hence it conclusively proves that the cells are viable. Um, they are incorporated into the cell's genome and therefore imaging is, is not uh, difficult uh, and it's not impaired by the cell division. And on the right hand side is this a cartoon, you look at, you can see the reporter proteins binding to a reporter probe uh, on the cell membrane and also intracellularly. So this is an interesting technique which, which, which we have been using. Uh, and also another thing that we have been using, the next slide please. Uh, so we have been using uh, this double staining technique of human nuclear antigen, and I'm going to show you data on that. Human nuclear antigen, as well as a tissue specific marker to demonstrate survival because the cells we are transplanting in an animal model are human cells, so it's a xenogenic setting. So you need to have an animal, uh, human marker, specific marker to identify that your cells are sitting inside the uh, location that you have injected them. And then you need to be able to show a co-staining along with a tissue specific marker, which is human specific to show that they are integrated and they are engrafted rather, and then they are further differentiating into the cell. So these are two uh, examples of two very good papers from two very good labs, actually, Jun Takashi's lab, Nature Communications 2020, where they've used human nuclear antigen and TH, uh, which is a dopaminergic marker, mature dopaminergic marker to show that uh, efficacy of the cells uh, post-transplantation and then Lancet uh, paper in 2019. And it turns out that these uh, two papers are uh, from husband and wife, Jun Takashi is husband of Masaya Takashi. So Masaya Takashi is as, as kind of a pioneer in, in the field of RP repair and kind of retinal regeneration and degeneration. So it's uh, any talk on this 
face without mentioning her name is incomplete. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to quickly now in the next probably uh, 10 odd minutes show you some in vivo data where we have done subretinal transplantation in RCS rats. RCS is Royal College of Surgeon Rats where we where there is a gene mutation of the MER-TK gene mutation which uh, doesn't allow the photoreceptor outer segments to, to shed out and hence there is a accumulation of, of um, uh, the... <clears throat> the lipofusin and, and uh, causing uh, dif difficulty in survival of the RPE cells. So uh, this is a transcleral surgery or delivery of cell suspension, which has been pioneered by Trevor McKill in 2014. And this is the guy who has done our uh, animal studies. Please, next slide, please. It's a critical surgery. It's not very easy to do. You can imagine a rat or a mice eye. That's why I, uh, I, I projected a separate slide for it. It's not an easy surgery, so it needs special skills to be able to do that. So we transplanted these RPE cells, 65 to 70 day RPE cells, and uh, showed that it maintains structural integrity of the host retina uh, for extended time points. And we looked at P60 and P90. If you look on the right hand side, it's like bone arestin expression in, um, in compared to uh, when compared to the control uh, uninjected slides. There is bone arestin is very. Uh, nicely expressed in these cells at P60, even at P90 and on the left-hand side, side of, of, the, uh, um, of this panel, you look at H&E staining where you can see, uh, well, I, the, the arrows, the red arrows actually indicate the outer nuclear layer because it's important to look at the outer nuclear layer every time because the outer nuclear layer, which constitutes, if you remember my second slide, how this AMD happens, how this retinitis pigmentosus happens. It's all about the outer retina, which has some seven to nine kinds of cells, outer retina and the inner retina, which constitutes the photoreceptors. Because at the end of the day, if RP is lost, photoreceptors are lost, and that's the problem. So if you look at the integrity of the outer retina, it is maintained after transplantation compared to uh, the uninjected and the control cells. Let's go to the next slide, please. We also looked at uh, the functional optokinetic tracking th threshold, which shows that uh, the we did two doses, 50,000 and 100,000 cells. We require very no lay low number of cells, actually, because this is um, something we are looking at the eye. So there are only 400,000 of, I think, 300,000 300, to 400,000 RP in a human eye. So we are giving 100,000, which is uh, reasonable. And people have shown that earlier before us. So we do two doses, 50 and 100, and we found that uh, more or less the data is consistent and reliable in terms of looking at both the doses uh, that we transplanted. And the optokinetic uh, tracking threshold, it's the, uh, it's the grating acuity of RCS rats uh, decrease uh, and rapidly from birth to four months of age from 0.8 to 0.3 <coughs> <circulars>, circulations per day and treated eyes to remain consistent over, over 90 days post-injection. And uh, right hand side, you can see the PMEL17 staining along with the human nuclear antigen, which actually indicates that the cells engrafted survived as well as engrafted. And that's why it has caused, it has produced a, a optokinetic threshold, which is better than the vehicle control or the uninjected control. Retinal thickness graph on the left hand side shows that the retina uh, at P60 in the temporal versus nasal uh, is ba ba basically better. Nasal is something that it's a mock injection and the temporal is what we are interested at. So P60 and P90, in fact, P90, it is quite consistent, which is what we found that it is interesting and promising. Next slide, please. So this summarizes more or less uh, the retinal, uh, the dry AMD, in vivo data that we had. And then now I'm going to show you some preclinical studies data in the not skid RD1 mice, which actually models the retinitis pigmentosa part of it. Uh, PRP transplantation, again, we did uh, 55 day and 75 day after uh, we did in de detailed characterization of these cells provided new, and we found that PRP transplantation does provide neuroprotection to the RD1 mice. Similar kind of uh, data looking at the inner nuclear layer and the outer nuclear layer, RP and the choroid, which are the four layers which are closely packed to each other uh, when you look at the uh, retina of the mice. 
visual arresting, we did cone arresting there. Here we did visual arresting and we found that PRP75 and PRP55, they show a very good uh, integ uh, integrity and the main, they maintain the visual arresting, which is an indicator of, of the quality and the uh, structural integrity of the retina post transplantation. So next slide, please. Uh, PRP engraftment improved uh, the electrical uh, responses. So basically, this is very interesting because this is an ERG where the A wave amplitude actually indicate uh, that the photoreceptor function is consequence of the electrical response. The B wave rather uh, indicated secondary retinal uh, neuro neuronal function, which is responsible for signal transduction via networking neurons, such as bipolar and the horizontal cells, which connect to the optic nerve. Both PRP75 as well as 55 groups displayed a transient increase in photoreceptor SQ, uh, thus indicating a transient enhancement in visual perception compared with the sham controls. Uh, however, uh, PRP55 exhibited a better uh, functional wave rescue on day 15 and 30. Uh, a wave and B wave uh, displayed similar patterns though. Uh, with respect to the light perception, which is a part of the behavioral studies we do, depth perception and light perception. The light perception behavioral study measures the visual acuity and perception as mice display photophobia, which is very common due to their nocturnal nature. Owing to the photoreception, the animal transitions to the dark chamber from the light chamber and displays dark latency due to photo aversion. The animals transplanted with PRP 55 and 75 could perceive bright light and therefore they experienced photophobia spending increasingly more time in the dark chamber from day two onwards and most significantly on day 30 until 45 days. Post 45 days, light perception was found to deteriorate indicating a decrease in rescue potential. In contrast to the treated animals, sham uh, showed no rescue at any day point and continued to experience loss of perception due to retinal degeneration. In-depth perception, animals with visual acuity preferred the shallow side. So both the PRP55 and 75 groups showed preferential transition to the shallow side till day 30 compared with sham controls. I have not shown the, uh, uh, the, the data on the depth perception here, but uh, it's similar in the similar lines from lights perception. It's, it's in the paper. So if one is interested, can look at that. So this uh, summarizes the, the functional studies that we did in the RD1 mice and the RCS rats uh, to look at the efficacy and the safety. Uh, although the RD1 mice should have, ideally we are planning to study for longer time point, 45 days not enough. We are looking at uh, in the future experiments at 120, 90 to 120 days. Uh, next slide, please. Mm, so the conclusions that you can draw um, from this, what I showed so far, is that this is the first demonstration of a unified, scalable, and the GMP adaptable protocol. So GMP adaptable protocol, it's already GMP adapted now, indicating strong animal efficacy and safety data with respect to IPC-derived RPE and PRP cells. Uh, these findings provide proof of principal results for uh, IND enabling studies. So right now, where we are, uh, we are doing the large-scale GLP toxicological studies as a part of a regulatory uh, compliance. We are also doing a large cohort uh, efficacy study with, again, Trevor McGill in Portland and uh, to, to uh, make sure that the efficacy is there because we have made some small changes in terms of making them clinically, uh, the protocol clinically compliant. So those are the two things that and we are looking at, say, uh, Q4 of 2020 or Q. Uh, we are hoping that Q4 or 2020, we should be able to do the uh, IND package to the regulatory agencies. So that's more or less the regenerative medicine work that we have done uh, so far. Next slide, please. Quickly touch upon disease modeling. Next slide. Uh, maybe uh, two to three minutes. Uh, uh, so we also look at uh, the basic research side of uh, you know understanding uh, diseases with respect to retinal degeneration so which are, we are the first uh, very few among the um, labs in the world that we have some four ipsc lines uh, indicating retinal degeneration nowadays uh, a lot of people are uh, deriving ipsc lines uh, but we are uh, we have these retinal degenerative lines please next slide 
Uh, yes, so these are the three lines. There is one more addition to this uh, three lines and this is a set criteria of characterization that you have to do, which is well known in this field. We have also done the same thing and all these disease lines, you look at these disease. So ABCA4 mutation, RDH12 mutation, tyrosinase mutation, these are different retinal degenerative disorders like Stargardt's disease, AMD, retinitis pigmentosa. So all these lines, interestingly, are uh, also uh, available for distribution to researchers through our Reliance Alliance program if anybody is interested to look at these disorders uh, with respect to their research programs. Next slide, which is the last slide, I guess. And this is uh, the most important slide, I believe, uh, acknowledgement to Team ISTEM from left to right, uh, Swapna, myself, Archini, Shushma, and uh, Vijay, Nimona Priya, and uh, Jogin, our CEO, and uh, Rajni, uh, our CMO. We have a lot of collaborations. Uh, we don't uh, think that we can do everything. We are a small startup company. So we collaborate with Excel Sciences, Novato, uh, California, RUCDR, or NIH from where we get the master cell bank. OHSU, Trevor McGill, Portland for our animal studies, efficacy studies, CCAM, <clears throat> collaboration with NCBS and CCAM, we incubate there. We have a research program with CCAM as well, LVP, Hyderabad, who is our GMP partner, uh, our GMP manufacturing partner, National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi, Anthem is our GLP toxicology partner, uh, Pancela, we are also getting, as Dr. Rao mentioned, we are started working on these null lines, um, you know, the universal lines to be able to develop a next generation product, cell therapy product for eye disorders. Funding, we are uh, generously funded by Bayrak through their multiple programs, uh, the company was set up with angel investors, including Jogin Desai. for sharing your intensive work with all of us. Uh, now, now, we have the questions. So the first question, which uh, I can see over here, is what are the challenges uh, for these transplantations, uh, involved in transplantation? Well, there are, uh, you know, there are different layers of challenges. So if uh, I'm not sure, scientific challenges, regulatory challenges, commercialization challenges, what are the things? I'll just summarize. Basically, there are challenges with respect to the, the, the biology of these cells because we know they these are, although retina is a uh, immune privilege site, so-called uh, quote-unquote, but it's actually not immune privilege. So you have the challenges with respect to immune rejection. You have challenges with respect to tumor formation. So you cannot, I mean, those are all the uh, different biological challenges that you have to, uh, kind of, um, you know, incorporate as a part of your release criteria of the product or the COA or uh, of the product, which you make sure that they are safe in vitro at least. Those are the biological challenges. Then you have the uh, challenge with respect to uh, transplanting the cells. As I told you, this is a very, very difficult transplantation. It's not easy because you are looking at uh, maybe a one or two uh, millimeter space of subretina where you transplant the cells. That's the next challenge, which, which will be uh, extrapolated to human beings as well, uh, compared to what is happening in the mice and the rat. Then you have regulatory challenges because uh, taking IPSC product, uh, although there is a shift of paradigm nowadays with respect to uh, you know uh, looking at how IPSC can be beneficial as a therapeutic cell therapy, uh, but still there are challenges because we are, I mean, with respect to India, we are the first to, to take this IPSC product. So challenges are there at every stage with respect to the science, with respect to the, uh, you know, the, the, the logistics and uh, uh, regulatory challenges and commercial challenges. I, I, although they are there, but I am not an uh, expert to comment on that. Yes, there are challenges, a lot of challenges. 
Thank you. We'll take the next question. It's from Adri. Uh, do you see changes in intraocular neovascularization in your animal model, assuming you have changes in the VEGF levels? How does that account to quantifying neuroprotection? Very good question. So the thing it's is... Uh, that is Yes, it's a good question. So, you know, the state of the art, uh, you know, it's very difficult to do uh, fundus. There are several criteria that people look at. We did not have all, uh, everything. If you see that uh, in the say, next animal model, we were able to do ERG and other behavioral studies. In the first, we could do OKT. We did not have the facility to do everything. Uh, we have a long list. That is something that we are looking at that's actually relevant with respect to uh, patients. Uh, suffering from AMD. We hope to look at that in the large cohort animal study uh, when we are doing uh, it. We are actually already started that and we are hoping to look at that as well. It's not looked at so far. Uh, the basic things are OKT, fundus photography, uh, you know, ERG and behavioral uh, studies. Uh, but this one, another challenge with being able to do this is when you do it in animals, some of the things don't work and they are not reliable. And anything which is not reliable and robust, the regulatory agencies don't accept that. Easy to publish, but difficult to uh, you know convince the regulatory agencies. Good question. We have that in mind, but not yet done. Uh, Sudhir Kumar Pal, he says a very nice presentation. So what is the success rate of transplantation? Uh, so well, success rate in terms of being able to uh, see how many cells engrafted, well, uh, we have not quantified that, so uh, uh, we can't count the number of cells. I mean, people have counted that. They have done flow cytometry and all, but we have not because, you know, there are logistics challenges. Uh, we don't do it in-house. In we do it with our collaborators, so there are certain things that we can and cannot do. We don't know uh, exactly the numbers, but we can say it's, it's something around, say, you know, 15 to 25% of cells which are uh, um, engrafting, hopefully. It's a rough calculation ballpark looking at the flow cytometry and uh, sorry not flow cytometry looking at the immuno uh, you know multiple uh, images of the immunohistochemistry that was done uh, using human nuclear antigen and the co-stain that is PMEL 17. Thanks a lot. Uh, there was a little issue with, with internet, but thank, thank it, God it happened in the last part of uh, the question session. And um, we definitely acknowledge Rajeshi, your uh, taking out time for a symposium and uh, presenting your wonderful data and showing the significance of be it in vitro imaging or be it in vivo imaging, how much of these imaging techniques aids in the uh, in advancement of the science, be it in stem cell technology, be it in basic science, or be it converting and pro proving and validating the product for eventual clinical use. Uh, so that was a very good example. And that was the reason also why we invited you. Thank you, Rajeshi, for your time. And uh, we will move on to our uh, next speaker. Thank you so much, Indrani, and the entire team at Neiman's Biophysics. It's a wonderful initiative to do this uh, in this pandemic where everything is uh, going haywire. You know, every day is a new day with new uncertainties. It's a great initiative. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I would really? be hooked on to this conference for the next one and a half days and wish uh, good luck to everybody and, and learn a lot and utilize it. Thank you so much. I would first introduce Dr. Aditi Mukherjee. Hello, Genomics from Washington University School of Medicine, 
USA. She's the recipient of Innovative Young Biotechnologist Awards disease. Her research focuses on the role of the lipid chaperon molecule, APOE, in mitochondrial homeostasis in early neuronal development. She uses cell-based assays, specifically patient-derived induced pluripotent stem cell lines in conjunction with information from clinical and genetic analysis to study the relationship between disease progression, cellular phenotype, and genetic background. So let's invite Dr. Oditi, and please, you can go ahead and start your presentation, Oditi. Okay. Aditi, if you can unmute your, please unmute yourself. All right, hi. Thank you, Indrani. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So let me share the slides. Is the slide visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay, all right. Thank you, Indrani, for inviting me for uh, giving a talk in this forum. Couple of disclosures I think uh, needs to go before I start. One, I am not a stem cell biologist, but it is real fun to come and talk in a stem cell forum. Um, and second, is that the work that is going to be presented is purely on in vitro cells. So it's a deviation from the rest of the uh, talks uh, that has gone, uh, been broadcasted since morning. So with that, good morning all. And uh, my talk today is about uh, a method that we developed that uh, can be used for easy separation of pluripotent stem cells uh, in culture. The method can be seamlessly adapted in any cell biology setup, and it allows for both routine monitoring of cells in culture, as well as high throughput propagation of these cells. Now, as a human geneticist, my work entails understanding how genetic variations underlie disease uh, condition. And to do that, I make use of iPSC-derived model system in combination with clinical and molecular data and I try to understand how disease progression correlates with cell-based phenotype and genomic background. So as can be seen from this schematic, the success of this pipeline depends on the robust and reproducible cell phenotypes that one sees uh, in the dish. The challenge is pluripotent stem cells are extremely heterogeneous in culture, and it is very difficult to maintain them as pure cell lineage. Now, there are various reasons why heterogeneity can occur in culture, and these can be broadly classified into four main bins. Culture-induced variability can occur due to undefined components uh, in, in the culture. These could be from uh, the media or could be from xenogenic components like the feeder layer that is used in the culture. It can also uh, occur due to improper handling of cells. Line-specific variability can occur primarily while generating a line, and this could be if you have somatic cells which are remaining in your culture and they still retain uh, their original uh, gene transcription pattern, or you have a partially reprogrammed cell in your culture which looks morphologically similar to the pluripotent stem cell and thus difficult to segregate from the population. Clone-specific variability can occur if you have a subtraction of your culture which has acquired a different property like a growth or a differentiation potential, giving rise to heterogeneity in culture. And finally, spontaneous differentiation, which can occur when a fraction of your cells uh, in the culture they spontaneously uh, differentiate into various cell types. Now, spontaneous differentiation a fraction of cells in active culture will always be spontaneously differentiating. So that component is a common feature uh, in any uh, uh, live culture of stem cells in vitro. But the other three uh, 
reasons that I have mentioned here can be monitored and can, if uh, addressed, can greatly reduce heterogeneity. There are numerous ways and methods which are employed to address each of the concerns that I have mentioned uh, and to characterize undifferentiated cells from differentiating cells in the culture. These range from observing cells and colony morphology to using immunocytochemistry based method by labeling cells with pluripotent specific uh, markers or reporter gene. One can use the same uh, uh, reagents, but analyze the cell in single cell resolution by using any of the cell sorting uh, methods. Molecular signatures by measuring RT-based PCR, RT-PCR based method or by whole genome transcriptome analysis are also being used to characterize uh, pluripotent stem cells. And finally, label-free methods using high resolution based imaging have also been used to characterize pluripotent stem cells in culture. As can be seen from this schematic, majority of these methods are either experimentally intensive or are cell invasive or require sophisticated equipment which limits the, their use as a routine measure to monitor your culture on a daily basis. So therefore a system or a method which makes use of endogenous fluorescence but does not rely on sophisticated equipment will overcome this limitation. And that is where today's talk is about. So what we showed is when you culture human pluripotent stem cells in classical media composition, and by that I mean KOSR, uh, either on a feeder or a feeder-free uh, culture system, HPSCs exhibit a characteristic signature uh, fluorescence profile limited to the DAPI uh, fluorescence channel. The top panel here shows the raw image taken, and this is an image which is taken from a regular epifluorescence microscope fitted with a CCD camera. And in the panel below shown is a default background subtraction of the same image. Uh, media shows this characteristic phenotype of blue fluorescence which was not present, which was not present in the somatic cells, which are using uh, mouse embryonic fibroblast, which is used as a feeder layer in the culture. The blue fluorescence was also absent in other stem cell uh, cell lines like mesocranial stem cells, or in the differentiate derivatives uh, uh, arrived from these culture. Now, the Blue fluorescence seems to be arising from distinct cytoplasmic compartments measuring around 0.5 to 2 microns. And they often form a crescent-shaped structure near the perinuclear region in the cells. Uh, the fluorescence was prone to uh, photobleaching when overexposed, but it recovered by around 12 to 24 hours. So because the fluorescence was very limited to a narrow band uh, in the blue region, and they were emanating from very discrete uh, cytoplasmic compartment. We went to probe which specific cytoplasmic compartment the fluorescence was uh, uh, arising from, and we found that uh, the blue fluorescence completely localized to uh, lipid bodies, which get clustered in the perinuclear region. And it was completely, uh, uh, absent in all the other uh, sub uh, cytoplasmic uh, organelles that were tested. Now, lipid bodies are quite common organelle in cells, although in somatic cells, majority of the somatic cells, uh, they are quite scant, with an exception to hepatic and pancreatic stellate cells or retinal pigmented cells that Rajshri was talking about, where you have uh, where you can see large number of lipid bodies. So to find out the fluorescent probe, which is causing the, uh, the fluorescence, we uh, isolated the lipid bodies and extracted it in a chloroform methanol extract and found that the fluorescent lipid bodies completely localized to the organic phase. We then used the fluorescence uh, spectra to 
get an idea of what the fluorophore may be. And we got a very specific fluorescent spectra, which looked very similar to uh, uh, vitamin A with a fluorescence maxima at 325 nanometer. To confirm the fluorophore, we ran the fluoroform methanol extract along with retinol and its esters. And we found that on, on a reverse HPLC uh, column, and we found that the main fluorescence peak completely coincided with retinyl palmitate and was uh, well separated from both retinol and retinyl acetate, which is another ester of retinol. Confirming that the fluorescence come, uh, from sequestered in these lipid bodies uh, is predominantly from uh, retinyl palmitate. Now, since animal cells can't make, uh, okay, probably I'll do that later. Okay, so, uh, so basically what we saw was that the predominant fluorescence which was uh, sequestered in these lipid bodies was from retinyl palmitate. Now, as I showed you that the fluorescence can be easily captured by a regular CCD camera, one can perform a quantitative analysis uh, of the fluorescence as one does with immunocytochemistry-based analysis. And as shown in this uh, uh, graph here, you can see that there is significant difference between the somatic cells and the fluoroquitin stem cells in terms of the blue fluorescence uh, intensity. We do see there is a variability both within the cell lines or, and across cell lines. And the, this variability is similar to one uh, that one observes by when doing uh, immunocytochemistry-based uh, experiment also. The cells retain the blue fluorescence post-fixation and when sorted for the blue light, what we see is that it resolves into a bimodal uh, profile with a high, blue and a high uh, blue and a low blue peak. And the fluorescence intensity of both these peaks are well separated by around 100 fold uh, of, uh, of intensity difference. The somatic cell, on the other hand, resolves into a single peak, which coincides uh, more or less with the low blue peak uh, when overlapped with the uh, fluoroquitin stem cell fax profile. So the retinoid-associated blue fluorescence, since we found that it was limited to the cells within the colony, we were able to visualize it and image it and also sort these uh, cells based on this fluorescence pattern. We propose that this fluorescence could be used as an endogenous marker for routine monitoring of HPSCs in culture. To do that, we stained pluripotent stem cells with bona fide uh, uh, pluripotency marker, shown here is off. And we saw that every cell that expresses off also exhibits blue fluorescence as shown in, in, in the uh, ICC panel uh, projected on the slide. This can also be confirmed by using a uh, flow cytometer based assay. And as can be seen that the high blue peak has a strong association with the fluid potency marker with around more than 80% of the cells showing uh, dual staining for both, uh, both dual staining as well as when it was done with single marker also. What is also uh, can be uh, appreciated from this graph is that of the two peaks uh, in the in the fax profile, the low the high peak is what correlates with the pluripotency marker, indicating that the low blue peak represents cells which, as I told you, arises in the culture because of spontaneous differentiation or differentiated cells because of any other reason that was ascribed in a couple of slides back. And the critical thing that we have uh, observed is that a, a, a fax profile with a low blue peak and a high blue peak is an ideal uh, state that uh, one would want to maintain their culture, which uh, indicates that the number of uh, differentiated uh, cells in the culture is at the minimum. When one analyzes and differentiating culture, as expected, you would see that cells which do not express pluripotency marker also does not exhibit blue fluorescence. 
And this can be also shown by close cytometry based analysis. And now you can see that the, uh, the characteristic blue profile has altered and you see a very diminished high blue peak while you see the low blue peak height which has increased. Uh, also in terms of co-localization, now uh, both with the single and the dual staining, you can see around 40% of the cells alone in the culture shows some amount of uh, uh, co-staining uh, co with blue as well as with the blue frequency marker, indicating that majority of the cells in the population do not stain with either the pluripotency marker or with uh, or exhibit blue. Now, so therefore, if you look at the data that we, I presented so far, one can easily then use blue fluorescence in a daily basis to monitor their culture without the need of adding any excess, uh, exogenous antibody or report engine uh, for this analysis. And this can be done quite seamlessly using a simple epifluorescence microscope. We also find the application quite useful when uh, one is trying to do single cell tracking. This is important post any of the sorting experiment, especially when some uh, one is doing a limited dilution uh, experiment uh, during uh, gene editing protocols. Uh, looking for blue fluorescence helps identify cells very easily, and then one can mark and then uh, monitor the cell as it grows. One can also use the blue fluorescence sort profile and salvage a culture which is probably got compromised or has a higher proportion of differentiating cells. So to the, do this, what we have shown is that if one sorts only the blue cells from a differentiating culture, then one can regain back the characteristic facts profile uh, uh, of the IPS of a good healthy IPSC uh, cell line as shown in the figure below. And then if you uh, subsequently passage the cells for using sort for blue fluorescence, you can see that the both the uh, fax characteristic is maintained and also that the cells have started becoming more homogeneous uh, in the culture. So repeated uh, sorting or propagation of HPSC colonies using the blue fluorescence uh, uh, property maintains the uh, uh, blue fluorescence profile and also results in a more homogeneous population of cells in culture. Now, we then realized that if this is what is happening, then one can actually use this property for large scale uh, expansion of uh, cells in culture. And this is quite important for people who are using stem cells for modeling because you would want to have a large stock of cells while performing experiments. So to do this, what we uh, did was we took a, a healthy growing IPSC line shown in um, uh, top left panel and a differentiating culture, the, a representation of that image is shown on top right. Then we plate the sorted these cultures for high blue, low blue, and also had an unsorted population. And we plated the same number of cells, which is 30,000 from each of these population. Now, as can be expected, if you look at the unsorted uh, row, that because you have taken cells from an undifferentiated healthy culture, top left image, the probability of you seeing higher number of culture in that uh, dish is would be high because the uh, the culture was from a uh, healthy uh, dish, and in the same note, uh, 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 if you use unsorted cells, but you have taken the cells from a differentiating culture, you will see uh, quite a diminished number of colonies, uh, which result. The interesting thing was that. When the same culture was sorted for blue, we saw a significant rise in the number of resulting cultures, not only in the uh, uh, from a healthy uh, culture, but also from a, a differentiating culture, which says that, which again confirms that sorting for blue helps salvage a differentiating culture and also provides a 
an opportunity to expand the culture and get a much more homogenous culture uh, in vitro. So this is quite useful for individuals who are using iPSCs for uh, disease modeling or for any other kind of experiment where you would want to have a large number of vials of stock for same or similar passages to do your experiments. And blue fluorescence, uh, we found it quite helpful in achieving that. So the obvious next question is that if the retinoid associated uh, blue fluorescence is marking pluripotent stem cells. Uh, how early do we see this? Or do we at all see it during the process of reprogramming and one only sees it uh, after uh, a stable line is established? So to do this, we started a RPSC line generation using fibroblasts. And what I'm showing you here is appearance of blue fluorescence as early as day eight post uh, transfection. And we have used a transfection-based method of generating the light. Um, now, this is quite useful because, especially for people who are using suspension cultures for uh, deriving their line, because it's quite difficult to capture the mesenchyme to uh, epithelial cell transition, which is one of the first uh, step and a critical step in uh, reprogramming, uh, because these are suspension culture. Uh, if, if you are starting with a suspension culture, it's quite difficult to capture that phase. And what we believe is that uh, the blue fluorescence can help capture that phase for suspension culture. It's also interesting to note that uh, the appearance of blue is uh, in a similar daytime as what you will see from uh, a known early marker for pluripotency, which gives more validity to this data, that is SCCA4. Okay. So, so far what I have shown you is that when you have pluripotent stem cells, human pluripotent stem cells, when you grow them in the classical uh, ESC media, uh, then you can see that there are these lipid body associated retinyl uh, uh, palmitate fluorescence. Now, retinoid are important biomolecules and uh, they have important role ascribed important role in growth, in vision, in reproduction. However, its role in human pluripotent stem cells is not characterized. There are a few studies which have shown that retinol can replace LIF in mouse ESC culture in which it induces uh, nano expression. When we looked for the characteristic punctate blue fluorescence in mouse lines, we did not see that the mouse lines, and we've used a couple of mouse lines, I'm just representing one uh, uh, line data here. We did not see the blue fluorescence in, in the mouse line, but we did see a very faint and diffuse kind of a fluorescence in, my, uh, in mouse cell lines. And when we uh, exaggerated the effect, so basically we, um, uh, looked for where, uh, if you increase the fluorescence intensity, we found that the diffused fluorescence colo to mitochondria against uh, the human cells where we clearly see that the blue fluorescence does not colo with mitochondria. Now, uh, this was quite difficult to capture by imaging because of its low intensity, but it was quite visible in flow sorting where we see that uh, just like the somatic cell, the mouse ES cells also showed a single peak of blue fluorescence, but that coincided more with the low blue profile of the HPSC blue fluorescence. Now, looking at the data that is, uh, the, 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 the imaging data that we have, uh, it's, it's quite intuitive to uh, think that since most active cells have abundant amount of NADH in mitochondria, the faint and the diffuse blue fluorescence that we see in the mouse cell line could be the NADH uh, fluorescence. And it is also possible that the low blue peak that we see in the blue fluorescence profile is also representing the same. And that is why even the somatic cells when they were uh, passed through this flow cytometer also showed a single peak. So the question is, why is it that uh, 
the blue fluorescence is not present in the mouse cell lines. Or the other way of asking this question is that, is the retinoid associated blue fluorescence marking a specific developmental state, which is only present in the human and not in the mouse? So to look at this, um, stem cells can be derived from multiple stages uh, in, in, through development. Uh, as can be seen in this schematic. If the stem cell is derived from inner cell mass from a pre-implantation embryo, these are called embryonic stem cells, both for the human and the mouse uh, lineage. Uh, however, mouse has an advantage that you can also derive stem cells from the epiblast cells post-implantation uh, embryo, which is not possible for the human. Now, if you look at the pre-implantation embryo, uh, morphologically, it looks very similar between the human and the mouse, but studies have shown that uh, both of these are uh, transcriptionally very different. And interestingly, mouse ICM uh, cells are much closer to post-implantation mouse uh, cells or the APSCs, and these are called as prime state uh, stem cells whereas the mouse ESCs are called as ninth cells. So it is possible that the retinoid associated blue fluorescence is marking only the primed uh, pluripotent stem cells and does not mark uh, the ninth state. So to prove this, we harvested uh, mouse embryos Yeah, I, was I audible? I just got a message saying that voice is cracking. Yes, you were audible, Aditi. So do I need to go back to any of the slides? I don't know where I lost you guys. No, no, no. You did not. You continue from this slide, the slide number 19. Okay, fantastic. All right, so, so to prove that uh, uh, the retinoid associated blue fluorescence was specifically marking primed pluripotent stem cells, we isolated mouse embryos at DIPC 3.5, which represents a pre-implantation embryo. And as you can see that there is a scant number of lipid bodies as uh, indicated by body stain, and none of them show the characteristic blue fluorescence. However, when you uh, dissect uh, embryos at day 6.5, which represents the epiblast state shown in this figure, you can see that the number of lipid bodies have significantly increased, and also the blue fluorescence is also present in these lipid bodies, suggesting that the uh, retinoid associated blue fluorescence specifically marks epiblast cells or primed uh, pluripotent stem cells. What we also did was we isolated the epiblast cells from the embryo and plated it out and grew them in uh, conditions which are more akin to human pluripotent stem cells. And what is shown in this figure is, as you can appreciate that the, col the colony which is derived out of such cells look more similar to the human pluripotent stem cells. They are very flat, monolayer, unlike the dome-shaped colony that one associates with mouse pluripotent stem cell. And it also has uh, uh, lipid body, uh, blue fluorescent lipid bodies. So this is interesting because prime cell so far has very few markers, uh, like X chromosome inactivation or downregulation of Rex or brachyurea and FGF5 upregulation. And as you can see, none of these markers are uh, surface markers. So therefore, using blue fluorescence can be a, a, a very helpful resource 
for individuals who are studying or want to study FBSC cells uh, to understand the transition from naive to prime state. And this can be used as a good application for that. <clears throat> now, animal cells can't make vitamin A, so it has to be sourced from outside. And uh, retinol is available from serum uh, in media uh, in these cells. Uh, and this is shown here by this HPSC, uh, uh, HPLC data, which shows that FPS, uh, or uh, this is a synthetic uh, uh, media that we have taken uh, from Reprosel and KOSAR, they all show the same retention time peak, which uh, matches with retinol and does not have any of the esters. What you can also see is that uh, the retinol, which is present in the media can be taken up by the cells uh, where it converts the retinol to retinyl esters and sequesters it in uh, these lipid droplets. And the way it does that is by the enzyme called LRAT, which is uh, expressed in extremely high amount in, uh, in HPSC cells. Uh, Cells can take up retinol uh, in a dose dependent manner from the media, as can be seen in the image below, which shows an increase in the number of lipid bodies with a concomitant increase in the blue fluorescence. So, so far what I have shown you is, is that when you culture IPSCs or any human pluripotent stem cells in its standard media, the HPSC exhibits a blue fluorescence. The blue fluorescence is because of retinyl palmitate, which is uh, sequestered in uh, lipid bodies. I have also shown you that cells take up uh, retinol from media and converts into re uh, retinyl esters and uh, stores them in lipid bodies. I have also told you that if one uses a culture condition which has undefined component and which will actually fit this definition when I say that uh, standard uh, ESC culture media, then the chances of uh, increased heritability in the culture also increases because you have undefined component in your culture. So therefore, of course, shifting towards a defined culture system is much more appropriate. And a lot of work has happened uh, uh, in the field uh, to develop media and culture condition so as to shift from an undefined uh, system to a much more defined uh, culture system. And I've just shown a small schematic here giving a very broad yardstick of uh, the transition that has happened, starting from FPS, which was the original media, then knockout serum replacement, uh, which had uh, Albumax as a replacement for uh, serum. And we had M-Teaser, uh, which also started with Albumax, but now uses he human serum uh, albumin, recombinant human serum albumin as its retinol source. And finally, a very uh, popular media which is being used by most labs is EH, which is a completely synthetic media it is a minimal media, it has only eight components, uh, and it does not have retinol or lipid in its composition. So when you grow cells in E8, uh, because it does not have retinoid or lipid in it, you don't see lipid bodies, nor do you see the blue fluorescence. It's as expected. So one can state then that the retinoid associated blue fluorescence it should not be considered as uh, an obligatory pluripotent stem cell marker, rather than it should be used or considered as a context specific marker because cells grown in E8 and also uh, uh, naive cells show us that it, retinol is not essential for pluripotency. It does mark a particular state of uh, pluripotency, but it's not essential for pluripotency. So it is important to keep that distinction in mind uh, that retinoid associated uh, blue fluorescence is a useful marker, but is a marker for a particular state of uh, pluripotent stem cells. 
And in the same breath, one also needs to understand that HPSC is grown in E8, exist in a different metabolic state. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple because uh, the panel on the left also shows you clearly that uh, when you add retinol to the media, the cell take it up. Uh, so therefore there is, uh, it influences lipid metabolism, specifically lipid, lipid trans uh, turnover. But what was interesting for us was to see that when you grow cells in, in the classical media against E8 media, we saw that there was a significant change in the morphology of the cells. And we found that the literature does not talk much about this. Uh, the only criteria that the literature talks about uh, the, the quality of stem cells or stemness of cells grown in any of the condition uh, or chemically defined media is uh, expression, robust, robust expression of pluripotency markers, uh, normal karyotype, uh, proliferation rates, but things that don't get represented in the, in the literature are the metabolic state of the cell or the ROS levels of the cell. And we do understand that uh, this can happen because of the notion that uh, pluripotent stem cells or stem cells per se rely more on glycolysis rather than oxphos. So therefore looking at the uh, mitochondrial metabolism or the level of ROS uh, may not be an essential criteria. But when you look at a culture, the same line grown in two different media showing such distinct uh, morphologies, one gets curious. And what we found out was that the cells grown in Kiosar, the same cell line grown in Kiosar and E8 shows very significant differences and significant differences which actually point towards cell stress. And these are, these include, and these will be also important uh, features that one can adapt in their uh, routine cell culture practice. One is to look at the way the cells are packed. If you look at Kiosar, it has much more uh, loosely packed cells, uh, not in the sense that they are uh, single cells. Okay? They're packed, but they're not as compact as what you see in E8 the same number of cells plated and uh, the image is shown in that. The second is that the nuclear morphology, you see a much more lobular uh, nuclear in uh, Kyosar uh, media cells versus a very circular nuclear morphology in cells grown in E8. Uh, the third thing that one can look for as a sign of cell stress is nucleolar morphology, which is also known as the stress sensor of the cell. If you see in the image that I have projected that you have a reticulate and a nucleolar morphology in E8 and the number of nucleoli are multiple or significantly more than what you can see in the E8 cells, uh, the cells grown in E8. So this told us that there is some amount of difference between the E8 and Kyosar and specifically that the cells are much more stressed in E8. To confirm this, we looked for uh, ROS levels in, in cells grown in E8 and Kyosar, and this was done with multiple cell lines. And you see that there is a significant increase in the level of ROS and mitochondrial membrane potential in cells when grown in E8 compared to Kyosar media. Now, since increase in ROS is a very uh, known source of causing uh, DNA damage. We of course looked at signs of DNA damage and found that there is a significant increase in DNA damage uh, markers like 8-hydroxyguanosine or uh, phosphodiestone and P53 levels, which are much higher in uh, cells grown in E8 compared to KOSR. The second thing that we looked for is uh, nucleic acid uh, aberrations as shown here. Uh, we saw a larger number of uh, aberrant mitotic figures in cell grown in E8. And uh, another thing that does not get represented is while we don't see gross chromosomal abnormalities in cell grown in 
a defined media. What people don't mention or report is the number of uh, other small mutations that occur. And as can be shown, seen in this graph, that the number of single nucleotide mutations and small insertion deletions are quite high in cells grown in E compared to QSR media. So this is a curious observation and is, is also a good pointer for uh, students who are using uh, food group and stem cells that they uh, look at these few parameters when they're culturing their cells. <clears throat> when you add retinol to E8, then just like cells grown in QSR, uh, HPSCs are capable of taking up retinol and uptake of retinol causes lipid body formation uh, with sequestered retinyl palmitoquinone. Uh, so addition of retinol to the uh, 2E8 changes the metabolic state of the cells in E8. Uh, this is further uh, confirmed by this RNA-seq data in which just pulled out a few genes, but what can be seen from here is uh, upregulation of genes, uh, body formation and downregulation of genes uh, known to have a role in fatty acid catabolism, which shows that addition of retinol to cells grown in E8 does shift the uh, cell metabolism, specifically lipid metabolism. We also have seen that addition of retinol actually primes uh, pluripotent stem cells for higher proliferation. But when you add uh, lipid along with retinol to E8, then what we have seen is that it increases both the mitochondrial and glycolytic flux of the cell. So there is increased uh, uh, proliferation. There is increase in the flux status of both the mitochondria and the uh, and, and the glycolytic plugs. But, and more significantly, addition of retinol and lipid reduces the ROS levels uh, in E8. Um, it does not come down to as much as what you see in the standard media, which is the last bar in the graph that is shown here. But if you see <clears throat> the bar, which is for E8 uh, fatty acid and retinol, it is significantly lesser than uh, E8 alone. So addition of retinol and lipid to E8 media, in our experience, has shown to have uh, improved effect on the cell health uh, of cells grown in, uh, in culture. And indeed, this has also been validated by an independent study wherein by using metabolic flux analysis, the authors have shown that chemically synthesized media which are devoid of lipids, increases de novo lipid synthesis. Uh, and because of this, they deplete the intracellular NADH level. This causes a downregulation of oxidative metabolism, but an upregulation of redox state, causing cells to be uh, more prone to stress. And addition of Albumax restored the metabolic program in these cells and got them more closer to. So essentially the same thing. The authors here have used, have added Albumax, but we actually know the retinol uh, is a complement there. Albumax is a complex composition of retinol and lipid. So you really don't know which particular complement is doing this. But our uh, earlier uh, data shows that uh, specifically it is retinol and lipid. So this was a good validation to have for the observation that we made. So <clears throat> uh, what I have shown that cells grown in KSR uh, have extremely low ROS, uh, but the problem with KSR is that it is an undefined media uh, because we really don't know the level of uh, lipid and retinol that comes from serum. And there will be a lot of batch to batch variation. So therefore, if one is using E8, then supplementing E8 with retinol and lipid maintains the, uh, the utility that uh, the chemically defined media E8 brings on the table, uh, to the table. That is, the composition is simple. It is completely xenofree. It allows high proliferation of cells. 
But when you add retinol and lipid to that media, you can reduce the ROS levels. Uh, at this point, I do have to say that uh, we have not yet done detailed molecular analysis post addition of retinol and lipid to the eight cells to see that if there is an improvement in, in the, num in, in the uh, nucleic acid damage and uh, the, the burden of uh, the mutation burden that we saw uh, in E8 alone. So that is something that we have not done and that, that's something that I do need to make sure. But what we do see is that there is definitely a change in cell health, uh, both visibly as well as uh, in performance of the cells. So what I've shown you in the, in the presentation today is that uh, prime pluripotent stem cells uh, have a retinoid associated or uh, exhibit retinoid associated blue fluorescence. This property of the uh, of HPSCs can be employed to uh, characterize, isolate, and separate undifferentiated pluripotent stem cells from differentiated uh, derivatives. Uh, Retinoid-induced blue fluorescence is a context-specific marker. You don't see it in naive cells. You don't see it in uh, cells which have grown in uh, lipid depoid um, media. So it is not required for pluripotency. It marks uh, a particular state of pluripotent stem cells. But using that property itself, one can uh, isolate and uh, expand APSC culture, which is actually quite difficult to um, uh, culture because of the uh, requirement of microsurgery and uh, dissection. E8 media supplemented with retinol and lipid uh, gives you a better media composition uh, to work with your cells. And the technique that I have shown you uh, can make your routine culture more specific and more robust and give you a much better homogeneous IPSC cell lines uh, to work with, which will improve your uh, cellular phenotyping and ability to see cellular phenotyping. So with that, I will end. Um, here is the acknowledgement. This work was done in collaboration with Professor Panikar, and it's uh, quite interesting. I pulled out this image from the web, and he was also giving a blue talk. I think it's in CSCR. Um, Radhika started the work on blue fluorescence and then was uh, joined in by Selvan Minha, who completed the work and did some of the media work. With that, I'm going to end um, and can take questions. You can put. Okay. Uh, thank you, Aditi. It was a very uh, exciting talk and a very enriching talk with respect to me being a basic science uh, researcher. You know, at the end of the day, you won't believe that this technique is such a blessing. This blue imaging is such a blessing to carry out our regular day, even IPSC passaging, as simple as that. So uh, first, I would like to take a few questions. Um, Okay, so I have a question or you can um, give your viewpoint on with respect to feeder free culturing, what would you suggest would be the, um, you know, the best media to go ahead with? And is it that we keep our uh, cultures back from the MEF and continue doing that as a master cell bank? so that uh, these nuclear deformities, which do not come up as chromosomal aberration clearly in karyotyping, uh, can be you know, taken care of? So as I said, uh, I have nothing against chemically defined media. Uh, okay. So one can use whichever media that meets the requirement of their research. Uh, the, the talk here was not to discourage people from using a particular media, this thing. The talk was only to be sensitive towards certain perturbations that one need to keep in mind while culturing this because when we are culturing, we get so used to the condition, the media that it gets very difficult to shift. And we start believing that whatever we're seeing is the phenotype and the phenotype can have a lot of it. Having said that, as I've shown, I've only shown the data with E8 and I've shown it because a large number of people are using E8. 
but we have also done the same analysis using MTSER. And I'm sorry to say MTSER also shows similar results. So addition, and, and when you add uh, antioxidants, and now there are new formulations which are coming up in which you have chemically synthesized media, they're adding either glutathione or vitamin C or something as an antioxidant. So when you add these antioxidants to your culture, MTSER and EA, we don't see a reduction in ROS uh, to the levels that we have seen before. So that is something that one needs to keep in mind that probably the ROS levels are at such a uh, height that it takes time. We have done it and we have passage cells for at least four passages and we have not seen the ROS levels to come down. So uh, I don't have a full answer that either that is the only uh, dip that the ROS will see uh, or you need to passage these cells for a long time uh, for you to find that if there is a difference in them. But yeah, um, add retinol and add lipid and you can still use uh, conditioned media and it will work fine with you. Yeah, yeah, I got your point, totally. Uh, so uh, a question from Pooja. So can we observe photo bleaching associated with fluorescence imaging? Yeah, so as I have, uh, I, I think I had it in my slide deck. When exposed for a long time, the blue fluorescence, we do see that there is flow to ble bleaching, but it recovers by around 12 to 24 hours. So you should be able to see it. So it gives you enough time if you want to image it. Uh, it does not bleach during that time. But if you are looking and analyzing a particular region in your dish, then of course you will see uh, uh, a dip in the fluorescence. And then it recovers later on. So it's, uh, it does work if you want to screen to your cells. Yeah. And we have experienced it ourselves too. So if we again go back to some other field and come back to there, so you would again get to see your uh, blues staining very clearly. So yeah. thank you, Aditi, again to take out time for a symposium and uh, for this wonderful talk. And I purposefully kept uh, basic research science as uh, how it is important that through simple imaging technique, we can talk about as simple as the health of the cells. It might not be getting captured in the commercial uh, tests which we carry out, be it karyotyping or be it just a cell death or passaging, but it is important to look into the details. And, and yes, the answer lies in the details and we cannot ignore being scientists about it. Thank you, Aditi. Um, we will uh, next start our poster uh, presentations by students. There are a few of them. Um, so the first participant would be Priya Dashini. Yes, ma'am. Are you present? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so you can um, share your screen. screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah ma'am. So your time would be eight minutes. Seven minutes plus one. Is it visible? No, not yet. Wait a minute. Wait. Now, can you share it? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing. But for me, it is doing some error. Like, I can't share the screen. Let's try once again. Okay. No, again, is the same thing is coming. We have made you the co host. Wait one minute. Once more, we will do. Yeah. Okay, now try. Okay, ma'am. Now it is visible. Excuse me, ma'am. Now it is visible. Wait one minute. No, not. It's still not visible. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, you can do one more thing. Can you send us the, you can email your PPT. Okay. We will run the slideshow from here. Okay. One second, I'm doing. Yeah. I would also request Vivek that you mail your PPT and Keith so that we can share it from here. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am, I send the mail. Can you check it once? Yes. Here it is, visible. Uh, one minute. Go back again. Yes. Yes, it is visible. Right. Now you can make it to full screen. Oh, one second. Okay, fine, ma'am. Yes, that's good. Can I start? Yes, your time starts. Thank you. Uh, a very good morning to everyone. I am Priyadashini Mahapatra, a research scholar at BIT University, Vailor. Before starting the presentation, I would like to thank your conference team for giving me the opportunity to present here. And my topic is comparison between repurposing of atezolizumab and nexavar efficacy for hepatocellular carcinoma using multiple molecular imaging. And this is a small review article presentation. And before starting my presentation, I would like to give some idea about this topic. Uh, we all know cancer is the most trending and the most curious disease in the world. All scientists and almost all researchers working for finding any way to cure this. Maybe the early detection or maybe as a therapeutic, uh, um, therapeutic way. Although there are so many types of cancer, uh, among of them, hepatocellular carcinoma is the most common in the people with chronic liver disease caused by hepatitis B or hepatitis C. There are so many chemo drugs also available for SCC, but the main problem is the side effects of the drug. For this thing only, I choose this topic. So I'm carrying up the next. This is the diagr diagrammatic presentation. You can see here, this is the nanoparticle. Uh, here, this is the nanoparticle. Nanoparticle basically used to having targeting, sensing, and imaging and the drug delivery properties. So here I choose the AG nanoparticle, silver nanoparticle. The, the chemo drug, what we used to take in the, uh, for the common hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, it is having so many side effects. For reducing to that side effects, I choose this nanoparticle. The nanoparticle, uh, because this nanotechnology is now a basing to the disease world with help of so many different biomedical properties. Above all, the nanoparticle, silver nanoparticle is better in the case of bioimaging, bioactivity and biocompatibility. Bio uh, first, if we are loading this uh, chemo drug in this nanoparticle, uh, then it, the some properties and the technolo nanotechnology is the drug loaded nanoparticle, then we'll get the proper size with proper stability then it will trade against the SCC cell line. Here you can see the nanoparticle is having surface chemistry, aggregation and surface charge. And this while we will uh, load this drug in this nanoparticle, it will give you a prop particular size. So it will easy to go and target the particular cancer. This is here you can see this is inside the cell while we are putting this AG NP loaded chemo drug here. It is going and targeting the particular thing. It is not going to harm any normal cells. It will directly kill the cancer cell. It made the chances of 
uh, kill the cancer cell and in that stage maybe in the early stage we would able to through the bioimaging from staining procedure we can get to uh, know what is the condition of the cancer or if it is a last stage we can cure uh, by targeting the particular pathway so this is through uh, pi staining also we can get all these stages of the cancer and we can um, identify what is the stage and what we can do the or we can go for transplant transplantation or we can go for uh, chemotherapy or we can go for the target therapy or we can go for the radiation therapy and this is the introduction in previous studies also, this atezolizumab is used against hepatocellular carcinoma for more than a decade. In back to Nexavir also shows a good result against SCC. But there is not a comparison of these two particular drugs against SCC. And this is the aim of my studies, the therapeutic effects of the two chemotherapy drugs against SCC in, vit in vitro and in vivo using multiple molecular imaging and it will help out to the difference between the molecular and cellular difference at early stages. The, uh, because uh, these two chemo drug side effects is systematically evaluated in other studies and it is so that next of what it may lower the survival rate of SCC uh, some SCP uh, up mice. In these studies, we are trying to find out the better way while we can focus the molecular imaging through that early stage, we'll find it. And the methods also we can go uh, after the through the na nanotechnology will help through the nanotechnology. We can load that chemo drugs into the silver nanoparticle after getting the perfect stability and the perfect size, we'll go for the application part. And in the application first, we can try in the SCC cell line, the treatment, all these MTT assays and all. Is it the cell cytotoxicity or cell viability for studies? And again, after the study, we'll confirm is like this things is working or not. Then we can go to the PIA staining method. Through PIA, PIA staining method is nothing but propidium iodide. This is a fluorescent agent that can stain cell as well nucleus. So it will stain the DNA part for the early detection of DNA damage any thing is going on and also it will help out to find out the targeting on the molecular mechanism and as a result we can expect uh, after reloading the chemodrox into the silver nanoparticle then we can compare both of studies is like both different drug as like etosolizumab and nexavar uh, both other different uh, chemodrox in silver nanoparticle and we go for different studies then it will uh, give which drug is giving the better result against the SCC cell line. We can go for both in vitro and in vivo through uh, some bulb C mice also we can go and try it. Is it giving the proper image through the PI staining or not or DAPIC anything we can go for the early stage detection or the therapeutic ones also. And the conclusion part the proteogenomic and metabolic set two major thing that will help out the study micro micro environmental studies of SCC cell. Chemical metabolics is very useful for the study in the proteins and genes who are more responsible for cancer while reloading the chemotrics in aging uh, silver nanoparticle will reduce the side effects and will help out the studies of bioimaging and early detection of cancer through the molecular imaging. And maybe the questionnaire is why I choose um, um, silver nanoparticle because silver nanoparticle is safe recognition through that we can go for um, transmission microscopy, seam microscopy, fluorescence microscopy or biocompatibility. In the biocompatibility we can get antigens detection and linkers addition. In the bioimaging also we can get the optical density, fluorescence and paramagnetic properties and we'll go for the bioactivity means anti-cancer we can get and the nano composition we can go for uh, nano composition, we can go for two to three nanometrial together and go for the drug delivery also, early stage detection. And here we can see this is the um, silver nanoparticle. It and is. Here is uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the time is up actually. So we'll have to stop the presentation. Okay, this is my last slide only. Okay, okay can I stop? Yeah, yeah, continue, just finish it off. Okay, just this is my last only. So here it is, is the silver nanoparticle. See, this is the basic role of induce the mitochondria chain and concept, uh, concept disruption. The least to uh, superoxide is here. This superoxide is to um, 
the anion leakage and when a uh, silver nanoparticle will internalize with cytoplasm compartment then ag plus ions release which includes mitochondrial enzymes sorry uh -huh. it is the mitochondrial enzymes um, with the proteins by this way the rvc and potential of gs decreased and oxidative stress occurred then dna damage can occur then cell can die so this way we can go for daily detection we can go for the target the way thank you thank you pradeshini um we'll take any questions if they are there if not due to short of time we will go ahead with vivek vivek can you hear me yes ma'am yes um we have made you the co-host and you can start your presentation okay Um, can I start? Yes. Okay. You start now. Start. Vivek, you can start now. One minute. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, My title is Golgi Cox Steny revealed the altered span density in the pilocarpin model of temporal lobe epilepsy. The slide is not slide is not moving. You go back. Um... To your PowerPoint. Don't make it full screen. Get back to your PowerPoint and again try it. Do escape. No, I'm trying to escape, but uh, yeah. don't worry. It's coming. It's coming. Don't worry. Okay. Um, so uh, here I want to explain the epilepsy. Uh, epilepsy is a uh, central nervous system disorder. in which in which brain activity become abnormal and causing seizure uh, the patient uh, feel the unusual behavior and sometimes lost the awareness uh, if the uh, we are primarily focus in the temporal lobe epilepsy uh, in the temporal lobe epilepsy basically affected the region is the hippocampus but is also affect the temporal lobe epilepsy uh, temporal lobe region also affected a lot of different present between epileptogenic network and epileptogenic zone if epileptogenic zone present in the hippocampus then it's also affect to the temporal lobe temporal lobe is a epileptogenic network generally epileptic genic zone is static but epileptogenic network is dynamic so uh, in our laboratory also in our laboratory also prove that uh, the glutamatergic level are higher in the hippocampus and temporal lobe both so our hypothesis is the uh, our hypothesis is the the glutamate level alteration in the hippocampus and temporal lobe both so we suggested that we hypothesize that the something network alteration in tle possible by altered dynamic dendritic and axonal growth re reconstruct reconstructing of spine generation of new circuit and synaptic or reorganization so our hypothesis is there is difference between morphology and branching of the apical and basal dendrites of the pyramidal neuron in temporal lobe epilepsy so here my objective is we have studied the apical and basal dendrites of the pyramidal neuron in temporal lobe epilepsy model using by the golgi cox staining the analysis done by using the neural lecida software here we have taken the uh, rat sample we have taken the pilocarpin model of the rat we given the 250 mg the pilocarpine injection and uh, we generate the seizure we measure the seizure severity level using the rsna scale we consider only rsna scale 4 and 5 for our study and we isolate the brain sample and we fix it further we fix it in the golgi solution and further we cut the section using the vibrotome and uh, analysis by the analysis by the imaging using the neural lecida software and counting done by the 
neural stacks to learn. We check our sample or rat achieve the TLE pathology or not. So we done the CV stain to check the our rat achieve the TLE pathology or not. Here, this is the hippocampus C1 region. This is the hippocampus C1 region of the pilocarpine model. We found that the in the control sample, the C1 region are intact and neuronal morphology are normal, but in the pilocarpine epilepsy uh, rats, the C1 layers are disrupted and the neuronal morphology are altered. Same type of uh, result also found in the temporal lobe region. In the temporal lobe region, the neuronal morphology are altered in the epilepsy rats as compared to the control rats. So we done the Golgi staining uh, in the circle. We traces this is the control neurons and this is the pilocarpine rats C1 region neuron. This is the traces neuron used traced by neuron traces by the neural insida software. The this is the basal. This is the basal dendrites and this is the apical dendrites. Apical dendrites also originate from the upper part of the soma. We found that in the hippocampus region, the apical dendrites level are not significant changes, but in the basal dendrites level are significant changes. Generally, basal dendrites are involved to receive the signal from the nearby, nearby the near passes the soma and it's regulate the intracellular and extracellular signal. But in the case of temporal loop, we found that we found that the we traces this uh, neuron with neural acid software. We found that the apical dendrites level are higher in the temporal loop as compared to the control by two independent epileptogenic network in this region. We done the SOL analysis to reveal a significant increase in the number of the apical, apical and basal dendrites in the pilocarpine treated rat in comparison to the controlled animal. The results suggested increase the dendrogenesis in the TLE rat as compared to the control. This study demonstrated the alteration in the dendritic processes of the pyramidal neuron and temporal pyramidal neuron in the pilocarpine model of growth reconstructing the branching and production of the new circuit in the synapse. This is the our lab member. Thanks. The, uh, this is study supported by the DVT government of India. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. That's a nice presentation. Thank you. Next, we will go to the next presenter, Shivani. We have made you the co-host. Uh, yes, ma'am. Whether we, you can share the presentation. Ye yes, ma'am, just a minute. Um, is it available? Uh, I mean, you can see the screen. Yes. Yeah. Um, so today's uh, presentation topic, which I'm going to present, is about the mesenchymal stem cells as an approach to treat pressure wound in diabetic rats. This is uh, the work which we have carried out in our institute. And uh, just giving a brief, very brief introduction, uh, diabetic wound is an open sore or the wound and which is a major cause of uh, all the diabetic foot ulcers, which usually leads to amputations in the human beings. So we tried to correlate the uh, pressure wound with the, uh, in the animal model by creating a, such a model which can mimic the human conditions. The aim of this study was to, uh, of this project was to study the effect of children dental pulse stem cells in diabetic wound healing. This is the methodology which we use. The species of the animal which we use is Vistar rats, weight of uh, 200 to 250 grams. Gender, we used male uh, rats. Number of animals used was 18. And uh, they were housed in the animal house for about 30 days, starting from the acclimatization till the last final histopathological study. The drug which we used, uh, I mean, the treatment which we used is children dental pulp stem cell therapy and uh, doses is uh, which we used for the test uh, population uh, test group is children dental pulp stem cells, 0 0.5 million cells per ml. Route of injection which we used was uh, intramuscular injection for of the stem cells and dosing was done on the first, fifth and tenth day of the study. So these were the groups which we used. Uh, first group was diabetic control where the diabetic wound was created. 
and so first the animals were made diabetic and then the wound was created second group which we used was diabetic wound plus the stem cell single dose injection and the second group uh, second test group which we used were diabetic wound plus the stem cells multiple dose injections here we did not use any uh, standard actually uh, standard treatment but uh, still we can uh, we have got the good results here the actually the lacuna of the study was that we wouldn't use the standard uh, we lost some of the animals in the standard group so there were so because the uh, statistically it would have been significant so we have not included in the presentation here so on day 0 the animals were housed uh, and uh, they were acclimatized for 7 days then on the day 8 streptozoatosin injection was given 45 mg per kg body weight of the rats and uh, then we waited for uh, the and to, for the diabetes to get induced in the animals which we tested with the help of uh, conducting the uh, glucose test uh, by using the glucometer once the uh, diabetes was confirmed in the test uh, in the all uh, all the groups wound was created and on the day 1 of the wound creation single dose and the first dose of multiple uh, group of dental pulp stem cells was given to the uh, to the animals then it was again repeated on day 18th and day 23rd of the multiple dose group on day 28 we conducted the histopathology and uh, also we have done the biochemical estimations which we will discuss further so these are the results basically uh, human dental pulp stem cells promoted wound healing in our uh, in our uh, project all the groups showed reduction in the wound areas and uh, this is the photograph of all the animal uh, groups this is the photos for the these are the real time photos which we clicked during the study these are the photos for on day 1 day 5 day 10 and day 15 of the study for the control group uh, control as in diabetic control group uh, this were the wound in the single dose uh, uh, animals and this were the results in the multiple dose animals so here by even by the visual uh, uh, by even by looking at it we can see that there is a lot of uh, difference in these single dose and multiple dose as compared to the control uh, or maybe non treated group we measured this uh, wound contraction with the help of vernier caliper and these all measurements are in the uh, mm these are all for day 0 5 10 and 15 and this is the percentage of closure which in the last column shows the percentage of closure this is about this first table is about the control group where uh, we can just see that the percentage of closure of the wound because the wound basically also tries to uh, cover or heal itself as well but uh, so here we have seen that percentage of closure is, is uh, ranging from 65.8% to 69.0% whereas in the single and multiple dose the percentage closure was much higher it is 88 to 93% and in the multiple group uh, dose multiple dose group uh, the percentage closure is up to 99% as well this is the graphical representation of the same uh, thing which i just showed in the table blue uh, bars represent the day 0 green bars represent day 5 and uh, day 10 and purple day 15 so these are the comparisons of the control single dose and multiple dose so to conclude uh, this work diabetic pressure wound is a major challenge because uh, none of the existing therapies are capable to actually completely heal the diabetic ulcer of course the uh, ulcer is uh, if it is a non diabetic ulcer there are more chances of the ulcers to get healed but in case of diabetes the uh, the 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 percentage of healing is much lesser and uh, because of that there are many amputations occurring in the human uh, population and therefore we have conducted this study where we successfully showed that uh, human dental pulp stem cells are having a very good effect on uh, diabetic wound healing i already mentioned that uh, the limitation of the study is we did not include the standard group here because of certain reasons and uh, that is it for my presentation shivani yes ma'am thank you for keeping to your time too and uh, it was quite clear so we will go to the next participant
I'll just stop sharing. Sharing. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Able to hear me. So we have made you the co-host. Yes, ma'am. Sharing your slides. Ah, uh, share screen. Share. Are you able to see my screen, ma'am? Not yet. Hello. Yeah, not, not yet. yet. Okay, um, I clicked on share screen and then I click on share and it's going to uh, now. Don't worry, it's going to come. It's showing Hello? double click to enter full screen mode from your okay. side. Uh, is it visible now? Hello? No, not yet. Uh, not but you... It's going to slow. Yeah, but it's showing it's here. Zoom dot s is sharing your screen. Mm. Hello. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Can you try uh, closing the PowerPoint and opening it again? Maybe then. We can... Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, mm. Is it visible now? No, not Hello? yet. No, not yet. Um, okay. Mine is closed. Um, what should I do now? I mean, start video. But it's showing uh, that you are sharing the screen. Yes, we are also getting that, but it is not appearing. So probably there is some internet lag in your place. Okay, so what should I do now? You can uh, mail us your PPT. We will yeah, play, sure. We will play it from here and you can always explain. Okay, I have sent it to you. Okay, a few minutes. Two minutes, please bear with us. Sure. We have received it. We are opening it now. Okay. Stop participant sharing. And we can share it. That's Regina. Okay. Let's click on that. Share. This one? Yes. Enable invitation. Yeah. Can, is it visible? Yeah, yeah. Can I start? Yes, you can start. And when you want your next slide, please give us the cue. Yeah, sure, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Ina, working with Dr. Amit Mishra. Today, my, uh, my talk is on transient transfection of lung and airway epithelium with gamma interferon. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, as we all know, increasing incidence of antimicrobial resistance threatens ability to treat and manage microbial pathogens. So there is a need of new therapeutic strategies to address these antimicrobial resistance. Pathogen develop antimicrobial resistance through various factors, like uh, modification in the cell level of protein by decreasing the cell wall rigidity by undergoing dormancy and sporulation, and other factors. These various factors develop functions which are essential to eradicate these pathogens. Host direct therapies uh, might be a new strategy to eradicate pathogens through 
uh, activation of apoptosis and autophagy by increasing the oxidative and nitrosative by activating the adaptive immune response and thus uh, maintaining the immune homeostasis. Next slide, please. Uh, next, uh, yes. So uh, here, interferon gamma has been a potential host-directed therapy. Jeffrey et al. has demonstrated that it delivery to the activated macrophage will play a role in host defense. Content also is plus interferon gamma has shown efficacy in multiple tuberculosis. But its cost and stability of cold and transport, especially in limited resource lactic, is a hurdle to use it in clinical use. And yes, its prolonged uh, in, in system may cause similar pathology. So we hypothesize that its transient transfection into the lung ARV might activate the host immune response without inducing pathological inflammation to the lung and airway. Next slide, please. Uh, so, um, these are my objective transient section of the epithelium and then evaluate its role in the lung and ARV with gamma interferon. And to accomplish this prepared formulation, to provide host direct therapy with gamma interferon and efficacy in modern uh, mouse mouth tuberculosis exercises. Uh, so these are my work plan. We prepared DPA formation, established transfection protein expression, then put in functionality in view, established preclinical of concern, and thus evaluates preclinical efficacy. Next slide, please. Um, these um, these are methodology, uh, but because of that time, we'll come to, uh, to the result and discussion, which include methodology also. Next slide. So we mix DNA and polythene amine and make a polyplex. Next slide, please. And uh, next, uh, after making the polyplex, we optimize the ratio of polythene amine and we found one ratio to efficient to make polyplex. Next slide. And after making um, the polyplex, we uh, use this exit to make the DPA function stable for DNA inhalation. Next slide, please. Um, after this, we established the uh, stability of DNA inside the microparticles and known the DNA was stable inside the microparticles when compared with the plasmid DNA. Next slide, please. Uh, here, the particle is in shape and the particle were of uh, MMUD 2.8 micron, which is also tape for deep and inhalation. Uh, here, we have shown the next slide. Here, we have shown next slide, please. Uh, here we have shown the in vitro uh, expression of this foreign gene protein inside the A5 4 line lung epithelial cell line. When compared to the protein pro control, the protein was addressing high. Next slide, please. In um, after we want to see whether this protein is transient in nature or not, because it is not transient, it will cause immunopathology. And so we observed the slide at a different point, and we shown that the at 6 r there was expression of protein, but at a later point of time, the protein was merging with the lysosome and, uh, and down regulated its own uh, expression. So it is transient in nature. Next. Uh, here we have checked it in vivo and we have shown at different time point the protein was expressing and later point of time it is depleting down. So it is transient in vivo also. Here, uh, next. Here we have uh, acted the mice with the microtome tuberculosis and after 20 years once we live in interferon gamma and we have found that there is a two log order magnitude reduction in bacteria when compared with the control. Next. Uh, here we check the immunopathology of the lungs. We have shown that the, there is a um, gross improvement in the lung Rina, your audio has just disappeared. Can you recheck it? We are unmuted. No, make it full screen. Okay. Rina, can you hear us? Hello. 
Hello, Rina. Okay, so for some network issue, must be some network issue due to which um, we're not able to contact Rina. Um, do one thing if she can get it uh, fixed, we we'll should you Hello, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm here again because there was a network issue. I was yeah. here now. Sorry. So okay. wait, we will start resharing again. Yeah. Sorry. Let's see. I'm down. Okay. Yeah, there is an improvement in the lung morphology and reduction in the lung tools. Next slide, please. Next. Uh, yeah, uh, we want to know whether the, on the function of from gamma and we tag them with the uh, fuzzy markers LC3 and M1 and at later point of time we did the expression of this protein high. So we might conclude that uh, interferon gamma is functioning for an induction of autophagy. Next slide please. Next please. Hello, next please. Next slide please. I'll release a summary. Uh, you can't see? Yeah, hello. Yeah, next slide, please. No, the, uh, I cannot see the summary. Okay, go back to summary. Can you see now? Have yeah. Seen. No, ma'am. Okay. There is an autophagy uh, slide over there. Yeah, this pharmacokinetics of alpha and gamma. Now it's the pharmacokinetics. So yeah, I but I'm not able to see it. Can you please explain anyways you will have? Yeah. Yeah. Um, here in this uh, slide, we have shown that the population uh, of inferon pharma compared with the uninfected and infected mice, we note a corresponding difference between pharmacodynamic outcome of induction of autophagy. The sex alpha is nearly three-fold high in infected mice compared with the healthy mice. This might be because of the induction of autophagy. Mice started 18 hours, which was about six hours in uh, healthy mice. So at the summary, this is my summary, and I conclude that we have uh, uh, we have presented the preclinical proof of concept for transient transfection of respiratory tissue interferon gamma into the respiratory tissues as a host therapy. And these are my publications. I have, we have recently published our paper in molecular therapy nucleic acid with this project work. And I thank you for sending me <laughs> even after all these problems. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Rina. Yes, finally. Thank you. Um, as we go to the next yeah. video, whatever little time we have, Aishwarya Raj, she will present from here, Bangalore. So uh, I would be, um, I'm Aishwarya, and I would be talking about the deleterious effect of extracellular alpha-synuclein on astrocytic function. So um, this study is revolving around Parkinson's disease, uh, which is a neurodegenerative disorder uh, with characteristic loss of DNA neurons in the midbrain region, especially in the uh, SNPC region, with the characteristic occurrence of LBs, Levi bodies, composed of alpha-synuclein and ubiquitin. So um, what we have seen is that alpha-synuclein aggregation is not just limited to DNA neurons. It is also observed in the uh, astrocytes of the midbrain region and uh, also seen in CSF of PD patients. So uh, these studies establish the presence of alpha-synuclein in the CS CNS microenvironment during disease progression. And it is highly likely that the niche cells around the uh, DNA neurons is getting uh, affected prior to the death of the the dopaminergic neuron. So through the study, we have evaluated midbrain, midbrain astrocytes for their function uh, with respect to alpha-synuclein treatment. 
So uh, using immunofluorescence technique, we first check control astrocytes, uh, their uh, morphology, uh, the flat morphology was observed. But once alpha-synuclein was treated, that is alpha-synuclein was given to the um, uh, extracellular medium of these cells, we have used four types of alpha-synuclein, wild-type monomer, wild-type aggregate, mutant monomer, and mutant aggregate. So in all these four forms, we saw immense uh, uh, inflammation which show, which is uh, proven by the um, uh, thinning of the processes of these astrocytes. Um, so, for so that that is how we uh, we we uh, found that there is alpha synuclein association with astrocytes, which is shown uh, by the uh, yellow puncta that is seen in all four treatment types. Further, what we wanted to check is how is the role of astrocytes uh, affected, function of astrocytes affected with respect to uh, neuron uh, defense or uh, differentiation, neuroprotection, excitotoxicity, et cetera. So uh, we first check the main thing that is seen in Parkinson's, which is the oxidative stress uh, generation and its vulnerability to e uh, external oxidizing conditions. And we found that um, uh, basal itself was uh, higher in all four peptide treatment types, which uh, uh, aggravated with uh, 6-OHDA and H2O2 uh, treatments. So now if there is a oxidative stress generation, is it because of the NRF2 expression changes was the next question. So uh, we checked uh, the protein expression of NRF2 and we found that yes, there was a significant decrease in the uh, NRF2, which was also checked by uh, immunofluorescence where we found that with peptide treatment, the quantity, uh, the quantific, um, yeah, the quantity of NRF2 reduced plus its localization in the nucleus where it was supposed to be uh, acting as a, a transcription uh, factor, uh, that localization was also reducing. So uh, further in oxidative stress, now if there is a reduced NRF2, what happens to the glutathione content and relative, uh, related enzymes? And we found that um, the uh, um, glutathione content also reduced with uh, peptide treatment. Further, the glutathione synthetase and glutathione reductase enzyme uh, gene expression was also reduced. That was regarding uh, oxidative stress and uh, glutathione uh, uh, and related enzymes. So another important factor that we have to look in uh, these cells is a, a prevention of excito glutamate excitotoxicity. So uh, a few enzymes and glutamate content was what we looked into next. So glutamate content also uh, glutamate content, especially with the aggregate treatment increased when compared to the control. And uh, there is a pyruvate carboxylase gene, which is uh, 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 the enzyme which is involved in uh, de novo synthesis of glutamate in the cell that also has increased uh, significantly, especially in the uh, aggregate uh, treated cells. Now, if there is all the, uh, uh, this glutamate uh, de novo synthesis or glutamate uptake into the cell, all these are uh, ATP consuming activities. So uh, the next thing that we looked is uh, the glutamate dehydrogenase enzyme uh, expression. What happens to it? Because glutamate dehydrogenase actually converts uh, glutamate into alpha ketoglutarate uh, but, and thus entering into the TCA cycle to produce more ATP. So. Uh, because of this increased uh, uh, PC pyruvate carboxylase activity, there is a lot of ATP uh, being eaten up in the cell. So uh, to compensate for that loss, yes, there was increased uh, GDH enzyme uh, activity also seen, which is uh, 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 quantified using live cell fluorescence imaging. And um, uh, by uh, uh, calculating the NADH uh, uh, fluorescence. So I can just show a comparison between control and uh, uh, my mutant aggregate cells. So there is a sudden increase and you know uh, uh, a prolonged increase in the um, fluorescence in the mutant aggregate cells compared to the control cells. Control cells, the fluorescence is still lower only. So that is how we saw, uh, and this is just uh, NADH fluorescence actually. Uh, so that is how we saw that there is increased GDH enzyme activity.
So to conclude, yes, there is a differential effect in the peptide uh, uh, treatment on the function of astrocytes. Mutation and aggregation in, uh, uh, actually increased or exerted a deterioration in the function. And this will actually help us uh, uh, you know, consider niche cells as potential targets for uh, therapeutic strategies. And um, uh, most of the experiments that I've shown here is actually uh, with the help of molecular imaging. And that is how I have uh, included this in the uh, presentation today. Um, I would like to acknowledge DBT, DST Inspire, and Anim Hans uh, for all their support. Thank you. Any questions, please comment, uh, uh, put it in the chat box. I will reply to it. Thank you. Um, I think we can accommodate one more presentation uh, from the student section. So, so, yeah. so the next presenter is Soha. Good afternoon. I will be presenting my work uh, related to characterization of iPSCs and iPSC derived neuronal cells from Parkinson's disease patients of Indian ethnicity. So, a brief introduction Parkinson's disease uh, is a neurodegenerative disease uh, characterized by the uh, loss of dopaminergic neurons in the midbrain. It's a multifactorial disease uh, with uh, different factors contributing towards the pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, chief amongst them is mutations in the uh, LRRK2 protein, uh, which uh, and the mutations uh, differ ac ac according to ethnicities. So, since uh, PD is a multifactorial disease, we there is a need of a model which can mimic closest to the patient as uh, to provide a better picture of the underlying molecular mechanisms uh, which go haywire in the disease. So, uh, if we check uh, the mutations which are there in the LARC2 protein and um, plot them along with the population, we find that uh, uh, different populations uh, have different mutations. So uh, the most heavily researched uh, mutation for LARC2 with respect to Parkinson's disease is the G2019S. However, uh, its uh, frequency is quite less in the Indian population. The in, in the Indian population, we see the I1371V mutation is more common for which uh, we have generated a stem cell model, an induced pluripotent stem cell model. This is the brief workflow which we have followed, that we have isolated uh, peripheral blood mononucleosides from healthy subjects as well as patients with Parkinson's disease uh, carrying this mutation. Uh, these iPSCs have been characterized for their stemness markers, uh, which have then further been differentiated into neural progenitors and ultimately differentiated into dopaminergic neurons, which is the target cell type for Parkinson's disease. The techniques, the relevant techniques which I will be talking today are phase contrast microscopy, uh, retinyl ester associated blue imaging, as Aurithimam had shown, alkaline phosphatase, immunofluorescence, and flow cytometry. So we isolated the PBMCs from the blood samples of the patients as well as healthy subjects using a density gradient centrifugations. Uh, these PBMCs were cultured and then uh, tra uh, transfected with a non-integrative virus, Sendai virus, uh, with the Yamanaka factors to generate uh, iPSCs, uh, uh, iPSC colonies. These iPSC colonies uh, show expression of alkaline phosphatase, an enzyme which is highly elevated uh, in pluripotent stem cells like embryonic stem cells or iPSCs. Uh, on treatment with the, with the substrate for alkaline phosphatase, the phosphate group is cleaved off and a green fluorescence is emerged, which can be seen uh, with a very high intensity into the uh, iPSCs uh, in comparison to the feeders on which they are growing. We also did the, uh, we also observed a retinyl ester associated blue fluorescence since uh, we are growing the cells in a 20% KOSR medium. To further confirm uh, the presence of stemness and pluripotency markers, 
we have done uh, indirect immunofluorescence and found the expression of stemness markers like NANOG, OCT4, SSCA4, and TRA160. Uh, since this is a, a qualitative estimate, we've also done a quantitative uh, assay to check how much percentage of our stem cells are expressing these stemness markers. This is just a brief uh, schematic of how flow cytometry works that uh, we would be uh, taking the sample of uh, all our cell populations. The non-target cell types, which do not express our, the protein of interest, would not, buy, uh, would not get targeted with the antibodies, which are targeted with fluorophore, while the target cell types will ex exhibit fluorescence, which will be detected uh, using the lasers. And uh, that would give us an estimate of the percentage of cells expressing the markers. So we found out that both the healthy as well as the PD patient derived iPSCs show expression of stemness markers. Further, we generated uh, embryoid bodies from these iPSCs and uh, we checked the pluripotency of these iPSCs to differentiate into ectoderm, endoderm and mesoderm lineages by again indirect immunofluorescence as well as the uh, polymerase chain reaction for gene expression. We further generated neural progenitors from these iPSCs. Uh, these were further enriched for uh, PSA and CAM, a, a marker which is highly expressed in migratory neural progenitors as well as neuroblasts, and which will help us obtain a neuron restricted progenitors to further differentiate into neurons. These were uh, <clears throat> enriched using magnet magnetic sorting, where we used magnetic tagged antibodies and uh, ran it through magnetic columns to get an enriched population. As we can see, that uh, the NPs were enriched for these uh, PSA and CAM molecules. These NPs also show expression of the uh, NP markers like Nestin, SOX2, KI67, as well as S100 beta by indirect immunofluorescence. Further, uh, dopaminergic neurons were generated from these NPs using morphogens. And we uh, found out the classical, the neuronal morphology of neurite, uh, neurite formation and arborization in these dopaminergic neurons through a 10-day protocol. To confirm the dopaminergic neuron identity, we did Im uh, immunofluorescence uh, with markers such as NGRAILD1, beta-3 tubulin, tyrosine hyd hydroxylase, as well as NUR1. Uh, so using phase contrast microscopy itself, uh, we could we could using phase contrast microscopy itself, we could find out that uh, the neurons uh, derived from the PD patient samples showed axon degeneration, which is uh, typically observed, which is typically observed in cells uh, undergoing neurodegeneration. We quantified it, and uh, there was uh, the axon degeneration in the patient samples was significantly higher compared to the healthy iPSCs, iPSC-derived neurons. Uh, also, another functional parameter is the synapse density. So we uh, did the immunostaining of these iPSC-derived neurons with a presynaptic protein SYN1 and a postsynaptic protein PSG95. The co-localization of these two proteins uh, represents the synapse density, which was significantly higher in the healthy iPSC derived neurons compared to the PD samples. We also did, uh, uh, since calcium homeostasis is known to be uh, altered in Parkinson's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, we did uh, calcium imaging with uh, these iPSC derived neurons where the cells are stained with a calcium binding dye and then stimulated with the KCL and ATP and the responses are pl plotted over time. Here also we find out that on stimulation with KCL and ATP, the uh, healthy neurons uh, show much uh, much more calcium influx compared to the uh, PD derived neurons, indicating that the calcium homeostasis is also altered. So, uh, yeah. So, like utilizing all these techniques, we've characterized the iPCs and iPSC derived cells. Uh, we would like to thank ICMR for the fellowship and grant and providing support for the workshop. Any questions? You can please type in the message box. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we have had a quite intensive run of uh, talks from morning onwards. Uh, we would get back, we'll take a break, a lunch break.
till 2 p.m. Okay, so Eppendorf is there now, sorry. Uh, so we have Eppendorf uh, present here, so I had missed it out. So uh, we will have a short presentation from Eppendorf and this would definitely um, help the students even to get your pipetting technique correct or to validate that whether you're doing it in the correct mode or not, or when to get your pipettes checked. So um, the bum is with us, so you are being made the co-host and you can start your presentation. I hope uh, my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, uh, thanks a lot uh, for this opportunity. Um, so far, uh, you are all having a very long uh, scientific uh, discussion. Uh, my presentation a little bit uh, you know, different from uh, what uh, so far you are all uh, discussed. Uh, so, uh, here for getting a better results, how a pipette can influence, that is my uh, topic. Uh, because uh, uh, <clears throat> before starting my presentation, hello, just, uh, hello? Can you please on your camera also? And please make mm. it free. Yeah. Camera, where it is? Please make your screen full screen. Yeah. So I made a full screen only. Now it's visible full screen. PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, power. Okay. So I made it. Yeah. Click on F five, sir. Okay. There's some lag, like me. Okay, you can continue. No problem. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now it's okay. Our full screen is not there because I made it already in the PowerPoint uh, mode only. Hello? Yes, sir, please go ahead. Okay, yeah. So my name is Babu. I'm uh, in Appendor for last 19 years and last 10 years I'm handling pipe and consumables only. Um, with that experience, uh, every day, we are discussing about consumables and pipette and uh, we come across a lot of questions from users and we also observed few things uh, in the user point. Uh, and then we realized, uh, you know, honestly, uh, the attention what pipette needed in every lab, it is not getting. So, and that's also one of the reason, even though people are having a one crore, two crore, very expensive equipment, so they are not getting a good results also. So then we thought that uh, why don't we share certain basic information and also refresh certain uh, basic things about uh, pipette. Then we developed this uh, presentation. So with this background, just I will get into my uh, slides. Uh, to make more interesting uh, what happened of uh, we did, uh, we ready to uh, share some kind of gift uh, to the people who are attending uh, this uh, presentation. Rather, uh, just like that, uh, giving that, uh, we decided to ask one question from my presentation. Uh, end of the presentation, I will share a link and through that you can give an answer. So whoever give an answer, uh, you will get a, a pen which uh, designed like a pipette. Uh, we got it from uh, Germany and uh, uh, who were uh, responding for our uh, question. You, uh, we directly send you the pipette pen from Eppendorf uh, Chennai. Okay, so Eppendorf founded in 1945 by these two gentlemen, Nethler and Heinz. Uh, from there, uh, we have a long journey now and uh, <clears throat> through that journey, we gained a lot of uh, knowledge also. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our founder, Nethler, and his friend uh, designed the first pipe in 1958. <coughs> then uh, he started manufacturing and able to make a, a first launch of a pipe in 1961. So launch of first industrial manufactured piston stroke pipe happened in 1961. 
uh, from there it get a lot of momentum and now uh, we reach um, the level of uh, uh, research plus explorer and reference to uh, pipette anyway i am not going into the commercial aspect of uh, append of product so i will get into that so the common problem normally when you are using a pipette you will get a uh, bubbles in the liquid uh, then uh, even though i pipe it out i am not able to uh, pipe it out the fully from the tip because some kind of residues uh, it is staying there i am not getting a reproducible results so sometimes people think it is a problem of pipe it but um, uh, it is also problem of the technique what we are uh, using it so uh, in the next um, uh, 20 minutes i will cover uh, certain points and uh, if you need a more information please reach us uh, we can uh, share you more information on that also okay so in pipette uh, there are two type of pipette one is called air cushion uh, pipette this is a pipette normally you are using in your uh, lab so here what happen when uh, you are using this uh, pipette you will press the piston from the top when you are pressing this whatever air inside it will goes out of the tip and when you are releasing the piston again this air will come back to the tip between the piston and the sample always a air gap inside the pipette so due to that this pipette it is called as a air cushion pipette so what will happen uh, when uh, you are uh, handling some kind of highly highly vapor pressure uh, samples it it, it never uh, stays in your uh, tip like this uh, you when you are aspirating you will have uh, this kind of uh, dripping problem so normally when we ask people say no that's a problem of the pipe but actually it is not a problem of the pipe it is a problem of the technique what we are using the reason is that when Please, we are aspirate are not uh, visible sir i mean like uh, are you changing uh, because we can't see the change sir so i am in a next slide called pipetting principle air cushion whether it is visible no sir we are still in the second slide okay i don't know um uh, shall we connect uh, the computer with aditya so that you know it will be uh, from your side you can do it also is it okay or because yeah, no. aditya Ad aditya having all this presentation ready available in his computer also or because i don't know what to do now because my office is having a fast internet uh, connection uh, no, you just click to the slide which you are presenting then it will come then feature Yeah, I already clicked it. Now it is in the. Yeah, you can send us your PPT. Aditya is there in your uh, near to you. He is having everything in his laptop. But okay. he is not. Uh, He's uh, not online. You are not able to make him co-host. no what i'm saying he said he is present in your campus only near to uh, uh, you only no no we are different <clears throat> location we are in telemedicine center not in our department cuz if i send it this is a little bit bigger file i don't know whether you will get it if i put it in a powerpoint none of my video will work sir if it i put it in a pdf none of my uh, video won't work um so can you also either uh, at least increase the um size like uh, it is at 44% now so click to add notes okay add it as present as really was Yes, sir. Uh, Rini, what? Uh, am, am I am I audible now? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Babu, sir. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so now your screen is working. Yeah, now your oh, screen yeah. is working. You can go ahead, please. My my screen is visible now. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. okay so uh, when uh, when the air cushion pipette used uh, whenever you are aspirating a sample uh, it, it it never stays in the tip a drop by drop it will uh, drips down 
uh, one of the reason for this is uh, when we are aspirating a sample, the sample start to evaporate inside the tail. So already air pressure inside, due to this evaporation, there is a pressure build up inside the tail. So due to that reason only, it is pushing down the uh, sample. So that's a, one of the limitation of a air cushion uh, pipette. So for that, what we need to do when you aspirating a sample, aspirate and dispense a few times by doing it, whatever air inside the pipe it gets saturated. So with that, you can uh, reduce the level of uh, uh, dripping down. Or uh, you can use uh, another pipette called a positive displacement uh, pipette. So here, what is happening when you are aspirating a sample, the sample, it is in touch with the piston. Uh, due to that, uh, there is no air gap between the piston and the sample, and this technique it is called as a positive displacement uh, pipette. So, since there is no air gap between the uh, sample and the piston, uh, the dripping out of sample, or uh, when you are using a glycerol twin 10, twin 20 kind of samples, whatever difficulty you are having with the air cushion pipette, this can be eliminated here. For example, now I will show you. Uh, for uh, handling a highly vapor pressure sample. Is there a problem? Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, uh, sir. Is there any issue? No. No. Uh, we can't uh, hear your next listen. Again, the slides have stuck. Maybe yeah. That due to that internet. Aditya, where are you, Aditya? You are far away from that place. Uh, I am in Nimans. Babu sir, please uh, unmute yourself, sir. So, yes. Aditya, uh, can we share your uh, uh, computer now, Aditya? I'll, I'll share my screen. Yeah, that's better, no? Let's see whether it is visible or not. I'm sorry because I don't know. In I'm making this presentation from my office. We have a high-speed internet only. Yes, Aditya, come to the uh, uh, fourth or fifth slide now. Come down, come down. Make it as a PowerPoint uh, mode, Aditya. Here, here in the bottom, it is there. Next, 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 next. Come, come. Come, next, next. Is it visible now, the slides? Yeah, Aditya, okay, come to the next slide, Aditya. Ma'am, can you confirm whether it's visible now? It is visible, sir. Okay, right. Aditya, go to the next slide, Aditya. Yeah. <clears throat> Even you go to the next slide. So, uh, in uh, electronic pipette, uh, nowadays it's getting momentum. One of the reasons is that here, uh, very easily you can see the uh, up arrow mark and down arrow mark. 
uh, with that very easily we can set the aspirating speed and the dispensing uh, speed so if you want our reproducible results in a 96 well plate one of the thing is that we need to have a, a, a uniform aspirating speed and dispensing speed in that 96 well so if it is an electronic pipette we can set one as a minimum speed and eight as the maximum speed like a glycerol kind of samples when we are aspirating we need to aspirate very very slowly and when we are dispensing we need to make it fast so when you do it manually uh, my slow is not the slow of the next person so if you are comparing a two three plates then it is very difficult for you so in that case if you uh, people are start using a electronic pipette then they can set the aspirating speed and the dispensing speed by that all 96 well plate it will have a, uh, you know uh, able to get a uniform reproducible uh, results next slide please satya okay uh, you make it uh, full screen aditya next click next click next click also next one more yeah so in pipette there are two terminology always we discuss one is called accuracy and another one is called uh, precision so whenever we ask what is uh, the difference between uh, these two most of the time uh, the reply is that we never thought about it so like for example if you are pipetting out 0.5 ml in a tube uh, either it is a 0.4 or a 0.6 if it is happening then it is called inaccurate and imprecise uh if all the uh, five tube if it is having only 0.4 ml then it is called inaccurate but uh, it's a precise because sometimes when people are looking into the tube and sample are in the same position then they will come to conclusion that uh, uh, i am doing a good pipette but uh, in biology we can't accept this but what we need is a 0.5 ml in all uh, five uh, tubes yeah okay i'll tell you please move due to lack of time we will skip all these slides are there move it move it move it yeah so here uh, there are uh, pipette uh, we need to understand uh, two things very important one is called forward pipetting uh, it means in pipette there are two stop first stop and uh, second stop so this forward pipetting is useful for when we are handling a samples like a diluted uh, samples water buffers kind of thing uh, either you can click on the video also aditya uh, by uh, doing a forward pipetting uh, very uh, conveniently we can handle uh, this kind of sample so here for aspiration we will stop at first position and for dispensing we go up to the second stop so here in this video we are just aspirating and dispense aspirating and dispense it is called pre wetting of the tip that is good for whenever you are handling first time your own sample so here you can see Uh, we go, uh, gone up to the first stop and for dispensing we go up to the uh, second stop so this is suitable for water diluted uh, sample very easy samples next slide uh if uh, the reverse pipetting is uh, just opposite to the forward pipetting so here you can see uh, for aspiration we will go to the second stop for dispensing we will stop at the first position so now we aspirate and dispense and aspirate and dispense this is called the pre wetting of the tip by that whatever air inside it gets saturated so now we go to the second stop by going to the second stop we are going to aspirate little bit extra sample than the set volume and when we are dispensing we need to stop at first stop and whatever left out in the tip we need to discard the tip with that sample only so where we will use it for example if you are using highly vapor pressure sample if you stop at first position you are going to aspirate the exact volume before you dispense one or two drop gone down you don't have enough sample inside your tip so due to that reason if you use a reverse pipetting by going to the second stop we will aspirate a little bit extra volume than the set volume even though one or two drop gone down still we will have enough sample inside our tip so that's where the reverse pipetting uh, no more useful to that next slide please then the very imp uh, important thing is that when we are immersing the uh, tip the tip should not be immersed too much into the uh, sample uh, up to uh, 100 microliter it should not be immersed not more than 2 to 3 uh, millimeters that's why we say pipette is a mind game uh, when we are preparing a, in a 96 well or 384 well plate we see to that uh, every time we are aspirating from the same distance because the moment we put more inside into the uh, liquid 
then what will happen due to the uh, more uh, increasing in the density and the pressure more sample will get into your uh, tip than the set volume so that's why it is recommended to uh, dip uh, the tip same position for all your 96 uh, well so that's where this uh, liquid handling system fully automated liquid handling system plays a major role where you can set a program in a way that uh, it should not go beyond 2 mm means whenever the uh, automatic liquid handling uh, channels goes inside it never goes uh, beyond that so reproducible results are very good with the liquid handling system because of that only next slide please then the very important thing is that when we are aspirating a sample we need to hold it vertically and uh, every time if you are going to use a new sample aspirate and dispense minimum three times by that whatever air insert gets saturated next uh, uh, next aditya when we are uh, dispensing the tip of the tip it should touch the vessel and it should have an angle of 30 to 45 degree uh, by that uh, the capillary force which is happening on the tip of the tip it will be uh, you know uh, so uh, so good and you know even one microliter or two microliter can be dispensed uh, very perfectly into the uh, tube so in nutshell uh, either we need to choose a forward pipetting or reverse pipetting then the how much we are immersing the tip into the liquid then how we are holding the pipette for aspiration and how we are holding it for dispensing put together makes a lot of difference in our uh, pipetting next slide then the next one uh, quite often we used to understand uh, from uses that the pipette get contaminated why it is happening one of the reason is that since it's a air cushion pipette when we are pressing whatever air goes down from the tip it touches the sample and when we are releasing the piston whatever air touched the sample it is coming back next slide so due to that uh, uh, the contamination will come back to the pipette for avoiding that we can use a filter tip uh, if your uh, contamination is not very high then you can use a single filter and if you feel uh, you know you are handling a human sample where the single strand dna double strand dna are so small than the aerosol contamination in that better you can choose this uh, dual filter next slide uh, by having this dual filter the first one designed for uh, stop all aerosol contamination and second one to stop all biomolecule uh, contaminations next slide and uh, these filters quality is equal to hepa filter so you all know that in your bio safety cabin or in uh, your co2 incubator you will have uh, filters which is made out of hepa quality because hepa is the highest quality available and uh, these uh, filter tips are made out of HEPA. So due to that, we are giving you 100% assurance that your pipette is not get contaminated because of your uh, sample. Next slide. Then the other aspect of getting contamination is that the pipette nose cone. Most of the time we will have a sterile tip, but our uh, nose cones are not uh, sterile. So due to that, when you are aspirating a sample from 15 ml or 50 ml, uh, when you put your nose cone into that, this nose cone will touch the side of the tube and due to that also there is a possibility of contamination into the tube. So for that what you can do, uh, if you are having a less sample, better you can choose a 5 ml tube or a 25 ml tube, which is an unconventional uh, format because normally you have 1.5 ml, 2 ml, then 15 ml. Now append off, we launched a 5 ml and a 25 ml where we are having a snap cap as well as a screw cap uh, tubes also. Next. Um, uh, then uh, in case if you are uh, still want to use a uh, air cushion pipette then what you can do from the pipette supplier uh, you can choose a uh, uh, long tip also like uh, starting from uh, uh, 1 ml we are having uh, this uh, long tip uh, here you can see the length is a little bit longer than the normal tip by that when you are putting it to the uh, tube uh, only the tip will go inside. So by having it, we can avoid the um, contamination which is happening from the nose cone. Next slide. Yeah, yeah, move it, move it. Full, full slide. Yeah, one more. Also, when uh, you are choosing a tip, uh, always uh, try to, you know, if you are doing a very critical experiments, uh, better uh, uh, bring a tip which is as close to a off. 
in case if you don't want to buy it from append or you are buying from others uh, here just i kept it five different um, uh, tips from different vendor just you can see the length of the tip because whatever uh, the acceptable limit of specifications what append of we are giving that is uh, developed with append of uh, tip if too much of a tip length is there then there will be a problem also there so whenever you are having a very critical experiments my sincere suggestion is that uh, try to find it out a tip which is as close as to uh, tip because normally what is happening in india people always use a tarzan axon kind of tip and they say no uh, append of uh, should produce a tip uh, pipette for that yeah we are ready to do it unfortunately tarzan or axon they are not a manufacturer or pipette and they make one tip which is suitable for somewhere around 40 to 50 different pipette manufacturer in the world so that's a problem there so it is not a problem of uh, pipette it is a problem of the tip also and also next slide aditya <clears throat> aditya next slide aditya next slide Sir, I am on the uh, tip orifice slide. Yeah. Okay. Because it's not visible to me now here. It's not moving. For others, it's okay. Then. Uh... Others are able to see that uh, uh, next slide orifice uh, slide. Can someone confirm? it is fine sir we can fine answer. yes yeah. sir okay so uh, now uh, if you have uh, put that full slide are uh, aditya all the pictures in that slide because i am not seeing it any of you are seeing it it's okay yes all the pictures are on yeah so uh, whenever uh, you are having a tip uh, you take one of the tip uh, whatever you are using just keep it under the microscope just look at it uh, if uh, tip is having a perfect finish it's okay uh, some of the pictures i slow, uh, shown in the slide if you look at it uh, then you can see how how much flying plastic in every uh, tip so this uh, flying plastics always a uh, problematic to you in the down, last picture if you see there is a flying plastic inside the tip now you are dispensing one or two microliter of your template or your sample there is all possibility that it stay inside the uh, tip itself so that way you will have a lot of uh, difficulties yeah next slide aditya next slide that um... yeah i am on the uh, don't miss the chance to get the append of that yeah we move it to next slide now yeah maintenance yeah Aditya, you can speak about that, Aditya. Maintenance. Yeah, just just move it. Because I'm not able to see that. You want me to take it over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, pipette maintenance is another uh, uh, very important aspect to uh, take care and uh, um, you know increase the life of the pipette. so the maintenance of the pipette depends on what kind of samples you are using what kind whether it's aqueous protein nucleic acids and keep in mind that each uh, kind of sample needs different kind of maintenance i mean each kind of contaminant which uh, the pipette goes through needs different kind of uh, maintenance uh, protocol to be followed so i'll just quickly go through that so if you are using any aqueous solutions buffers or acids or alkali kind of uh, solutions the only thing you need to do is you can just uh, remove the entire lower part and uh, you can rinse the contaminated lower part in uh, 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 in uh, clean water distilled water and then you can uh, dry it out or keep it in a dry oven and uh, you can lubricate the piston or if it is a new pipettes or any 1 ml pipettes you need not lubricate it also and you can assemble the entire lower part again and fix it now when it comes to any organic solvents you can uh, what you need to do is the same thing 
you can just disassemble the lower part allow the liquid to evaporate whatever organic solvents are remaining in the uh, lower part and then <clears throat> just uh, rinse the contaminated lower parts in a mild detergent uh, solution and after that a detergent wash just uh, rim, uh, rinse it in water and allow it to dry then again uh, re reassemble the pipette back to this just bear in mind that you don't use any strong detergents because and if you have any uh, infectious samples that you are working with or any cell culture items uh, always uh, there are three types here uh, one is alcohol disinfection ultraviolet uh, ra radiation and autoclaving alcoholic disinfection 70% ethanol isopropanol at 60% wipe the entire pipette and the uh, in internal parts of the pipette and just allow it to dry it out and then lubricate the piston and assemble the pipette back ultraviolet irradiation just place the pipette entire pipette in uh, front of the uh, uv lamp and just make sure that you don't ex over expose the pipette uh, the you know, limited time is 15 to 20 minutes next is autoclaving autoclaving is uh, you just uh, take the uh, entire pipette uh, make sure we, uh, it differs from brand to brand some pipettes are not entirely autoclavable some only the lower parts are autoclavable so in that case you have to uh, disassemble the lower part and autoclave it so just place the entire pipe if it is append off you can place the entire manual pipette into your uh, in wrap it in aluminium foil and place it in your autoclave uh, uh, only thing here is the pressure should be 120 uh, the one bar at 131 degrees for 20 minutes only and once it's out of clear, you can just uh, remove it and allow it to dry and again uh, reassemble the pipette. So when it comes to nucleic acids, uh, uh, it's very important that you know uh, you understand what uh, is the right uh, maintenance uh, protocol to be followed here. So if it is nucleic acids, um, please be aware that autoclaving does not remove your uh, DNA or RNA traces. The uh, two methods you can do here is sodium hypochlorite uh, disinfection or glycine HCl buffer disinfection. So these are the methods where you can, uh, this is the protocol for that. Uh, you can just use in fresh solution and soak the lower part in the uh, sodium hypochlorite solution, rinse it and allow it to dry. The same thing goes for glycine HCl buffer. You can uh, rinse the lower part and allow it to rinse it well and uh, wash it with distilled water and uh, allow it to dry it out. Again, and again, reassemble the uh, pipette. And when, if you're using any protein samples, So if you're using any protein samples, you have to make sure that you don't, uh, you know, uh, use uh, alcohol to clean the pipettes because the more alcohol you use, the protein will get stuck into this, uh, uh, to the pipette and it is not possible to clean it, this, uh, decontaminate the pipette with this. So only thing you need to use here is, is just uh, clean the pipette with uh, the entire lower part Detergent. Am I uh, audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 So with this, uh, we can uh, stop our uh, presentation, uh, Aditya. So yeah. as Aditya uh, explained to all of you, uh, uh, just uh, you make sure every time whenever you are start using the, you come to the last slide, uh, Aditya. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm on RSI. No, you come to the last slide. We will finish the presentation. Better, no, it's lunchtime for them. 
better uh, no uh, no need to hold them for very long time we come to the last uh, feedback uh, slide Yes, I can. My, oh, ah, yeah. So, uh, since the lack of time, uh, I'm not uh, gone through this uh, presentation in detail. Uh, any of you interested? Uh, please uh, contact us. We can do it in your uh, institute also. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you can use this link uh, for give your feedback, and you can win the uh, append of pen. Uh, as a souvenir from Append of uh, India, so uh, please, uh, uh, you know, feel, give your uh, feedback also. I I paste uh, this link in the chat box also. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much sir, for the session. Yeah. Quite, and I'm sure it will benefit everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, we now break for lunch and uh, we can all uh, assemble back at 2 p.m. where we'll have the uh, where we have Dr. Akash Gulyani. Uh, see you all. Later.
good afternoon everyone uh, sorry we were running 15 minutes late um, so we start now the second session and that theme is optical sensors in cell imaging so we um, have our first speaker of the second session uh, who will be presenting now is Dr. Akash Gulyani. He received his PhD in chemical sciences from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and postdoctoral training at the Scripps Research Institute, San Diego, the Department of Pharmacology, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, US. Akash's work is highly interdisciplinary, and he has established a unique program on natural and engineered biosensors spanning multiple facets of life sciences, chemistry, imaging, and bioengineering. The Guliani Lab has pioneered several new bi biosensors for cellular dynamics. His group has also made major new discoveries in the area of natural light sensing, establishing completely new lines of inquiries using simple flatworm models as organisms. So it was covered by major international publications like NY Times, The Atlantic, and New Scientist. A recent work won the 2018 Cell Press TNQ Award for the best paper in life sciences in India. He's an inventor or multi multiple patents, including one of new diagnostics. He has also been awarded the American Heart Fellowship and an award for excellence in mentorship by the University of North Carolina, US. He has received multiple national and international grants. He has recently moved from INSTEM Bangalore to University of Hyderabad, recognized as Institute of Eminence by Government of India. And with that, I would uh, request Dr. Akash to uh, start his presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And uh, can you please kindly keep your uh, camera on too? Mute. We just ask him for unmute. We've given the permission. He just has to unmute himself. I think you have to mute once. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah. He's unmute once. Yeah. yeah, I have done that actually multiple times. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, uh, can you also see me? Hi, I'm Akash. Yes. Thanks Hello. for the kind introduction. Um, and it's a great pleasure to uh, be here. Uh, I know this is online. And uh, and uh, I have visited Nimans a few times for some committee meetings. But it's great pleasure to be invited here. And thanks a lot for uh, having me. And uh, I hope uh, I can visit in person very soon and then uh, we can interact more. So it's a great idea to have this conference and thanks a lot for uh, having me. Okay, um, so I'll just try it. I'll just share my screen again. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, so uh, basically, uh, you know, all of you, uh, I'll, I'll just give, start with a very brief introduction on what we do. So all of you have heard wonderful talks today where people are trying to make either new therapies or trying to come up with new methods or trying to come up with new ways in which uh, you can uh, study biology. But, uh, but one thing that you would notice is that whether you are doing fundamental work or whether you're doing translational work, uh, the idea is that you need to make new measurements, right? Because if you have to understand, uh, if you have to understand biology, you need to ask a question or you need to have a goal and then you need to get somewhere, right? Like either in your in terms of understanding or as we saw with many people with uh, talks from the industry, that they have a certain goal that where they have to say achieve a certain cell type or a product or, or some kind of a therapy. But in all of them, all of them have deployed Alas, people have shown you data where they have shown you all kinds of methods, right? All kinds of methods which they have used to um, for their uh, purpose. Now, if you if you step back and ask, okay, these are established methods, like even something like fluorescence assisted cell sorting or imaging or whatever you may call it. But then at some point, 
these methods were just physical principles and then someone converted those physical principles into a method right so all of this so even if you take the example of just uh, finding the molecular molecular weight of a macromolecule and running a gel that is something we do so routinely right in our labs but then at some point there was no gel electrophoresis as a method someone took a very phys a simple physical property of movement of a macromolecule through a gelatinous medium which has all these obstacles and converted into a method such that now you can actually relate molecular weight which is such a fundamental property in all science to a readout or a measurement so if i if i want to describe myself in just one word or our my group in one word that is that we develop new measurements and we try to expand the repertoire of like ways in which you can probe and understand biology and that's where we come from um, using all kinds of methods approaches from chemistry physics and of course uh, with great fascination in biology so that's what we do and uh, hopefully you will get a flavor for the kinds of things that we do so um, uh, just uh, because this is a talk on imaging and of course uh, stem cells as well one little slide uh, might be useful here because for imaging uh, for optical imaging of course you need light right so you are always sensing with light you are using light for sensing and uh, you can use uh, light in different ways you can use fluorescence you can use other kinds of methods and that's the basic right Inter basic idea is that how does matter interact with light and uh, we use that for sensing but at the same time what we do is we use light to not only use established uh, techniques but develop new ways in which we can probe biology the other part of the lab which is also actually inspired from nature from biology is that we got in, through a series of happy accidents which hopefully uh, we can discuss one day that i got we got interested in sensing light that how does how how is how in nature light light is sensed and how we can actually use light sensing for really cool technology so that's that's in a sense like the details of what we do and uh, this is the flavor i'll try to uh, leave with you okay so it's all about light but um, we uh, we just use that in different ways or including uh, the sensing of light itself the uh, of course uh, we are not in you can't see me i mean well you can uh, i'm not there in person and the reason why is that we are dealing with this pandemic which i don't have to talk to you about so just wanted to tell you that very recently i mean uh, all our uh, our worlds have been turned uh, upside down but uh, what we did was a little contribution with um, uh, inspired by this uh, long standing con contribution uh, collaboration with dr arti ramesh's lab in ncbs where we have uh, so we have been very interested in biosensors and she is a fantastic rna person so we thought uh, with great great depth of knowledge in rna structure so we thought can we convert that knowledge for some use and we could develop a really nice simple diagnostics for uh, for detecting uh, viral rna and it actually works it's a very cool biosensor design the sensor design had been around but we adapted it for covid and other kinds of viruses it can also be used for where uh, you know th this is a sensor where which keeps uh, protein translation in control and then only when it sees a certain rna in this case the viral rna it uh, turns on and then you start getting color so it's a very simple idea but um, hard to implement and it was fantastic that we could do it in a few months and um, and you know this led to like a provisional patent and a paper which is now out there in review and the idea is that you can just detect up to just 100 colors 100 copies of rna and you can really visualize it with just color where uh, you know if you have um, 100 copies you get nice bright red color which you can even take you see by naked eye or just take a cell phone photo and this works great right so it is all, also adapted for different kinds of luminescence all kinds of different platforms so uh, just wanted to share this with you like a little new direction that we have taken um, forced in some sense by covid but Uh, hopefully this will be a nice uh, we can marry uh, rna sensors and the other kinds of biosensors that we work with for a more comprehensive um, you know approach towards biology and this requires no sophisticated equipment no pcr i mean no uh, no uh, sophisticated equipment no need for uh, say in rt pcr you need to analyze the data and it's not that trivial and you need of course very expensive equipment here you don't need any of that so it's really easy to do 
but the heart of it is the really cool sensor that uh, comes out of uh, Dr. Ramesh's uh, knowledge of RNA uh, biology and our work on biosensors. Okay, so I'll just change gears. And since this is a conference on imaging, I'll just tell you how, uh, just share with you a few of our approaches on, um, on uh, bioimaging and how we have developed new ways to address cellular dynamics. So the reason I show, like to show some movie like this is that if you understand, this is, uh, cells are extremely dynamic, right? You need to, they are adapting all the time to uh, stimuli all, whether it's external or internal, and they are rapidly, uh, you know, um, changing. And if you look at it, it's such a multi-scale problem because there may be some things happening at the very tip of this, uh, of this cell, which may be at the nanoscopic level, where there may be a receptor binding to, a, uh, say, a chemo ligand. In this case, this is chemotaxis. But, but, you know, the whole cell has to rapidly change within a few seconds. So now you, you can imagine, this is like, I, I do something, I drink a cup of coffee here in Bangalore, and something happens in Delhi very rapidly. So that's the kind of scale we're talking about, or even further away in China or whatever, right? So you can really now imagine that cells are extremely dynamic, and space and time become very critical to understand uh, how... One can start thinking about cells, tissues, the brain, so on and so forth. And I don't have to tell you about the brain, of course, this being the means. So the GFP revolution, of course, made it possible. If you think about life before GFP and after GFP, there was the whole explosion of color, right? Every single picture, every single paper or a poster had like a lot of color. And that made it possible for you to tag proteins of interest and follow them around. But then just because I tag you, I know that you are sitting in your room or your uh, coffee chair, I mean, your lounge or, or your like institute and uh, possibly looking at me. But I don't know what your activity is, right? Somebody may be falling asleep. Somebody may be like checking their cell phone, which is completely fine. But the point here is that just because I know where you are, I don't know what you are doing, right? I know that you are located in a room somewhere, but I have no idea about what you are actually doing. So what we do is to visualize, um, and this is a long-standing interest, is to visualize how uh, and when proteins get turned down, how is it that signaling fluxes and dynamics are controlled in real time and space? And by space, I mean both the intracellular space as well as difference between one cell to another or in a tissue, or in fact, if you look at the brain, then you'll have all this uh, multi-scale again problem happening both at the stage of, a, say, a synapse all the way uh, to the whole cell versus, uh, you know, a whole uh, series of cells. So, but all of them is uh, driven by signaling activities, right, to a large extent. And those are the things, uh, those are the activities which are rapidly changing over space and time. So we develop biosensors. We, what we do is we develop biosensors such that we can visualize the active form of a molecule. So I'll just give you one story where we took an uh, approach which is slightly offbeat. Uh, where we thought that can we, um, can we now directly visualize the active conformation of a protein in living cells and tissues. And the idea is that when the protein is turned off, there won't be any signal, but when the protein is on, there will be a fluorescent signal. And we can visualize directly the active conformation <coughs> of this protein. And the one thing is that we need to recognize this active form. And the second thing is, that we need to have a fluorescent signature which should change when this active form is recognized. So the story, the two, one story is published uh, uh, in eLife last year and another story is in, uh, in works. And this is fantastic work done by a student and a postdoc who pioneered completely new kinds of biosensors in our lab. Okay, so the idea was that, uh, why do you need biosensors really, right? Like, because you can always uh, do a Western blot or whatever. But, uh, you know, the idea is that if you have a single protein, often it will do completely opposite functions. And we chose particularly the kinds of proteins which do that. So we chose these uh, uh, proteins called the SARC kinases, and we focused on a kinase called FIN, which is actually uh, one of the most critical proteins in the brain in terms of kinases, which controls a lot of uh, switching in the brain, whether it's in oligodendrocytes or neurons, in neural differentiation, in plasticity, Alzheimer's. So it's a really important protein in the brain, for example. But this was buried because there was no information on what FIN actually does. And when I say actually does, because sometimes FIN can cause, say, for example, cancer, sometimes it can cause cell death. So it is, uh, it is capable of doing completely opposing things. Also, 
these kinases are very similar <clears throat> as you will see that many times it's hard to distinguish which kinase is doing what because they are so similar but their activities can have a very profound effect so it's very hard to really know what's happening if you just look at a static picture right and it's only when you dig deeper and you try to figure out what is happening with this kinase you can try to even understand how can it cause growth in one situation or cell death in another situation sometimes the same protein for example can cause synaptic um, uh, it can uh, enhance synaptic plasticity but also cause loss of synapses and this happens with fin which is a critical target in alzheimers so um, that's the question so you really need to understand space and time right and so far um, we, uh, work from nobel laureate roger chen's lab and others had taken this kind of biosensor approach where the kinase uh, would uh, phosphorylate a substrate and then once the substrate gets phosphorylated there would be some uh, fluorescence change in this case fret um, by uh, by just visualizing this you can know whether the kinase was active but there's a huge problem here right like i just said they're very similar kinases they do completely opposing things sometimes so if you use a sensor like this you'll get an on signal but you don't know which kinase was actually doing this right you have no idea which kinase was active and which kinase correlates with a certain kind of function versus another kind of function right so this was a huge drawback in the whole field so we took a slightly different approach like i said we will visualize directly the active form of the kinase and in this case we developed a biosensor which doesn't bind to the off state but only binds to the on state in this case it's actually very uh, it's like an open conformation of the kinase and we developed a biosensor that binds here in this region which is much more exposed in the active form compared to the inactive form and that is a difference you can see here right in in the active form this region is very exposed so we can recognize it and that way we can directly recognize the active form of the kinase in living cells so that's what we did and we developed a very interesting uh, uh, binder approach where we could engineer proteins through high throughput screening and this paper is published but there are other uh, similar approaches also which are beginning to come not for sensing but for therapeutics and the idea is that you develop protein uh, uh, proteins which can bind specifically to say fin but not the other kind right and uh, the other thing this will do is we have designed it in such a way that it binds only to the active form the other um, thing is that just binding is not enough right you need a readout so if you need a readout what we did was and this was wonderful work done by a postdoc in the lab randeep singh who managed to engineer these kinases in such a way that he now knows now knows exactly where to insert fluorophores into the kinases either without perturbing them or if he wants to perturb them he can perturb them right so it's like a really powerful approach and he has done that and uh, so once you have a fluorophore here for example when there is no uh, when the kinase is inactive is just is just going to sit around but only when the kinase is active our binder will go and bind here and you will get a fluorescence resonance energy transfer read out right so it's very powerful and you can uh, do this and you under we understand this uh, through a collaboration with dr ranbir das in ncbs who uh, where we can understand this molecular recognition to a single residue for example if you make a single point mutation like say here or or somewhere where this hinge of this uh, particular uh, this whole region is hinged at a certain proline we can now destroy binding right so you can uh, make a, a very nice control so that you know that your signal is at, uh, real and this is just showing that there is thread for people who know about the biophysics that this is nice thread you can visualize in cellular assays and this is data from cells where you can make a single point mutation and abolish fret right so you see it's very neat and powerful you can also do other kinds of experiments you can uh, inhibit the protein activity and lose fret and uh, so it's it's very sensitive to activity but the gold standard experiment is that you would say oh this kinase is a little engineered right what if it's artificial and not really working like the real kinase so what we do it was and this is very rare in the biosensing field is that we develop cell lines which were uh, knocked down or even now knock out cell lines and we could rescue activity with our engineered kinases so these these kinases are not only engineered to produce biosensing but they can functionally completely rescue this kinase and um, uh, recover downstream activity when when you put them back in a knock down or knock out back right so they are not the tags are not perturbed so something that we noticed uh, 
straight away was very striking was that when we look at the activity of um, this kinase, right, in, in real time, we notice that as soon as the cells at, attach, you can look at, uh, we have looked at a lot of different types of cells, including neural cells, and as soon as the cells attach, very soon, you have a symmetry breaking. So the cells would look like they are not going anywhere, they're just spreading evenly in all directions, and I'll show you that data. But there'll be regions, there'll be hotspots of high activity which will develop spontaneously. And this would happen within minutes. This was very surprising because there's no stimuli. In fact, these are serum star cells. It took some effort to get to a situation where you can get them really healthy and imaging. But Ananya found this uh, wonderful result where you start getting symmetry breaking right off the bat very quickly when there's no stimuli. There's no directional stimuli at all. And if you look at the protein localization, if you were just tagging your protein with GSP, you would notice that it is more or less equal everywhere, but um, the activity is much more polarized and very specific here, right? So this was uh, very striking. And this got us thinking because maybe then we thought that this is reporting integrin activation and integrins are cell surface uh, receptors. And the moment you get activation through integrins, attachment, as long as enough signaling complexes build up, maybe this signal uh, gets activated. So we thought then it should be sensitive to say a na uh, neighboring proteins, right? Like uh, proteins that are very important in this cascade, like focal adhesion kinase. And lo and behold, indeed, the moment you now treat cells with a FAC inhibitor, which is a different inhibitor, uh, not this protein, but uh, our kinase, which, uh, so if we, we are treating now cells with a different kinase inhibitor, and we can see now read out instantaneously in uh, the activity of uh, fin kinase, right? So inhibiting FAC and you re see read out of fin and it goes away, right? So it's really, really fast. So um, this is important because we thought that if we can now have a way of studying this signaling uh, paradigm, then we can really explore this further because integrins are known, but what is also known is that this fin acts like a very interesting uh, switch, like a nodal switch, right? So you have, what is a node? What does a node do? So I'm sitting in the middle, I get activity from here, I get activity from here, I need to process this information and then, uh, you know, uh, then uh, take a decision and go forward. So that's what, that's what these kinases are known to do. So we noticed another very fascinating thing, and this is something that ha actually happens in the brain and was reported about 15, 20 years ago, except that there was no uh, appreciation of uh, how this could be happening. So, um, so you see that we had a region which was already sort of pre-activated. And when we stimulated cells with growth factor, now the growth factor is everywhere. The growth factor receptor is everywhere. So all the old data would have suggested, all the old ki other kinds of sensors or imaging approaches would have suggested that the whole cell will light up. And there is some marginal activity in other places also. But although the receptor is everywhere, the growth factor is everywhere, the activity is localized here. And this was the region which was already pre-activated. So what we found was that integrins activate the kinase in certain regions, very, very interestingly, in a symmetry-breaking manner. Some, uh, some regions get spontaneously activated, and we don't fully understand why, but we know it is integrin-dependent. And then once some regions are activated, then that region becomes primed. And once that region is primed, any stimuli that you give further that is the sensitive region which responds to further stimulation. And this is what we see over and over again in all different kinds of cell types, myoblasts, fibroblasts. We see that in epithelial-like cells. Even now we see some spatial, uh, this one in uh, like neural progenitor cells, right? So this is, this is really cool. So you have a, a first, some spontaneous active, active zones created through integrin signaling. And then moment any other stimulation like a growth factor comes, that is the reason that is uh, that is the region that is further stimulated, right? So that was really nice. And the other thing we noticed was, as you will see, that this was uh, highly uh, ossetile. This activity was highly ossetile. It was not uh, uh, pulsatile. Uh, you had all these uh, oscillations. And then even if you look at different kinds of cells, when these oscillations kick in, maybe different, but you have all these cells showing very clear oscillations and pulsatile behavior. So what that was clear was that the activity is not constant, but it oscillates up and down and it is spatially organized, right? And the time period, interestingly, happens to be always in this uh, 120 second, 150 second region. 
which actually times very well with the actomyosin pulsing so there is a, now we believe that this uh, fin is able to do this right like it's able to integrate different signals and just modulate the actomyosin skeleton and then further downstream say transcription activity which will be much slower but this is something which is very tightly controlled in uh, time and this pulsatile signaling is very important because sometimes whether the signal is pulsatile versus constant you can have very different <clears throat> outputs for in terms of the cell fate and that's what we are finding through our biosensors okay the other cool thing is something that happens in the brain that's why i'm spending a one minute extra over here is to tell you that first interferon set up this uh, cluster this spatial cluster and growth factors can modulate it so i don't know if you can see me my hands well what happens is that if you if you look at the brain if you look at oligodendrocyte maturation you have a region in the brain you would know this better but you would you would have a region in the brain which is now where which is where now um, the oligodendrocyte mature and are very where the myelination of neurons start right and once that process starts say in a particular location then um, the cells the oligodendrocyte precursors uh, actually have to survive in very low growth factor condition so most precursor cells will die only some cells which will attach themselves to the neurons will kick in their integrin signaling and that integrin signaling then becomes like an and gate right like one part of the and gate so you have very low growth factor that is not sufficient for survival but once you have integrin signaling that gives the additional cue and then you get this and effect you get this additive effect and only at that point of uh, attachment you get this uh, cell survive and then they secrete uh, myelin and many years back what was shown was that um, that kicking in that survival and then kicking in that program is controlled by one signaling node and that was biochemically show, speculated to be fin and with some really nice data from charles fred constance lab but there was no idea of how this spatial coupling may be happening and the fact that we can now recapitulate it in any cell this spatial coupling suggests that fin has this intrinsic property to act like a signaling node and couple these different uh, uh, stimuli so you have this uh, two arms of the pathway and you are uh, having fin as a node which can then show uh, activity right and if you now of course inhibit this what happens like one arm of the pathway and this was very stunning because if you now inhibit the integrin arm of the pathway through say focal adhesion kinase then the cells become insensitive to growth factor and that's exactly what happens in the brain right if you don't have integrins uh, that little growth factor is not sufficient the cells will die but only when you have integrin signaling on the cells will survive and kicking their program for myelination and then there are these all these interesting uh, crosstalks also happening which we are now exploring because this is uh, it's all uh, fin plays a multifunctional role here right so the other uh, thing is also very cool in, in our cell system we can recapitulate this and gate for example if you now dial up so in one case we inhibited integrin signaling right what if we dial up integrin signaling too much by having uh, increasing the dose of the extracellular receptors and then you see the cell is stuck it's stuck it is activated everywhere and they again become um fin is activated everywhere and cells become insensitive to the growth factor so this is really cool that you can now recapitulate the entire and gate which is critical in the brain in in say a dish and then you can of course study it in a real tissue now and we have got an interest from several labs all over the world to collaborate to uh, study this in the brain or in brain tissues and we are happy to share these uh, biosensors uh, with anyone uh, you can of course look at other kinds of uh, oscillations and dynamics where you can mature adhesions which are very critical in cancer for example in a lot of uh, in brain cancers as well right so uh, this is nice because we can now study one node in detail and then uh, really understand what's happening but uh, you would say that i would be interested in five kinases say mad kinase uh, sark kinase something else and i want to visualize all this cross talk happening in real time how can we do that so we uh, bozak in the lab randeep came up with this really clever idea which is the first of its kind and we hope that uh, you know this will be a very exciting going forward he came up with a, a reporter uh, like a gsp like molecule but except that that is quenched and it's attached to the biosensor now when this is free free and floating around gsp fluorescence is not there the moment you now bind the target you get recovery of gsp fluorescence and the cell will light so you need just a single color you don't need to do fret 
and most importantly you don't need to engineer your target so with crispr or whatever or any mind of method you can just put in your biosensor with a reporter it's going to recognize the target and give you a color you can also um, do other kinds of interesting things here which i will not talk about today but the idea is that with the single color you can visualize activity and we have been able to do that for example if you have no kinase or low activity and the moment you now introduce show it to show the sensor to the kinase you have a high amount of fluorescence and you can really visualize this in real time you can now remove the target and you see the fluorescence is completely gone and there's literally no sensor like that in 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 the literature where which now directly recognize the confirmation and is able to have an on off response right so this is very exciting and uh, we want to pursue in different ways of course you can study uh, uh, growth factor integrin dynamics but you can also ask some very interesting questions which have not been asked before for example if you take this uh, <clears throat> excuse me neuro 2a cells which are a very simple model of differentiation now uh, the a fundamental question in uh, differentiation is that if you now take a stem cell and it's going towards say a differentiated state would you now get uh, say activity all the time say if you now have a control system would it be always active or only would it be active only at the time of decision making but at the time of decision making you would get a burst of activity and that is sufficient and then you want the control system to turn off because persistent activity would need to a feedback right so we thought we can ask that kind of question because we have a tool like this which is not available earlier right a single color we can just see when does gsp become green which is an easy assay to perform right so we took this and we took two different conditions for example if you just look at the beginning of differentiation for this uh, neuro 2a cells in the beginning they just look like neuro epithelial cells and whether you begin differentiation or uh, let them just grow normally undifferentiated we have they have no green color but much before differentiation kicks in which kicks in at say 48 hours 72 hours at 24 hours there is a decision making point you get this burst of fin activity but there is no activity at that point and these cells are running in parallel the imaging is running in parallel at 24 hours there is no activity in the undifferentiated cells but the cells which are destined so they are not differentiated yet but they are destined to be differentiated so now at the decision making point or maybe around that you get this nice burst of activity and you can really visualize that because we have now a tool like this and this is a kinase activity which is now telling you at that stage and later the activity disappears or sometimes these cells through an adhesion cue also start showing differentiation so they may look undifferentiated to you but we can now pick out from these biosensors that the signaling has actually changed even though you think that they were undifferentiated right so now biosensors can can give you a picture into what is happening into the cells which you would only find out like that uh, like a week later so for example if you are in an industry or you are in a clinical setup or in a place like nimans and you have the cell culture and you want a quick read out that is my cell already committed or it's not committed then these are the kinds of probes and systems we can propose to do this right the of course signaling is one thing but we also started getting in energetics and for this we not only use genetically encoded biosensors which i have shown to you but we also use small molecules okay and use the power of chemistry to understand this well so now um, and our interest comes from uh, our say, a lot of work in chemistry in the past uh, looking at membrane domains and so on and so forth so one uh, classical textbook problem i will share with you and i'll tell you how we have approached this so a classical textbook problem is that if you look at uh, the activity of say a mitochondria then mitochondrial activity is generally controlled in such a way that if you have this ox oxfos and you have the electron transport chain running then um, a critical part of this is to build up this um, photomotive force which is to build up this gradient of uh, h plus ions you build up this membrane potential and the moment you have a gradient of these h plus ions you have now the movement of these um, ions through the atp synthase and you get atp so one problem was that if you want to now visualize mitochondrial activity so people thought that one easy way would be to directly image membrane potential right and you have to do this real time in a cell and you don't want to lyse the cell you don't want to lyse the tissue so the idea is that you 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 actually use membrane potential as a proxy for mitochondrial activity right that is all current methods for imaging use this method okay but there is one critical problem that can happen 
in many situations in biology, including in stress, including in many diseases, this uh, building of potential is uncoupled to ATP synthesis, synthesis, right? In fact, they're natural uncouplers that you can use, natural and artificial. So then if you, if you have this uncoupled, suppose you have now this burst of potential, you don't know whether it's true activity or it's actually just a burst of potential. Right? And the other thing is that when you have reactive oxygen damage uh, or if you have uh, apoptosis, then you do get these bursts of activity which are not linked to mitochondrial activity per se. They are just like a response in the ATC chain in response to stress and damage. So we thought, can we look at alternate ways in which we can image what is happening at the mitochondria, right? So that's the problem. And um, so here, we got a little lucky because we made an observation that we may develop certain new dyes in our lab because we also sometimes dabble in organic chemistry. And uh, <clears throat> we noticed that while if you now try to do fast imaging or long-term imaging, you notice that if you take a commercial dye like TMRE, often it causes depolarization of the mitochondria and you also have the lie from the mitochondria, right? And you, if you do this very fast, you will see that. But even at a higher laser power, our dye was not doing this, right? It was really nice and you could actually image this for a very long time. For example, you could do a wound healing assay or you can look at neurons or you can look at stem cells. We have uh, an Indo-Danish grant with a consortium for Alzheimer's where um, you can now really image this in real time and do this for a long period of time. And this was, for example, a movie uh, made over 14, 16 hours and you can really visualize the mitochondrial network over wound healing. And the good thing here, it doesn't bleach, it doesn't uh, cause photo damage and depolarization of the mitochondria. So we thought, oh, that means that the dye is actually interacting differently with the membrane. Can we understand this better uh, or not? So one uh, practical use was that we used it for different cellular models and for disease models. And we were just granted a US patent very just a few months back for these dyes, right? So that was very exciting, but we thought we want to understand the biology a little better. So what are these dyes? These dyes are molecular rotors and they work in a certain way where, you know, they, they, they have this uh, bond rotation. And the moment you have a lot of bond rotation, their fluorescence is very low and their fluorescence lifetime, which is the amount of time they spend in the excited state is very low. The moment you now rigidify the local environment, you will have now a situation where they don't rotate and the fluorescence lifetime increases and fluorescence intensity increases. But if you use intensity, you don't know whether it's true change in the dynamics or is it just because more dye is there in that particular spot. But in, in lifetime, you can now, um, you know, really relate it to the local nanoscopic order which the dye is experiencing. And that's what we did. And we can link it to fluorescence lifetime. So this is the killer experiment. What does it mean in terms of biology? So uh, we could show, <clears throat> and this is the first time anyone has able, is able to link a mitochondrial activity to a nanoscopic change at the mit mitochondrial membrane. So for example, if you look at an inactive isolated mitochondria and you activate it, you will see that the membrane potential may rise, right? That happens. But what happens? Is it just because there is more dye here or there is actually change in this region versus this region, for example, right? Is it really that all these super complexes have caused con condensation of the biomembrane, for example? So that you will not know from an intensity picture. But if you look at fluorescence lifetime with our rotor dye, then you will see that the nanoscopic order has actually changed. So not only will you get activity in terms of membrane potential, which is great, but you can also see that there's an active remodeling of the membrane. So you can truly say that the mitochondria is now active. And we could show it in cells and tissues as well. And we can show that as the mitochondrial activity goes up, you see a clear change in the local order. So this is the first link of this kind, which was possible through two photon flame imaging that this postdoc did, Gaurav, who, uh, who, who's done a really exciting, remarkable job. And we could also show that mitochondria are very heterogeneous. The network is very heterogeneous. You have different regions which are different from one, even in a single my, mitochondria, you have regions which are much more active versus the others, right? And within a, uh, like say a field, you will have different cells at different state of mitochondrial activity. So one can really visualize the state of the mitochondria with such uh, precise details, right? 
and uh, you can change the like say stimulate cells and you see a gross change you can now inhibit uh, etc and you see like now the active the local order collapses so the local order actually scales with the activity and this is remarkable and if you look at a neuron we found some very stunning examples where there's so much heterogeneity and this is true heterogeneity right because you are now na getting information on nanoscopic order through this flim fluorescence lifetime and you can um, you know really visualize how this is heterogeneous how different parts of the neuron for example the axon may have a very different kind of mitochondria than the synapse right so that is something that we are very interested in exploring and if you were just to do the intensity image you would not get the information but only when you do this uh, flim image with a multi photon microscope you can really get very stark precise information about the mitochondria right and you can combine this with the whole range of chemistry and we can even combine it with machine learning where we can automate in an automated manner predict whether a cell is stressed damaged so on and so forth and we got some very interesting results with these alzheimer models Uh, which we want to pursue so if someone is interested please get in touch one can also do super resolution so you can do uh, the nanoscopic structure plus activity both in real time and you will see that if you just do a did a confocal the mitochondria would look like this but now with our dyes we can actually visualize with a stead microscope or super resolution technique all these crystal like organization and imagine the our next step is the holy grail that not only can you see this crystal through super resolution but each crystal we will know which one is more ordered which one is more active and we can report that in real time right so that's what we are very interested in especially using neuron models we are very interested in if the people are interested please get in touch so i will stop here because i think i'm running out of time maybe i have 2 minutes so i will just tell you that we not only look at we not only engineer but we get a lot of inspiration from nature and this has been truly really fantastic and because nemans is interested in the brain i'll tell you a story about a very simple brain or or just allude to you a story about a very simple brain so if you look at your classical textbook of uh, neurobiology you'll uh, hear you'll see that how do uh, animals how do we sense color so for example the model is that for sensing color which is light right a wavelength of light then you sense wavelengths or color by having specific receptors for different wavelengths of light right that's what we do so we have a receptor for this color a receptor for this color receptor and we put this all information together and we see color right through our eyes and then processing through the brain but if you look at a say a very simple eye which darwin talked about a lot of people have talked about that this transition was through, through a very simple eye right and then if you look at that then you see that this simple eye is uh, able to uh, uh, do a lot of things but the idea was that they were completely color blind organisms which have these simple eyes with just one photoreceptor and just some direction sensing were completely color blind so uh, these planarians which are wonderful bag of stem cells this is a meeting on stem cells too and wonderful regeneration potential are studied for regeneration but no one really looked at how they respond to light or different kind of stimulus right so that was completely un <coughs> and we just uh, noticed something very remarkable that not only do they have this very simple eyes which are at the cusp in this transition from a single cell bacteria to our say the mammalian eye but they have this amazing ability so for example if you take this worm which is which was thought to be completely color blind because it has just one photoreceptor right so it should not be able to see color but when we challenge this worm with different colors of light they these worms are able to Uh, separate different colors and are able to uh, they are able to now do some very intricate processing with just a single photoreceptor and they are able to do this processing by just visualizing the absorption of light so the worms are able to sense absorption and they are like little uh, their brains are little computers right so they are like photon counters plus computers so they look at the number of photons which are incident and they are able to visualize and process this and we were able to do it just because we thought of it from a chemistry approach thinking that how would you take a information from a molecule all the way to the brain and we were able to come up with this beautiful model which we could show in this paper where we could show that although there is only one receptor the worms are able to separate different colors or separate in coats by just distinguish them at that time by just taking the, the absorption of light how much light is absorbed and normally this information is lost in a neuron but these worms have this amazing ability to compute these differences in light intensities 
So you can show that over regeneration, do all kinds of cool experiments. I'll stop here. But to say that this is a great model for regeneration as well, functional eye regeneration. And you can look at a lot of uh, interesting human disease molecules by looking at how these eyes change over time, how they pattern, and you can link it to functional regeneration. Right? And uh, I will just uh, say that hopefully the next time, I will also tell you a story that where we have discovered how these worms are not only able to do these amazing things through their eyes, but even headless worms are able to respond to light and move. So imagine you had no head, the worm should be dead, right? Waiting to regenerate, so-called dead. But when we uh, uh, have light on them, they actually respond dramatically to light, only certain wavelengths of light, and they start moving like an intact worm. So imagine, this is the most fundamental problem in neurobiology, right? You have a diffuse neural network, there's no head, but the worm starts behaving as if it has a head and then starts moving uh, like a real intact worm just by light stimulation. And I will not <clears throat> tell you any more details. Hopefully I'll share this with you next time. But we just heard that this paper where we have solved uh, this problem to some degree where we could discover a whole new non-neuronal uh, photoreceptor system which is linked to neurons. So it's like a non-neuronal sensing system probably one of the most ancient sensory uh, systems known. And we just heard uh, informally, I can tell you that uh, this paper has been accepted in PNS and it will come and hopefully I'll share this story with you going forward. Okay, so I'll just stop here and then just uh, say that we can use these photoreceptors for lots of interesting optogenetics, the ones that we have discovered. They were not known before that we did all this work in planarians. And um, this was all possible through this wonderful collaboration and of course uh, great students and I'll, I know I'm running out of time so I'll uh, uh, stop and take questions. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? I cannot hear you, ma'am. I cannot hear you. I don't think I can hear you. I don't know if it's others. Can you, can you others hear me? Am I audible? You're audible, Dr. Akash. Yeah. But I cannot hear Dr. Indrani. We cannot hear you. hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I repeat it again. I'm so happy that I uh, called you because you took us from to your amazing, amazing talk from pre-GFP era to post-GFP era. And not only that, we even got to know that there are non-neuronal uh, photoreceptive yes. centers. Yes. And that's amazing with respect yeah. to evolution. And with such simple experiments and with such simple questions, you have uh, this immense amount of, uh, it is such an enriching experience. And before I take a few questions, I have a few questions of my own too. So uh, how do we understand, because we work on uh, kinases a lot because my uh, team works with Parkinson's disease and uh, kinases uh, being the four and foremost culprits been bringing about phosphorylation for alpha synuclein. So if we have multiple kinases in a uh, system, in a cell type, and how do we understand through optical sensors that which kinase in a particular genetic disorder is bring, or in a sporadic case, is bringing about uh, the phosphorylation? 
can it be done using optical sensors? Yeah, that question is like, so you're asking like, suppose you have a, uh, like you, are, you don't know which kinase is getting activated. So it's if you know information, then probably a more chemical genetic approach where people have, um, uh, have uh, you know, made these interesting engineered substrates or whatever, where you try to see which, uh, uh, like a more chemical biology approach would be better. But once you identify, let's say you have a couple of kinases that you are interested in, yes. and you see that, uh, like these guys are like the players. Players are known. It's like, you know, we know who the players are, but we want okay. to understand how they work. Then these biosensors become more valuable. But I think what your question is very nice because if one can combine the two approaches, then that will be very powerful. And maybe that is something that we can talk about or discuss and then probably, uh, you know, with the biological question in mind, then that would be very exciting. So it's a great question. So I think uh, the next step would be to combine biosensors with some kind of a screening approach where you know now which kinase is likely to be activated. So this our uh, GFP turn on off approach may be useful. So we may have to engineer something, but at least one can do it for a class of kinases. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's what in sporadic, uh, they, there are four or five of the kinases which are being identified. Sure. But uh, definitely we work on the familial LARC2 kinase too. So for the LARC2, I'm sure we would be able to go with the specific, that particular kinase. Yeah, yeah. that would be fantastic. Yes, and um, we would like to take a few more questions. If um, yeah, that's let's fine. check the chat box over here. Uh, so, um, uh, so in neurons, could the region uh, which specializes into axon hillock uh, probably can be um, detected using biosensors? Is one yeah. of the questions. Yeah, so I think I, the, probably the question refers to the mitochondrial um, uh, work. So this is work done by a postdoc in the lab, uh, Gaurav, uh, who also recently got a fellowship to continue his work. So he is currently in Bangalore, actually. So because of some uh, personal reasons, he cannot move right now, which is great. So if someone wants to get in touch with him, he has this amazing data on, uh, on neurons. So we are actually looking to see which region uh, becomes like you know not well which regions become different and which is the reason uh, which is the regions in the neuron which would get tend to have the mitochondria much more active than the others and here we can not only look at the activity through membrane potential which is like I showed you it's a textbook problem that but it limits you for what it you can do but we can also look at this two photon flame imaging and he has some very interesting data so please uh, you know I encourage you to just write to him and you can get in touch and we can try these questions. In fact, if someone has a marker or like say maybe re, uh, regions in a neuron, which may start changing at a certain time. So we can do two color imaging, one for the marker, which would be a region specific marker and one which would tell you about activity. So I think that's exactly what we expect would happen. So again, a great question. And uh, this is something that we would be happy to uh, you know, interact with you guys. Yes. And uh, Again, uh, I'm sure using these uh, markers, uh, even the pathology with respect to, uh, say, a certain kind of protein aggregation and yes. its yes. Uh, effect yes. on the membrane fluidity, yes. those also can be ventured into. Yes. We, in fact, uh, the postdoc who initiated this project, uh, he worked a little bit with uh, Dr. Ravi Buddha Shetty's lab, uh, in, who was uh, in Instem till very recently. I think he's also moving within Bangalore. But uh, he uh, would be, uh, he got some very interesting data that um, where you, exactly as you said, that now suppose you now uh, treat cells. Uh, I don't remember the exact treatments right now, but there was a, so even if you express certain variants, then you, uh, you start seeing very quick changes in the cell. Although Alzheimer's is a very long-term disease, but you start seeing rapid changes very early on in the mitochondria. And they can be picked up with these uh, imaging techniques. So, Again, uh, that was the whole idea of this uh, consortium grant and we would be very keen on pursuing this with uh, you guys. Yes, we are keen in because we have our IPSC model and for uh, parallelly we do our uh, overexpression transfection studies with respect to bringing in uh, sporadic and familial kind of Parkinson's disease. Okay, and this just gives more opportunity to see in real time data, kind of okay. life salinity. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Akash. So uh, we, uh, 
I'm very sorry. First, I want to also apologize because we were running half the night of 20 minutes late. So uh, thank you for your patience and keeping it with us. And uh, Thank you for your invitation. And I really enjoyed it. And hopefully we meet each other in person. Yes. And, uh, Most welcome. Please Sorry if I kept the other speakers waiting because it was hard for me to know when I stop uh, when I started. So uh, uh, for the next speaker, um, sorry if I was sure. Sorry, I've informed already to the next okay. speaker. So uh, things are in place. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we will move on to the next speaker. He is uh, Dr. Punya Dipta Day. Uh, he has done his PhD from NII Delhi. Um, after a brief postdoc in evolutionary biology, uh, he joined Thermo Fisher Scientific in 2010 and has been working in the company as application scientist. Uh, so he's part of the South, South Asia technical support team handling the molecular biology portfolio and has doubled up as trainer run application scientist for Thermo Fisher for high content imaging system. So again, continuing to the theme of optical sensors, how they are integral part and they can be uh, such interesting tools to go ahead to answer basic, simple cellular functions and activities. Uh, we'll get to know it from him too. Uh, Dr. Dave, so you can start your presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Indrani. So am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, so uh, how much time do I have? You can uh, take 45 minutes. Yes, definitely. No problem. Okay, so I'm just trying to share my screen. Just one second. So I'm having some problem in sharing my screen. You can do one thing. Um, we will try to play your uh, PPT from here. Uh, earlier speakers have done it too, and you can present it from your end. We will open your presentation from here. Uh, okay, because uh, the presentation that I have now uh, is a is a uh, is a different presentation. Okay, then you can mail us again. No problem. We will open it again. You mailed me? Yeah, just yes. Is it that you're using an Apple computer by any chance? No, no, it's not. So, yep, I have just sent it to you.
asking which email ID is. Let's see. hasn't reached yet to us. Uh, okay. So let me try to send you via uh, Thermofitter Scientific Cloud. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, can you try once more uh, sharing the PPT? Yeah, I'll do that. That you're trying through Thermal Cloud, then it might not come. Oh, is it? Yes. Okay. Open your original PPT. Closed on that. Okay. So I have opened my original PPT now. Now you share the screen. Now you share the screen. Yeah, if this is taking time, you can start the recording that I have sent, if that is okay. Uh, did my screen just come up? Yes, yes, yeah, it came it's up. Came up. Correct. Okay, great, great. All right. So first of all, thank you all for inviting me to uh, this talk. And I'm going to talk about uh, fluorescence imaging, innovations from molecular probes. Molecular probes is now part of Thermo Fisher Scientific. So some of the reagents that I'm going to cover here are from the wider Thermo Fisher Scientific family. So my talk is organized in uh, three parts. Uh, Dr. Indrani told me that uh, this is uh, for students, so there, there should be some uh, coverage of the basics of fluorescence. So I'll start my talk about with uh, basics of fluorescence, like what is fluorescence, what are fluorescent dyes, some common terminologies associated with fluorescence, and how they can be uh, used in uh, everyday imaging. Can you please make it full screen? Uh, is it fine now? Yes. All right. Yeah, so first I'm going to talk about the uh, basics of fluorescence. Then I'm going to talk about 
Similarly, a fluorescent dye will get uh, will emit over a range of wavelengths, but it will have a specific emission maximum. So this means that if you are uh, imaging a fluorescent dye, the source of illumination must overlap with the excitation spectrum. So this brings uh, me to my next topic, which is light sources and filters in the microscope. Depending on which microscope you have in your lab, it, it will either have a um, LED or a laser or a mercury or a halogen lamp. So if it's a mercury or a halogen lamp, then it will uh, emit a mixture of light. So here in this uh, particular diagram, what you see here is a white light because it's a mercury lamp, so it's a mixture of light. Then your microscope will have a excitation filter, which will block all parts of light except the one overlapping with your excitation spectrum and let it pass through and fall on the specimen. The specimen, because it's dyed with a fluorescent dye, will fluoresce, and the light that comes out will pass through the emission filter. The emission filter will allow all parts of the light to pass through, except uh, it will allow only the light that overlaps with the emission spectrum to pass through. Now, this diagram below shows the dramatic effect of an emission filter. So you can see if there is no emission filter, background is so high, and if emission filter is there, then the cell is so clearly visible. Now, as an application scientist, I often get questions from students that I have so and so microscope in my lab. I want to use this new dye. Will it be compatible? So how do you answer such questions? The way I do it is that I use a freely available online tool in Thermo Fisher Scientific called SpectroViewer. All other major uh, suppliers of fluorescent dyes, they too have such tools which can be used to answer such questions. So very quickly, I'll show you how you can uh, use this tool. Okay. So, uh, so what you are seeing is a fluorescent spectra viewer. The first step is that you have to choose the fluorophore and uh, you can just choose the fluorophore. Let's say it's Alexa 488. You can see that the excitation and the emission spectra will come up. The best part is that it also shows the percentage of uh, the percentage absorption or excitation compared to the maxima. So you can uh, from this also infer that how much bright your images will be if the overlap is not complete. Next, you just select the light source. So let's say you have a lamp light source and let's say that you have a xenon lamp overlapping with it. So quickly you can check whether the source of illumination is overlapping with the excitation spectrum or not. Yes, it is overlapping. Then you go to the next step, which is we uh, put a excitation filter. So let's say I put a DAPI filter here. You see the DAPI filter, it is overlapping with the excitation spectrum. Next, you put the emission filter. So yeah, I'll put the FITC filter again. So here you see that the FITC filter completely overlaps with the emission filter. So this way you can very quickly find out whether uh, the dye is compatible with your microscope or not. In case you do not know uh, which filters are there in your microscope, you can always check the online manual of the microscope or you can contact the technical support of that microscope. Okay. So uh, this was the uh, basics of fluorescence that I wanted to cover. Now I come to the second part of my talk, which is imaging workflow. So from a bird's eye view, if you look at a typical imaging workflow, it has five steps, like preparation of the samples, labeling, detection, protection, and finally imaging. Now preparation of the sample is uh, you prepare the cells either for fixed sample imaging or live cell imaging. I'll come to it in a moment. In labeling, you add the fluorescent dye. If you are doing a fixed sample imaging, then you will be adding the primary antibodies here. Detection is uh, where you add the secondary antibodies, fluorophore conjugated secondary antibodies or the amplification occurs. Then there is protection. Here you add the mountain to increase the durability of the sample and also to protect it from photo bleaching. Last is imaging. 
So if I have, if I have some time, I'll talk about quantitative imaging here. Okay. So coming back, sample preparation. Now most of the imaging that are done, they are done on fixed fixed cell imaging. So that is, you add either an aldehyde-based compound or an alcohol-based compound to lock in the components of the cell so that they can be labeled later. This is beneficial because then the sample is available for later imaging, but the drawback is that you lose a lot of information because when you fix the cells, then some of the subcellular components got altered. So nowadays there is a lot of interest in doing live cell imaging. Like in the previous talk, you saw quite a few uh, videos of live cell imaging. Scientists are preferring this now because of the extra information they give. They give. And, but when you do live cell imaging, then there are some unique challenges with live cell imaging. First challenge is that, that media that we use, whether it is RPMI or DMEM, they have a lot of components which has autofluorescence. Now in the left-hand side, you see, uh, let me just move. So in the left-hand side, what you see is uh, cells which are stained with pH rhodo. And because of the medium, you can see there is so much of nonspecific staining. Molecular probes has one G agent called backdrop background subducer. If you add a drop of it, it will quench all the fluorescence present externally so that you get very specific fluorescence. Now, this particular reagent is fine if you want to do uh, imaging within um, two hours, but what if you want to do imaging for a longer time? So then there is a reagent called live cell imaging solution from molecular probes. In this slide, you can see the difference of using live cell imaging solution and a medium like TMM or RPMI, the hoaxed tetramethylrhodamine and calcine. In all cases, the signal is much better. So live cell imaging solution is a ringer-based solution, so you can keep it outside the incubator. And um, the composition is not proprietary. You can download it from our website, or if you just reach out to technical support, we'll provide it to you. Now, what if you want to image for a still longer time, say eight hours, 10 hours, overnight, for days? So then what you can do is that you can use a reagent called Pseudobright DMEM from molecular probes. So uh, this is a proprietary reagent, which was developed by identifying each component of DMEM that causes fluorescence, and then replacing it with something else which, uh, with decreased fluorescence. Now you can see the dramatic effect of DMEM and fluorobrite DMEM, CACO2 cells. So these were stained with, uh, with uh, cell light backmap for Golgi. There's a lot of background when you use only DMEM. In contrast, when you use fluorobrite DMEM, there is almost no background. So this is the same thing you can see in the graph. In DMEM, the background fluorescence is very high. For fluorobrite DMEM, it is very less equivalent to PPS, but then you can culture it for a long, long time in fluorobrite DMEM. Okay, so that was uh, live cell imaging. Now I come to fixed uh, cell imaging. Molecular probes uh, has a kit called Imaged Fixation Permeabilization Kit. The components of this kit is not proprietary. You can see the composition here. You can make it on your own. So here in this slide, I'm only going to talk about how using these particular reagents for fixation and permeabilization. So uh, in this kit for fixation, 4% formaldehyde is provided in many protons. It's better than twin 20 because um, it washes away the primary and secondary antibodies. For blocking, 3% BSA is provided. Now, it's a very good reagent. BSA, everybody uses it. You usually use either BSA or normal gold serum, which work fantastic in most cases. But sometimes they might not be uh, sufficient. On that case, you can use a reagent from molecular probes called blocked it blocking solution. So in this graph, what you see is that if you are uh, if you are staining mouse cerebellum cryosection, only alexophone secondary antibodies, no primary. 
So basically, you are uh, checking the effect of block. A lot of natural goat serum is little better, but block it functions better than both of them. And the same thing you can see in the picture as well. So you should first try with BSA and uh, NGS. If you still have problem, you can try the block it. So nowadays, uh, everybody is doing 3D imaging. And one problem with 3D imaging is that the laser does not penetrate to the core of the spheroid. In the top panel, what you see is a spheroid, different Z. Right. In the top panel, what you see is a spheroid, different Z planes. And you can clearly see that the core is not illuminated properly. So you can imagine that your cell count will not be proper and that can uh, affect your experiment. So then you can use a clearing agents like the cytovista clearing agents that clears the spheroids. And here you see that more and more cells are visible. The cell count will be much more accurate. Okay, so that was the preparation part. Now I come to the labeling part. Then again, depending on whether you are doing live cell imaging or you are doing fixed sample imaging, the protocols and the procedures will vary. So here I'll talk about the live cell imaging. Now live cell imaging has its own challenges like toxicity. So whichever dye you are using, there will be some amount of toxicity. In fact, a lot of research goes on to decide how much amount of fluorescent dye you should add so that toxicity is least. Another way to address this will be to use a biological agent. So I'll come to that in my next slide. And second problem is brightness. With each cell division, the brightness of the dye will, uh, will just half. Now there are many live cell uh, labeling reagents. I will talk about one class of live cell labeling reagent, which is called BACMAM. BACMAM can be used to label uh, subcellular components like uh, nuclear, cytoplasm, mitochondria, plasma membrane. In the right hand side, you have a table where you can see all the different subcellular components that can be labeled by BACMAM. Now, BACMAM reagents are uh, not chemical reagents. They are engineered baculovirus. These baculovirus are engineered to express a marker protein GFP or a marker protein RFP fusion. So this means if you are using a backmap for nucleus, it will express a marker for nucleus fused with GFP. Similarly, if you're using a backmap for uh, say Golgi apparatus, it will express a Golgi marker fused with GFP. And the protocol is extremely simple. All you have to do is, do is that you have to just add it to the media, incubate it and see it under the microscope. Now I have a, just a small nine second video that I will show you so that you can uh, see how it looks. So you can see that the nucleus has been labeled and the tubulin has been labeled. And this is the kind of live cell imaging that you can, um, that you can get using the BACMAM reagents. Sorry, is there a question? Uh, I think the link is not getting opened. You can see the PPT. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, then, uh, okay, that was a beautiful movie. Uh, but what uh, what I would suggest is that when you have time, if you can just uh, yeah, see the visit. See. yeah, exactly. We're running short of time. So just... How much time do you have? Uh, if you can end in another twenty minutes. Or yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. Minutes. I'll end in fifteen minutes. All right. So there are many other uh, reagents as well, which are uh, for live cell imaging. I'll not talk about them. You can just go to Thermo Fisher Scientific website and you can uh, visit them. So here I'm just covering some of the reagents which are most commonly used and uh, which has come up recently. Now I come to the detection and here I'll be talking about secondary antibodies. Now, as you all know that alexafluor dye was introduced by molecular probes as an advancement over the then existing dyes, they are brighter. Now, 
molecular probes have come up with the Alexa Floor Plus, which are five times brighter. And you can see if you use a Alexa Floor Plus conjugated antibody, you get much more target in the right hand side. All right. So uh, while talking about detection, there are different technologies of detection, and you can use a technology which best suits the expression profile of the target. So if you are using, if you are looking at a highly expressed target like tubulin, you can simply use a primary antibody conjugated with a dye. If you are uh, looking for medium to high expressed target, then you can use a primary antibody and a secondary antibody conjugated to fluorophore. You get about 10 to 20 dyes per target. And if you are looking for a medium to low, you can use a, a bitinylated secondary antibody along with a, a streptavidin conjugated fluorophore. Then you get 20 to 40 dyes per target. And if you are looking at very low expressed uh, target, then you can go for HRP tyramide technology. And in HRP tyramide technology, you get about 120 to 200 dyes per target, which means that you can look for very lowly expressed proteins as well. Very quickly, I'll just um, explain how this technology works. So what you do is that you add a primary antibody and then a secondary antibody conjugated with HRP. Then you add the substrate, which is tyramide conjugated with a fluorophore. The HRP converts this to an active dye, which then goes and deposits on all the tyramide residues. And this leads to a signal amplification of about 120 to 200 dyes per target. So this slide shows a comparison between using a, a fluorophore level secondary antibody, PSA, that is tyramide technology, and very recently, Thermo Fisher Scientific or Molecular Probes has come out with the Super Boost technology, which is an improvement over the TSA technology. The target here is prohibiting, and as you can see, there is uh, no signal when you use just a Alexa 488 level secondary antibody. When you used TSA, then you get signal for 1 is to uh, 150, 1 is to 300, the signal has gone less. So 1 is to 150 and 1 is to 300 is the dilution of primary antibody. When you use super boost technology, you can get signal up to 1 is to 600. So the advantage is one sensitivity and second is that uh, you, you have to use lesser amount of primary antibody. Now this is a slide which just, uh, which just emphasizes on the fact that you should choose the amplification technology carefully. Like if you have a highly expressed antigen like tubulin, then direct technology that is um, for conjugated to primary antibody is fine. If you use the TSA technology, it's just a blow up. You will not get any quantitative data at all. On the other hand, if your if your antigen is lowly expressed like catenin, it's better to use TSA. But you can see you are getting very specific signal. But the other two cases, direct antibody and fluorophore conjugated antibody signals are not very good. Now I come to protection. So here, uh, here it's about the mountains. And as you all know, mountains, they help in increasing the resolution, preventing photo bleaching, preserves morphology and the storage. I'll just go through each of these points quickly. So this slide shows the importance of using the correct mountain. What you are seeing is rat uh, tissue, 70 micron thick, and the image has been taken using a confocal oil objective. So when you use a, use a mountain which is compatible with oil objective, you get good image up to a depth of about 60 micron. But when you use other objective, other uh, mountains, which are not specifically designed for oil imaging, that is the refractive index is low, you do not get resolution up to that level. So this is an important factor, factor because sometimes I do get questions like this, imaging is not good, and then we figure out that a um, wrong mountain was used. So here you can see how the mountain can help in photo bleaching. The last panel is just 50% glycerol plus DPS compared to use of different, different uh, mountains. So this is another uh, another slide which shows the importance of uh, using right right mounted. So this is a prolonged glass and newly introduced uh, 
found in Amitabha Kusha scientific team. And you can see that it has less shrinkage and it can protect the morphology much better. And just another uh, pictorial representation of how a bound print can help you for long-term storage. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to cover these things much. So if you have any questions about which reagent to use, whether this is compatible with your microscope or not, you can always reach out to us in India Info at the uh, India-info at thermofisher.com. And um, if I have five more minutes, I'll just talk about uh, high content imaging. So is that okay? Yeah, you can do it. Okay, so uh, these are the steps in which you can um, you can uh, prepare the sample, you can label the sample, you can protect the sample, and then you, you do the imaging. So there are many fantastic microscopes available. I think there are quite a few talks on advanced microscopy. So you get beautiful images like that, like what you're seeing in the slide. And the next step is quantitation. You need to get quantitative data out of it. In the last talk, Dr. Akash was talking about using high content screening. So this is a technology which has been specifically developed for the quantitation part. So two words, if you are interested in quantitation and if you are interested in high throughput, that is a lot of samples where you are doing screening, then the high content screening technology is something that should be used. So this is the kind of, uh, this is just a feel of, um, using a high content screening technology, like you get an image that the instrument has taken. So what you are seeing is spot biology. The blue are the nuclei and the green are the spots. And the aim of the experiment is to quantify the spots. So what the instrument does is that first it marks the objects, then it delineates the area around the objects where the cytoplasm should be, marks the spots, and then it gives you all information about the spot, spot count, spot total area, spot total intensity, and so on. But this is a typical output that you get from a high content screening instrument. So for instance, you are, you are just screening a, a drug for its new neurotoxicity. So what you are seeing here by my cursor is, is plate level data. You see, uh, there's a very nice dose response curve that you get. Just below that are the values associated with each well. Left hand side is the heat map. So you can clearly uh, find out at one look. So you can define that, okay, uh, if cells are between one to 10, color it red, 10 to 100, color it green, 100 to 1000, color it blue. Then below is the field. These are the cells. If you click on any cell, then images of that cell in all the different channels will come up along with the data associated with each cell. So this means in one screen, you get data from plate, from well, from field, from each cell. So, so that is the most exciting part of uh, high content screening technology. So these are examples of some of the cells and the experiments and the data that you get. This is apoptosis in uh, spheroids. So you can see as you increase the concentration of nucleosamide, then the, uh, the number of apoptotic cells increases and so does. That's the same thing you can see in the graph also. Another interesting thing is that the spheroids are disintegrating, right? So the, cell, the spheroid size also decreases. So this is another example of using high content screening to see how the active uh, killing of steroids happen because of these cells. So this is another workflow which are, uh, we are currently developing. So basically, we, um, we are using high content screening to scan slides. And then this is the image of an organoid. And you can see the different markers of the organoid. And the next step is quantitation. This is just to, just to tell you what all the HCS instrument can do. And this is, this is my last slide uh, where I just want to give an idea of the breadth of the experiments, quantitative experiments that can be done using high content screening. You can do motility me measurements. You can study uh, zebrafish embryo and zebrafish whole mounts, angiogenesis, organoids. There are lots and lots of uh, applications of HCS. 
So thank you. So this was a very basic talk, talk which was uh, more directed towards students. So if you have any questions, I'll be uh, very happy to. If there are any questions, you all can drop in in the chat box. We can reach out to Dr. Day again uh, because we are running short of time. So I'll start the next presentation. Okay, so the next presentation uh, will be given by me. I am Dr. Indrani Datta, Associate Professor at Department of Biophysics at National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences. Uh, just in brief, what my research lab works in. So we explore into the neuronal niche, be it specially comprising by the glial cells, be it the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, and the Schwann cells them under the etiology of certain diseases like Parkinson's disease or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or diabetic neuropathy. And definitely, we also look into the master niche cells of the body, the bone marrow, mesenchymal stem cells, which are also known to modify glial cells. So the topic of my talk is biodistribution of intramuscular transplanted dental pulp stem cells using near infrared Live, live animal imaging. So where do the cells go? A little brief about what are mesenchymal stromal cells. So diverse set of multipotent precursors are present in the stromal fraction of many adult tissues. They were first discovered in the bone marrow niche, acting serving as a niche cell for the hematopoietic stem cells. So often the bone marrow mesenchymal stromal cells are considered as the gold standard. But from tissues of dental pulp, adipose tissue, peripheral blood, umbilicus, or perinatal uh, tissues, there have been uh, many reports and isolation, successful isolation and characterization of mesenchymal stromal cells. So in vitro, they do retain the capability of multipotency, giving rise to its own lineage cells like the osteoblasts, adipocytes, and chondrocytes. And, uh, their main uh, plus point is they are immune evasive. They lack HLA-DR, that is the MHC class two molecules and co-stimulatory molecules. They're suitable also for allergenic stem cell therapy for this particular reason. And also for their immunomodulatory interaction with T cells and other immune cells of the body. So under the physiological conditions, what, how do they exist in the tissue? in the adult tissue. They usually exist in the dormant or a quiescent state. Once they are being activated, so is it that here the activated means a, a wrong story or trouble? No, unlike the glial activation, over here the activated MSCs are actually capable of bringing about immune modulation through its paracrine factors, be it the cytokines it secretes or be it the growth factors it secretes, and also through cell cell interaction. Some examples, like through the TGF beta and EGF uh, secretion, it is capable of decreasing the cyclin D2 expression and P27 KIP1 expression, thus arresting the cytotoxic T cells at their G1 phase. Through cell cell interaction, it is capable of interacting with the PD-1 receptor, which are present or expressed in the MSCs with the ligand, which are expressed by the cytotoxic T cells and brings about decrease in proliferation of the cytotoxic T cells. Beyond this, it is also capable through its secretory factor of PG-2 and IL-10, it is capable of decreasing the differentiation of monocyte to mature dendritic cells, thus basically 
making the T, T cells energetic. So that the dendritic T cells, are, dendritic cells are required by the T cells because they are the antigen presenting cells. Again, through IL-10, an anti-inflammatory uh, cytokine, which is secreted by the activated MSCs with EGA2, is capable of making a shift of the M1 macrophage to the M2 macrophage. It also inhibits NK cells, for, so that the secretion of IF and gamma, IL-2, uh, uh, or even IL-17, these goes down drastically due to these activated MSCs working on these immune cells. So what we can see in a multi-pronged approach once it is in the war field, it is capable of multitasking and regulating several of these immune cells to bring about an immune suppressive environment. Precisely for this reason, MSCs are now termed as advanced therapy medicinal product and has been used presently in 750 clinical trials. As you can see in the cartwheel present over here, it has been used from musculoskeletal diseases to arthritis, to autoimmune disease, to gastrointestinal diseases, and to nervous system diseases. And it's very clear that the most chunk of the diseases in which the clinical trials are getting conducted are in the musculoskeletal diseases and in the central nervous system diseases. So what is the pipeline from wherein the MSCs are being carried out from the bench to the bedside? So the proof of concept to the product delivery. So there is a translational pipeline which has is present and has to be gone through. So be it from starting from MSC isolation and characterization to their robust in vitro testing, preclinical safety, toxicity, potency, their effect on behavioral parameters on certain disease conditions, and even the effect on systemic inflammation is still where the preclinical safety toxicity studies usually ended and it geared up for the next scale, large scale CGMP manufacturing with SOPs in place for the quality control and assurance, banking and logistics to reach to the bedside. But in spite of this, Increasing data is showing that this MSC therapy is failing at the advanced clinical trial level at phase three. Everything is not negative about it because some key question got raised from it. Which is the optimal route of administration of MSCs? How much dosage is required? So the moment we want to ask how much dosage is required, we need to know for how long the cells were retaining in the tissue of our interest and where were they roaming around to be it under control condition and then in the diseased condition. And what was the course of movement? This is where in the biodistribution studies gets in between the preclinical safety toxicity before gearing it up for the clinical trials. And biodistribution studies is very specifically needs to be carried out for the preclinical mode to understand, be it in the pharmacokinetic models or be judging its roots, judging its doses. These are required, be it in the healthy state of animal model and with respect to the particular disease of interest. So, Though in 2011, the European Medicine Agency had cited biodistribution as a very crucial element to be included before going for clinical trials, Indian Council of Medical Research, Department of Biotechnology, International Society for Stem Cell Research started this guideline from 2017 and 2016 onwards that biodistribution and these key questions needs to be answered before the product gets into or clinical trials because the cells are living entities. So their biodistribution and retention is also needed to be checked in the control and healthy animal models. And it just doesn't restrict to that safety of a pharmacological product. So when we went ahead and looked into the literature, so are there, how many studies are there? And if so, are there studies with human uh, origin mesenchymal stromal cells and through which route it has been uh, already published or the report has been present in animal model and specifically in immunocompetent healthy animal model. So we found only Kao et al in 2016 had investigated the biodistribution and retention time of allogenic rat bone marrow embassies infused intravenously into a healthy rat model. 
but there were no studies with respect to human origin mesenchymal stromal cell transplantation and definitely not through any of the routes. The most common route used for uh, MSCs has been till now intravenous. The very reason being that immediate effect was it can be uh, observed. And even in our earlier study in diabetic neuropathy, where we had standardized the route and the dosage, we had found that the behavioral parameters showed much better benefits in the initial time point of intravenous transplantation, unlike the intramuscular one, but the better retention and the better uh, effectiveness and efficacy on the nerve cell uh, nerve conduction velocity was ultimately found from the intramuscular transplantation. But there is another big negative for intravenous infusion of mesenchymal stromal cells for uh, at least in preclinical studies and definitely for clinical studies too, that which is the first pass effect. So what does it say? The first pass effect is wherein the cells being larger in size gets entrapped in the small capillaries in the lungs and fails to survive. And obviously if it fails to survive, it will limit their regenerative potential. And that can be the primary reason why a certain repair process is getting halted, even though we know that the cells have the potential to bring about repair. So here we, uh, for our study, we had chosen the intramuscular route, definitely because from our past uh, study where we had found that the long-term efficacy was being noted with a uh, double dose of dental pulp stem cells through intramuscular transplantation. Moreover, previous studies have also, also uh, shown, and even the pharmacological studies have shown, that intramuscular route is often adopted where you need to have a steady state or you know prolonged maintained uh, release of drugs and that's when your IM is preferred than the IV route. So why dental pulp stem cells? Uh, due to lack of time I'm not going to go through them all the details but definitely why we went ahead with the dental pulp stem cells is because of their neuroectodermal origin, that's the neural crest origin. And through our in vitro work, we had shown that it has more neurogenic effect than bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells and Wharton's jelly mesenchymal stem cells. On top of that, they are we're fortunate that they lack HLA GR class two, MHC class two molecules or post-stimulatory molecules, and they have shown immunomodulatory efficiency as similar as the bone marrow mesenchymal stromal cells. So now coming to the imaging modalities. So till now, what are the modalities which were used to understand that, okay, a particular transplanted cells of human origin are present in the tissue of our interest or it has started getting excreted and the distribution has started moving. So extensive use of PCR is, was used wherein the human DNA, be it the ALU gene or the beta globin was assessed in the tissues, but it is very labor intensive. It's a tedious tissue processing procedure, and it's obviously unsuitable for longitudinal studies. And it needed to be along with that, as I go on saying, seeing is believing, histology experiments had to be conducted as even a qualitative measure that uh, lipophilic dyes were used and fluorescent labels were used to look into whether the cells are actually residing into the tissue of interest. But again, with respect to histology, you cannot do the sections for the whole organs, so it always remains qualitative, and there is high autofluorescence in the range of uh, the visible light electromagnetic spectrum. So coming to the new age imaging techniques and the ones which are being accepted most and even um, approved by FDA for clinical trials are the magnetic resonance imaging, wherein supramagnetic particles are used and their detection can be approximately till uh, one into 10 to the power four cell efficiency. The depth independence of the spatial resolution is excellent for this. And obviously for human studies, the longitudinal studies can be performed well. Now, with respect to what uh, the limitations appeared over here was from 2013, wherein studies showed that these supramagnetic particles had cytotoxic effect on the cells of our interest, on the cells which we are transplanting. So not only that, it 
inhibited the migration of the MSCs due to the, their action on the actin uh, filaments of the cytoskeleton, but also this peon uptake on the resident tissue macrophages showed a false positive result. So therein the search continues still for a better imaging technique. Simultaneously, other new image techniques were also used, wherein gamma emitters and positron emitters were used for single photon emission commuted tomography or positron emission tomography. For PET, of course, you have to again inject a tracer uh, uh, for getting the contrast images and be the direct labeling of uh, using radio labeling tracers and indirect labeling using reported gene constructs were used for imaging. These were uh, mostly performed in the preclinical studies. The advantages like MRI, it has high depth of penetration and whole body scanning can be performed. But here, the main negative is the short half-life of these products, of these particles. Longer term tracking won't be possible and the radio labeling reported by not suitable and safe method of MSC tracking in human subjects. And the tracer leakage, which is required for getting contrast images for PET, were reported to be taken, were reported to be leaked out from the mesenchymal stromal cells. So basically, further studies on it with prolonged storage of radio label leukocytes, it was found that it dim diminished chemotaxis, high spontaneous release of radionucleotides, and impaired cellular viability and function was present. It was used, and moreover, it was used in conjunction with MRI or CT to see the anatomical location. So what happens due to that? The cost increases. And as we know, the MRI facility or SPECT and PET facility is near to it is near to impossible to have that even in every city in our country. And not only having the facility, there is cost incentive which goes behind the expertise you need to bring in over there and to monitor and measure such diagnostic, high-end diagnostic facilities. So these piles on to the disadvantage of these new age techniques. Coming to the bioluminescence, wherein again, this was a technique which was used and used presently too um, in the preclinical studies a lot, because the tracking can be done for unlimited time, unlike in SPECT and PECT, wherein the short half-life is definitely a negative factor. But over here, the disadvantage is that you need to transpect the cells with reported genes. So basically the minimal uh, manipulation of the cells is not staying over here, we are going on manipulating the cells beyond the time point wherein you have to check whether it is interfering with the properties of the cells and, of course, the function of the cell. On top of that, low resolution, low sensitivity, high tissue absorption of emitted light, that is, you're having more background noise than the signal, are some of the uh, limitations of bioluminescence imaging systems. Now, coming to ideal imaging techniques, so we should be having a non-toxic label or a probe. It should not alter the cell morphology, phenotype, and eventually its function. It should be reliable, reproducible, and robust, have higher signal strength, definitively, than in comparison to its noise. It should be long-lived in vivo so that a long-term tracking can be performed, and detection methods should be non-invasive shouldn't cause harm to the subject or should be rapid and sensitive. And it would increase the uh, valuability of it will increase if uh, anatomical structures can be displayed and the sensitivity is there in the micron level. So that's where the fluorescence-based optical imaging started getting in. Now the fluorescent lipophilic tracers have been used for transplantation mainly because they're highly reproducible, so they are robust, they're quick for labeling the cells and the manipulation of the cells keeps to minimum. It's non-toxic on the cellular properties and multiple colored dyes can be used for tracking and tracing. But again, we have to remember over here, the optical range is the electromagnetic spectrum is from 450 nanometer to 600 nanometer, which is the visible range. 
and that's what limits it. There is extreme amount of noise which would come out from the other products in the tissue which fluoresces at that wavelength. So the lower depth of penetration comes because of the detection range of wavelength and higher background by tissue absorption. So when we are talking about the range, so we have to now look into the optical window, which must be the optimal one, wherein the main culprits which brings about autofluorescence can be tackled. So let's look into which are the main culprits. They are the water, the oxyhemoglobin, and the deoxyhemoglobin. They are major light absorbers. And what we can find over here through the uh, left-hand side panel is that we get a near infrared window wherein their absorption is the least, that is from the 700 to 900 nanometer. After that, again, the absorption of the water initiates high. So we have to play around or we have to tap this optical window to go ahead to cancel out noise. So why NIR is better? And increasingly, these studies are getting into clinical trials for, um, and getting FDA approval so that this element or of biodistribution or the key question of biodistribution, the dosage, the retention time individually can be assessed and measured quantitatively. So it has low, the main plus point of the NIR dyes being the low background tissue absorption for deeper penetration that is in tissue level. And it's obviously more suitable for in vivo preclinical and clinical imaging studies. Minimal manipulation, as we said, that we don't want the cells to be manipulated. Otherwise, we won't know whether the cells are performing in their maximum capability and potential or the regenerative potential is getting hampered just because we have manipulated the cells with uh, certain reporter genes and uh, hence getting an arbit result. Moreover, this requires quick labeling. It doesn't take too long. And um, it does not require special handling of radioactive probes. So we started uh, with the Anaya dye cell view 815 uh, with the respect to the toxicity on the dental bud stem cells, because that's the primary thing which we have to initiate with to understand whether, whether the dye of our choice is good enough for the cell or interest. So the unlabeled um, cell viability was comparable to the cells which were NIR dye labeled. So the toxicity level was clear and uh, we were happy with the data. Morphologically also, there wasn't any difference in the cellular morphology or phenotype through the base contrast microscope. So we went ahead to see whether it is capable of retaining its litmus test that is getting through showing its multipotency or not. So when they were induced for osteoblast and uh, for adipocyte differentiation, we successfully got to see that they were both unlabeled and the NIR dilabeled cells were capable of differentiating to osteoblasts and to adipocytes. And even the gene expression was comparable between the two. So basically labeling with this NIR dye did not affect the cell survival or the multilineage differentiation potential of the human dental bulb stem cells. Next, we needed to detect whether how much of cell efficiency or how much the technique is efficient, how least number of cells it is capable of grabbing the intensity through our um, instrument. So we did a cell number, uh, increasing cell number from five into 10 to the power three, 5,000 to one lakh cells, and we found that the intensity, an IR signal intensity was detected from 20,000 cells itself, with, uh, as we can see in the graph below, with increasing of cells per well, the signal intensity increased, and the R square was a good value of 0.99, thus showing that the technique is efficient and reproducible. When we went ahead for the transplantation, the number of cells we transplanted was 1 million DPNCs in the intramuscular route. Why we took this number was from our previous study, which we have already published, wherein this number, so we did not play around with the number of the DPSCs or the cells of transplantation. 
So we took the images of the ipsilateral side and the contralateral side at different time points from 30 minutes to six hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, eight days, 12 days, until 28 days. Now, why did we end or did we take the 28th day as the last? Because again, from our previous study, we had done a single dose and a double dose and the double dose of the cells were provided at the 28th day or rather just after the 28th day. So here it is in continuum with our previous work and it, more work is going on with respect to uh, the mechanism or of these cells, how they function to bring about um, improvement in nerve conduction velocity. So we couldn't play around much with the last day, which is the 28th day. Now, from this image, I think you would be able to see a baffling observation, which is at the 30th minute, 6th hour and 24th hour. Look over there, suddenly at the 24th hour, we get to see it fluorescing more. The signal intensity is more and the area is more. So we went on repeating, thinking, is it the technique? Is it the, something we are missing? Or is it reproducible? It is robust or not? And every time we ended up getting this image, we went back to literature, we couldn't find any. There was images either from 30th minute and the last or from 24th hour onwards. So it was very baffling for us. And we were equally stubborn that we are not going to give up. Even if it is in the control data, we need to invest our time behind it. So this is the place which I was trying to refer to y'all, when we plot the signal intensity and the area, we find a distinct increase at the 24th hour in comparison to the 30th minute and the 6th hour. So the questions are, what happens now? Is it that the cells started proliferating there in the muscle from 30th minute where it was so tiny and suddenly in the 24th hour, we get to see this whole burst of signal? Then the bell rings. No, this is an adult tissue. So it cannot be that you are having your cues, the developmental cues, that it will start proliferating over there. Quite unlikely, but nonetheless, we have to show it through facts because it's science. The second hypothesis which we had was that by 24th hour, probably the cells are starting to enter the blood vessels that lie adjacent to the muscle, and the blood vessels being placed just under the skin might be responsible for the increase in the signal intensity and also the area. Again, we need to prove that it has gone to the blood and uh, for that, we have something in store. So to investigate whether the muscle microenvironment was inducing proliferation, we assess the content of DPSCs by quantifying the human ALU gene and even the human KI67 gene expression of the muscle in where we had transplanted them. And we found a comparable expression for both the gene. So it clearly ruled out the proliferation of DPSCs in the adult muscle. Next, for the second possibility that whether it has come out in the blood, and that's why we can see the spread over there, we needed to show one solid example that wherein more direct cells could have gone from the muscle to there without entering the blood. And that was the bone marrow. So we looked into the bone, the signal in the bone marrow at the 30th minute, 6th hour and 24th hour. And here indeed, at the 24th hour, we found that there was an intensity increase much higher than 30th minute and 6th hour. And yes, our confusion or a problem got solved. We confirmed that the cells started entering the bloodstream and then had reached the bone marrow. And hence, we are seeing that increase in the signal intensity and area. So further on, the moment we understood that at from 24th hour, it has started getting into the bloodstream. We looked into the intensity, into all the other blood filtering organs like lungs, liver, spleen, kidney, so on and so forth, including the right muscle where we had injected and the contralateral side, that's the left muscle. Why we needed to see that, that because we did not want the first pass effect to initiate off. And we wanted that the muscle, um, the muscle where we had put the DPSCs 
they're capable of retaining it for a longer time and releasing it slowly, just as we uh, expect or we have observed or seen for pharma pharmaceutical drugs. So indeed, throughout in the time point, what we can see is the cells retaining in the muscle was much higher than any of the blood filtering organs. So the muscle can function as a reserve for controlled MSC dosing. This is what we understood. We had also performed uh, immunohist or histology, immunohistochemistry, by labeling PKH26 to the DPSCs to have it as a confirmatory data. And for all these time points, we had performed RNA of human ALU gene throughout for all these organs. So as I was talking about the first pass effect that after a few hours, if it is so that it has gone into the lungs and gets trapped over there, then it is definitely not good news for the route. Then we have to think of a different route of administration. So we plotted the signal intensity of the muscle with respect to the lungs at different time points. And throughout all the time points, we found that the signal intensity was highest in the muscle and quite negligible uh, or quite less in the lungs. The same trend of data we had observed even when we went ahead to detect the human ALU gene. So intramuscular administration route will <clears throat> avoids entrapment of DPSCs in lungs and can maximize the efficiency of the dosage. So in conclusion, we can say that intramuscular administration of dental bulb stem cells in a healthy rat model provides a long-term sustenance for the cells with minimal lung entrapment, wherein the cells start to enter the bloodstream by 24th hour. Now, this part of the control data, we just got its publication in cells, tissues, and organs, and are parallelly and simultaneously, our work on the diabetic neuropathy model is undergoing, be it the single dose and the double dose. But I wanted to share some interesting data what we find and what I was talking about that because these cells are living entities and they are not non-living drugs or molecules and small molecules. So we hear the presence of the control data or immuno data in the immunocompetent rat of the same species is so important. So in the DN model, be it in the single dose or be it in the double dose, what we find that the DPSCs are moving faster out from the muscle. So basically, the retention time is much lesser than what we are observing in our uh, controlled immunocompetent uh, rat model. And another interesting observation which we found was that the entrance or the presence of the DPSCs with respect to the signal intensity in the pancreas is much higher than what we observed for the immunocompetent rat. So uh, this was a little expected because we know when we are doing the diabetic neuropathy and using SDC model, the pancreas is the place which gets affected. That's the most inflamed and injured region. And definitely the cells are being capable of recognizing the cues and docking and homing to the tissue of interest. That work is still going on, which my PhD student is performing. Further on, another student is performing in my ICMR project with respect to tracking and biodistribution of exosomes, wherein we are uh, administering the exosomes from dental bulb stem cells by tagging them with near infrared uh, dye and through the intranasal route in Parkinson's disease model. And then through the brain, in different regions of the brain, be it the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain, with uh, respect to time, we go on tracking that how long these cells or these exosomes are capable to be retained, and hence how many doses would be required for combating Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, yeah, be it as a cure or be it as a preventive strategy. So this is our uh, NIR imaging facility. And um, I would like to acknowledge my funding agencies along with Nenhance, ICMR and Lady Data Memorial Trust. Pragnya is the PhD student who is working on it. Alka is a postdoc and Girish, who is the JSO, has worked and aided her in this work. 
and this is my team. Thank you. So if you have any questions, you're most welcome to uh, drop it in the chat box. And in the meanwhile, I'll just check for the next speaker, whether he's online or not. I am here. Hello, yes, everyone. Yes. Hello, right. thank you for being yeah. uh, present in a very unearthly hour uh, from the <laughs> US. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And uh, yes, so I would first uh, give an introduction. Uh, so uh, Adik is also going to continue uh, the same lecture series on optical imaging and uh, sensors. So he earned his BA in organic, uh, organismic and evolutionary biology at Harvard University. He has a professional background in research labs, genetics and cell culturing. As an application scientist at scientific bioprocessing, Jake supports new product development and testing and problem solves for each customer's unique bio application. Is dedicated to improving the science surrounding cell culture and helping customers attain their scientific goals. So with this, Jake, uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'll share my screen here. Okay. Can everyone see that? Are we, uh, are we good to go? Yes, we're good to go. We can see your screen and hear you well. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thanks for the presentation. Um, so yeah, it's a little early in the morning with uh, over here. So please bear with me if I, if I trip over any words. Uh, I know you guys are all getting towards the end of the day. So you're probably just as tired. Um, so I appreciate everyone being here and listening um, and taking the time um, to attend this conference. So without further ado, I'll get started. So my name is Jake. I'm a senior application scientist with scientific bioprocessing. Um, we go by SBI most of the time. So a little bit about our company. Um, so our parent company is called Scientific Industries and they developed the product, uh, the Vortex Genie, which you can see on the bottom right of the screen is that little blue box that shakes up your, um, you know, your centrifuge tubes. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but probably not many of you are familiar with optical sensors. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about what optical sensors are and kind of where they come from. So this is a technology um, that was developed by Dr. Gobind Rao at his lab at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And our company has taken this technology and um, done some more research and development and taken it to the point where now it's a commercial product. And uh, before I talk about anything else, I just want to mention the FDA. There's a conference happening um, in the USA right now called IFPAC. And this conference is really all about FDA regulations. Um, and, you know, all the science surrounding everything, but all the regulations and the regulatory um, steps that are coming up. And with this in mind, um, you know, the world of cell culture is changing. And, you know, and this is really, um, and this is really pertinent in, in stem cells as well, where the FDA is really starting to look for uh, the, the actual data where you're measuring different parameters of your cell culture from the beginning of your process all the way through to the end. Um, and, and so there's this initiative called the PAT initiative, which a lot of people are talking about right now, where we're trying to monitor critical process parameters. Um, and part of this is taking measurements from the very beginning, um, when, you know, when you start growing your cells, when you start scouting your process, things like this. Um, and optical sensors are a great way to address this. So I want to talk about optical sensors first. I'm sure not many of you are familiar with them. Uh, it's a pretty new, well, it's not necessarily a new technology, but it's it's technology that wasn't really commercially available until very recently. So when it comes to designing um, a new sensor or a sensor that we think is an improvement upon what's currently out there, there are four things that we want to keep in mind. The sensors have to be reliable, first of all, and provide real-time monitoring across all vessel sizes. Um, 
And there needs to be a way, ultimately, the, the end goal of sensing is to be able to move to automation through machine learning. So we need the ability to have automatic control um, and, and, and a closed loop feedback system. The sensors must provide relevant physiological data. And the important part is that this information has to be gathered at the paracellular level where the cells are actually growing, um, if they're adherent cells in particular. And then cells in suspension, we want to be measuring where the cells are spending most of their time um, as opposed to just measuring the bulk solution and assuming that the rest of the culture, including the cells, are experiencing the same conditions. And then finally, the sensors, we want to be economically remarkable or, in other words, inexpensive. So we want to have a good return on investment when, when it comes to sensors. So traditional sensors, things like um, the Clark electrode, things like electrochemical probes, I'm sure you know, many people are familiar with, with dip probes or probes that you know, they're like the size of a pen, something like that. They don't work when it comes to things like tea flasks, petri dishes, um, shake flasks, things like this. So what we have right now in cell culture are all these different culture vessels that are on the small scale where we have no ability to sense what's happening inside of there. So if you're growing cells right now in a petri dish or if you're growing cells in a tea flask, I'm sure you know that you have no idea uh, what's really happening with the dissolved oxygen. Um, and aside from looking at phenol red changing color, um, it's a little difficult to tell in real time what's happening with your pH. And this can lead to a whole host of issues. Um, and, and the biggest one is, is the inability to reproduce results between different lab groups, even uh, between different experiments in the same lab group. So reproducibility because you can't control all of your variables if you don't know what those variables are. And sensors are the first place to look um, when it comes to finding out what's really happening with your cells in these vessels. So optical sensors, and, and here's the first image that I'll show of them. Uh, on the left, this is the T25, and you can see the optical sensors being placed in that vessel. And I'll get more into optical sensors uh, and what they look like in just a second. But um, this is really the answer when it comes to measuring um, in these small culture devices. This is the most fundamental way that optical sensors are changing cell culture. We can now monitor T flasks. Um, we can monitor shake flasks, petri dishes, and even microfluidics devices, which I'll show here a little later. Um, and these are, these are all the different vessels that we can't really approach with the sensors that are available on the market today. So I'll start off, and first of all, I should mention that, um, that our company, we offer dissolved oxygen sensors and pH sensors. We're working on expanding our sensor portfolio, which I'll talk about at the very end of the presentation. But for now, um, what's commercially available is pH and dissolved oxygen. So I'll talk about those first. So the pH sensors, just so everyone has context and knows what we're talking about, you can see them on the right. They're the white spots on this black packaging right here. And that's actual size. So these sensors, um, we standard, you know, the standard size for them from our company is seven millimeters in diameter. Uh, and five millimeters in diameter. We can also go down to three millimeters in diameter. And think of the sensor kind of like a sticker. It's, uh, it has a silicone adhesive. It sticks on the inside of the culture vessel. Um, and it's like a fluorescent sticker target that you place in the culture vessel before you inoculate, before you seed your cells. So you can see the pH sensor sitting there on the right. They're very small. Um, and some of the capabilities of the sensor. So first of all, we're operating in, at the mammalian physiological range, so six to eight pH. Um, and some of the really nice things about these sensors that separate them from the sensors that everyone is used to is that these are all meant to be single use and disposable. And part of this means that the sensors come pre-calibrated. We calibrate the sensors when we send them to you. You never need to clean them. You never need to recalibrate them. You use the sensor for a run, uh, and the sensors can last up to 45 days with continuous monitoring. So that means you can take a reading every minute. So you're getting real-time updates on what's happening in your culture once every minute for 45 days. So if you have a perfusion run, for example, um, these sensors will work for perfusion runs. They'll also work for quick cultures where you're doing maybe a week, 10 days, 14 days. Um, they're perfect for those types of situations. When you're finished with the sensor, you can just throw it away and then you use a new one out of the package. Uh, like I mentioned before, they're very inexpensive and they're meant to be, uh, they're meant to be high throughput um, and, and an easy way to get sensing uh, in a variety of different places. The sensors can also be steam or gamma sterilized. 
and we think gamma sterilization is really important because you know for people using bioreactors, uh, if they're gamma irradiating their bioreactor, the sensor can be placed in the bioreactor prior to gamma irradiation. Then you can bio, or then you can um, gamma irradiate the entire bioreactor with the sensor inside. Um, so the entire system is sterile before you inoculate, before you put your media in and get things running. And then the dissolved oxygen sensor. This is, you know, it's just like the, um, the pH sensor, except it's orange. And you can see it pictured there on the right. Um, so the oxygen sensor, again, comes pre-calibrated, um, all the same specifications, really. And again, think of these like little stickers. They're three millimeters in diameter at their smallest, and they're about 0.3 millimeters tall. So they're very, like, you know, a couple pieces of paper stacked on top of each other. That's about the thickness um, of the sensor. So really low profile and minimally invasive. And then, to, so I mentioned that the, uh, the sensor is like a sticker, a fluorescent sticker target. And the way that we read this is with what we call the ID reader. It's the reading device. And you can see it pictured at the top of the screen under a multi-well plate on the left and the center all by itself. And on the right, you can see a T75 sitting on top of a reading device. And you can see the sensors placed inside of the T75. So you can get an idea of how small the sensors are. Um, and, and that's a very basic application pictured above. I'll show more um, as we move on. But the nice thing about this reading device, uh, it's a simple way to get started with optical sensing. And it has two channels for sensing in one device. So you can do two channels of oxygen, um, two channels of pH, or you can measure pH and dissolved oxygen with this one device. Uh, the device is also um, ethanol sterilizable. It's watertight. You can put it in your incubator. You can use it outside of the incubator. Um, either way it works. So when we have the sensors and we have the reading device, um, that's all it takes to do sensing using optical sensors. And I want to explain how that works for those of us who don't know. And, and if, if some people here are familiar with this, with this type of technology, bear with me for this slide, but I do want to explain this because it is unfamiliar territory for a lot of people. So if you see on the right, uh, that's we're simulating there just a culture vessel and you can see oxygen floating around um, and, and you know, a few, you know, there's some H plus in the solution as well. So uh, let's say some acid and basically the way this works is the optical sensors are adhered to the to somewhere in the vessel. In this picture, they're on the bottom of the vessel, but you can stick them on the side of the vessel, the bottom, uh, the top, anywhere you want to put them in the vessel. In this case, they're on the bottom. And the sensors are interacting with the oxygen. They're interacting um, with the H+, and it changes the basically the fluorescent property of the dye that's embedded in the sensor. And when the sensor is in the vessel, there's nothing that connects it to the outside world. So there are no wires running out of the culture vessel. Once you place the sensor in the vessel, you never need to open the vessel again um, for the sake of the sensor. So, you, you know, and, and, and this is useful in a lot of ways. So basically, if you, if, you know, you can imagine the normal workflow in a lab, let's say you're using tea flasks in a CO2 incubator and you have phenol red in your media um, and, and you need to open the door of the incubator to look and see if the phenol red has changed colors in the stacks of tea flasks that are sitting in there. Um, and what happens when you open that door? Well, you know, the CO2 rushes out, the incubator takes sometimes hours to correct the environment. With these sensors, you can just look on your computer screen and you can see exactly what your pH is. There's no guesswork involved. You can also see exactly what the levels of dissolved oxygen are in these flasks, and it gives you a better idea when it's time to change your media uh, and when the cells might want to be passaged as opposed to having to look and open the incubator every time. Um, and then the sensor, so when you have the sensors on the vessel, you place this on top of the reading device. The reading device sends light through the wall of the vessel, um, causes the sensors to fluoresce, a signal is returned, and then that's interpreted um, as a dissolved oxygen or a pH reading. And, you know, um, I can get more into detail about how this uh, the fluorescence actually works if anyone is interested to know. So, so please be sure you know, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd love to talk about it later on. And then so just to wrap it all up uh, in the introduction here, this is some data collected and, and it's, there's nothing special about this data, but this was collected uh, in P25s. So Petri dishes, you know, about this big. And this is a, a university uh, called um, uh, this is Virginia Commonwealth University, and they're doing uh, they're using rat conjure sites in petri dishes, and they're just measuring the pH here. So, this is real time data um, across 24 hours, and you can see just that uh, the sensors are able to show the pH um, 
of this chondrocyte culture over the course of 24 hours in a petri dish. And uh, you know, this is real time inline sensing. No one's taking samples of the media here. This is just happening in the vessel. So with all of that, uh, I just want to introduce this and uh, what we call the ID developers kit. And this is just, you know, this is the reading device and this is the sensors. And this is the package that we have put this into. And you can see here um, a multi-well plate sitting on top of the reading device. And you can see a little piece of black plastic on the right kind of supporting that. So um, there are various, and this is just meant to illustrate, that there are various ways um, that we want to be able to incorporate these sensors with different types of culture vessels. And then of course there's software um, where the data is displayed numerically, it's displayed, displayed graphically, and there's also data logging available. Um, another great thing, so we know, you know the point of sensing is to move towards auto automation and, uh, and control. So if you have a system where, you know, if, as long as you have Modbus capabilities, um, our devices can talk with whatever software uh, or PLC system you might currently be using. So you can make use of, this, of the data from the sensors um, with whatever software you're currently using, or you can also use our software. So now that I've introduced the products, um, I've introduced T-flasks, I mean, introduced optical sensors, sorry about that. Uh, I do want to talk about T-flasks now. And, and the point of this next bit um, of the presentation is just to illustrate what's possible when we do sensing in things like T-flasks, once we have that capability. So uh, I want everyone to sort of take a moment to reflect if, you're, if you've ever used a T-flask, for example, uh, which is a lot of people, or if you've ever used a Petri dish, something like that, I, 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 would, uh, I would you know be willing to bet that the reason you're using that culture vessel is because that's what's been done in the past. It's what someone has handed to you um, it's, it's just kind of the, an understanding that everyone has that these are the standard culture vessels that we use when we want to grow adherent cells uh, on a small scale, or we want to do uh, a potentially a high throughput screening of something, or even expansion uh, sometimes in T flasks. So there are many of us out there who have done this. I used to do this um, when I, at my, la at my last job, I did a lot of cell culture and we would just use T flasks and no one ever asked why it's just the flask that we got handed and that's what we used. Um, and up until now, we haven't really had the ability to put these vessels to the test to find out what's really happening inside of them and how good are they really for growing cells. So the T flask, right? Everyone knows about T flasks and, um, and T-flasks have been used because they have a really good surface area to volume ratio. And what this, what this is supposed to mean is that when you sit the T-flask in your CO2 incubator, you have, you know, 5% CO2, 90% uh, humidity, somewhere between, you know, 18 and 20% oxygen in that environment, in the gas environment. Um, we just kind of expect, or we make the convenient assumption that that gas environment will be what the cells are experiencing when they're adhered to the bottom of these flasks. But the reality is that the media, the liquid media creates an insulating layer that doesn't allow the gas to reach the cells where they're growing and it cannot, and, and, the, and the oxygen cannot diffuse quickly enough through the liquid to keep up with the metabolism of the cells as they consume oxygen. And the result is that oftentimes the cells become hypoxic, even anoxic in T-flasks. And I'll show that data here in just a minute. So I want everyone to just take a moment and think about, you know, am I growing T-flasks in a CO2 incubator? Does this apply to me? Am I growing, peach, um, uh, am I growing cells in, in Petri dishes in a CO2 incubator? And how much do I really know about what's happening to the cells and what the cells are experiencing? How many variables am I failing to control that make my results uh, hard to reproduce? So I want people to think about that when I talk about these uh, through these next few slides here. So the researchers uh, in the study that I'm about to introduce used optical sensors to put the T-flask to the test to see what's really happening. And they wanted to check out the KLA, which is just the, the mass transfer coefficient. In this case, it's the transfer of oxygen through the liquid media down to the cells. So they compared, compared um, several small culture devices, including spinner flasks uh, and T-flasks, and, and they just wanted to really see which of these small culture devices um, 
which one of these small vessels was really the best in terms of KLA. And what they found is that the tea flask is in fact the best small vessel to use in general in terms of KLA. And their next idea, uh, they wanted to see, and a lot of us, so, and this is, you know, this again is applicable to many of us. We're trying to use tea flasks, for example, before we scale up to something bigger, we want to scout our process. We want to see um, if our, you know, we want to design our experiment, but we want to do it on a small, inexpensive scale before we ultimately do scale up. But if we're not controlling and if we're not paying attention to things like dissolved oxygen and pH before we scale up, how, are we, how do we have any idea what's going to happen with dissolved oxygen and pH when we ultimately do scale up uh, in our process? Or if we expand to, you know, for example, using more tea flasks, something like that. So these researchers wanted to take a look at this and they wanted to see how scalable a tea flask was to a 10 liter wave bioreactor. And they were using KLA as the parameter that would determine the scalability uh, along with a couple of other things. So they placed the sensor, the dissolved oxygen sensor um, in a tea flask. And in this case, they decided that they would rock the tea flask to create a motion similar to the wave bag. So basically giving the tea flask as many characteristics of a wave bag as they could. So they had the tea flask on a rocking platform that would rock gently back and forth. These are adherent cells um, and they have an, ox an optical ox oxygen sensor in the tea flask, just checking out what the KLA is in the flask. And, uh, and so they found some really, really interesting things. And, and I should also mention, they used a pH uh, sensor as well in the flask, um, which was not the whole point of the study, but they do show that data here. So figures C, D, and E um, from the study, and I want to talk about each one of these. So what they showed is that in a T75, so it's just a normal, you know, everyday T flask, if it's rocking and it has gentle agitation, it actually matches um, the characteristics of a 10 liter uh, wave bioreactor in three very important parameters. First, you see figure C, oxygen. Um, the, the wave bag is in red. The T flask is in black. And you can see that both, uh, in both cases, oxygen levels were maintained throughout the course of this experiment. Um, pH, this one's really, really amazing to me. The pH in the, in the wave bag and the pH in the T75 were almost, they were tracking almost identically. Um, and, and so this is just showing the scalability. Um, if you're rocking your T flask, if you're measuring pH, um, if you're measuring oxygen, you can really get an idea of what's going to happen if you're scaling up. And then ultimately, what we're really interested in is the protein titer. How healthy were the cells? How happy were the cells? Did they produce um, expected yields? Things like that. And what we can see here is that the protein titers were pretty comparable between the two. Obviously, at the end of the day, the wave bag outperformed the T75. But again, you get a good idea of the trends uh, and you get a good idea of what to expect when you do scale up, when you're sensing and when you're trying to monitor different uh, parameters like oxygen and pH and making sure. So, so the important thing to remember here is that the T flask was rocking back and forth. It wasn't just sitting there statically. And the reason why it wasn't sitting there statically is because um, like I mentioned before, the liquid media acts as an insulating layer that doesn't really allow oxygen to reach the cells in time. Um, and the pH can become, you know, too, far too acidic in the bulk solution when, when the T flask is sitting statically. And I'll show that here in a second. So um, this is a study done all the way back in 1996. And I mentioned before that optical sensors have been around for a while, but they just haven't been commercially available. People would use these. They would oftentimes develop their own optical sensors across different lab groups. And this is testing what I'll again call a convenient assumption. Um, and I used to do this exact same thing that I'm about to talk about right here. I'm sure some of you have also done this. So these graphs here that I'm showing, these are T225 flasks with a four millimeter liquid depth. So the media uh, layer is four millimeters deep. And what the researchers wanted to test here is, you know, we've, anyone who's used a T flask, I'm sure it has this experience. We want oxygen, we want the environment in the CO2 incubator to get to the cells. So we think, okay, if I crack the lid of the T flask or if I open the lid of the T flask a little bit, the oxygen will have a better chance of coming into the flask and ultimately getting down to the cells where they're growing. This is again, is a convenient assumption. How could anyone really put this to the test, right? So using optical sensors, they are able to test this. And what you see is that the partially open T flask and the closed T flask um, 
really had similar levels of dissolved oxygen and they tracked almost down to the exact hour during culture. And what you find is that the partially open flask became hypoxic just as quickly as the closed flask. Now the partially open flask did recover a little quicker at the end, but the important point here is that when we do things that are sort of tradition, sort of handed down to us, like cracking open a tea flask, assuming that the oxygen will reach the cells, right? We're just making an assumption. We don't know if that's actually going to work. It's just a, a pro, it's just a, a method that's been handed down to us. And in science, we never want to do something just because it's been handed down to us. We always want to ask questions and put these things to the test to find out what's really happening. Show me the data, right? And what we can see here is that this, this um, convenient assumption, this method that people commonly use, uh, it really doesn't work. And when you have the ability to sense what's really happening in the T-flask, you can find answers like this. So um, again, I just want to reiterate that the reason why this happens is because oxygen does not diffuse through the liquid media as fast as the oxygen is being consumed by the cells that are growing at the bottom of the flask. And what you get is uh, often there's, there's a layer right on top of the cells where they are hypoxic, CO2 begins to build up there, and the bulk solution is not characteristic of what the cells are actually experiencing where they're growing. And hypoxia um, can have a lot of negative effects on your cell culture, right? And, and there's conditions that we call, there's, so there's hypoxic conditions, and then there's also normoxic conditions. And I don't know if normoxic is really a word, but it's a term that people are starting to use. And what it means is just the level of oxygen that a particular cell line is accustomed to what it would experience uh, in a physiologically relevant situation, either in, in the body or, or otherwise. Um, so what we are really trying to move towards is keeping all of our cells at all times under normoxic conditions, um, trying to mimic in vivo as closely as we can, right? We don't want it to be in vitro. We want it to be ex vivo. So you take something that's in vivo and then you just, move it outside of the body, but keep everything else as close to the same as you possibly can. And this is the way we can produce, uh, or this is the way we can get the most reproducible results, the most reliable results when the cells are as healthy and happy as they can possibly be. So we're not risking genetic instability as we're doing passages of cells and ultimately curating a cell line. We want to make sure that those cells are not constantly experiencing hypoxia and accumulating uh, mutations, things that are going to change the characteristics of our cells in ways that we can't understand at the moment. And this is this is extremely relevant for anyone out there who's ultimately trying to get uh, to a clinical setting. If you have a product or a cell product, um, something in cell therapy or even regenerative medicine, um, you know, it's really important if if your product is going back into humans. Um, you need to be able to characterize what's happening with your cell line. You need to be able to characterize what's happening with the cells that you're growing before they end up in a clinical setting. Uh, and before anyone really takes it seriously, we need to move towards GMP. We need to take the art form out of cell culture and turn it into a real science that's backed by data. So um, all of this is really important. And it's kind of shocking when you think about the lack of data that there is um, when we use things like small culture devices, right? And, and this is kind of scary, especially if you're trying to move towards the point where, okay, uh, you know, the FDA needs to accept what I'm doing. I need, to, if I'm growing cells for regenerative medicine, for example, and ultimately I'm trying to implant an organ, or if I'm doing CAR T therapy uh, and trying to inject the cells back into a sick patient, I need to know everything about those cells before I put them back into someone and ultimately risk that person's life, um, especially years down the road. And genetic instability is, is a big question mark here. And there, it is proven that hypoxia, the lack of oxygen, can affect the genetic stability um, of your cell line. So with all this in mind, there were further studies done uh, that build upon the study that I just showed you. And so the result here is that the T-flask is overwhelmingly liquid phase mass transfer limited. And you know, despite the shape of the T-flask and the surface area to volume ratio, the T-flask is, is not able to keep up with the metabolism of adherent cells growing on the bottom of the flask. So uh, another group of researchers used the gentle agitation method to see what they could get out of a tea flask. And here's the setup. Um, it's kind of an ugly slide, but I just want to show what this looks like. 
for anyone wondering. So if you look at the, at the figure here, it's inside of a CO2 incubator. You can see a tea flask. Uh, T, these are T75s in this case. Tea flask sitting on a rocking platform. And then one of the flasks, uh, and another flask in parallel in the same incubator growing above this. And, this. and one of the tea flasks is growing statically. The other is growing on this rocking platform. Um, and you can see the optical sensors placed in the tea flask on the top right there. So the researchers here, I, I want to highlight figures C and D. Uh, again, they're looking at the oxygen levels and the pH levels in the, in the rocking flask as opposed to the static flask. I'll start with pH here in figure D. And what we can see, um, so the static tea flask, the tea flask that's just sitting there at T75, um, the cells are growing, adherent cells are growing on the flask. And when the flask is not moving, when the media is not being agitated, so the media is acting basically as an insulator, you can see that the cells were, and again, keep in mind, the sensors are at the bottom of the culture vessel. The cells are growing over top of the sensors. So the sensors are sensing the microenvironment where the cells are actually growing, not the bulk solution, right? And this is really important because as cells metabolize, they create a microenvironment on the bottom of the flask. And it doesn't matter how low your fill volume is, um, the cells are still going to have some type of microenvironment. And if the media is sitting there statically, you're not really able to mix up that microenvironment to dilute it. And that's what we see here in this graph. So in the static flask, you can see in black um, how the pH drops down to dangerously acidic levels. And you know, even in the rocking flask, pH drops, but what's important Important is that the rocking flask mixes the bulk solution with the microenvironment where the cells are growing to dilute that acidification of the pH, right? And, and so what you see is that we can get the most out of our media when we're mixing it up a little bit. We get the most out of the media, we extend the life of the media, and maintain physiologically relevant conditions for a little bit longer. And then in oxygen, it's, it's uh, even more of a compelling story here. So if you, this is figure C. Um, and again, the static tea flask is in black. And what you see is that, you know, after about 60 hours of culture, the cells are completely anoxic. There is no oxygen left in that flask. And eventually the oxygen recovers. But what this means is that the cells are no longer consuming oxygen for one reason or the other, right? And in the flask that's rocking uh, in, the, in the red line there, we can see that the oxygen levels are very well maintained throughout the course of the experiment. So I've talked a lot about, um, you know, the basic reading device and tea flasks and petri dishes, small culture vessels, things like that. Um, but we also have ways to work with um, bioreactors and also microfluidics devices, um, a whole range of versatile applications. And the way we do this is using fiber optic cables. So again, here on the right, you can see the pH sensor and the dissolved oxygen sensor. And you can see the reading device that I've talked about before, but in this case, um, it's fixed with fiber optic cables that allow us to basically carry that light source from the reading device to some remote location. And we have various ways that we like uh, that we couple the fiber optic cables with the various types of culture vessels that we're using. And I'll show that here in just a second. So, and again, all this is packaged in what we call the ID fiber optic kit. And the kit comes with the reading device, the fiber optic cables, and then um, any number of the different attachment devices that I'll show here, and I'll introduce them on this slide. So um, we have basically three ways that we like to make use of the fiber optic design, uh, three ways that we can couple the fiber optic reading device and use optical sensors with a variety of applications. So the first one is the fiber optic probe, and this is basically like your standard dip probe um, but the nice thing about this is that it has three sensing channels, and I'll explain why that's important in just a minute. We have what we call the external star adapter. This is basically just a way to stick the end of a fiber optic cable to the side of a culture vessel or the bottom or something else like that. Um, and then we have the flow through cell, and the flow through cell is meant to hook into, if you're doing perfusion, if you're doing fed batch, um, you can put the flow through cell in your media line, and you can measure the media as it's flowing. Um, you know, from your reservoir to your bioreactor. So there's a little video playing here. This is showing the fiber optic probe. And, um, and, and so if any of us here are familiar with using a bioreactor, and we're, we all know 
how, and especially if you're doing perfusion, you know how important port space is. On the top of the bioreactor, you have lots of tubes and wires and sensors all over the place coming out of the top of your bioreactor. Um, and with a standard electrochemical probe, it takes up the exact same amount of pore space as our probe, but the difference is that our probe offers dissolved oxygen, pH, and temperature all in the same size as a standard electrochemical probe. So you're really conserving your pore space and you're getting three types of sensing instead of one um, if you're using a bioreactor. And like you saw in the video, you can actually use this probe in a shake flask um, and you can get really stable readings as the flask is, uh, as the flask is shaking up to 300 RPMs. Um, this probe will actually work in even a 250 milliliter shake flask. So if you're using bioreactor, if you're trying to turn a shake flask into a mini bioreactor to scout your process, this is a great way to do that. Here's the external star adapter. And you can see here that it's just sticking to the side of the shake flask here. Um, but this, these can be used in a wide range of applications. So basically, the sensor is stuck on the inside and it's a sensor target. And then you can use the star adapter to stick the end of the fiber optic cable to match up with the sensor. And just some, you know, like an application um, where people use this, and you can almost see it here in this image where you have a star adapter in the gas layer of the vessel and then also in the media layer of the vessel. So uh, if you wanted to test, for example, the oxygen level in the gas phase um, of your vessel, and you also wanted to test the oxygen level simultaneously, in the liquid phase of your vessel, uh, you could do that at the same time using the star adapter. You could find out the actual difference and find out what the oxygen gradient is going from the gas phase down to different depths of media, ultimately down to where the cells are growing using a device like this. And then finally, we had the flow through cell. And this one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it just hooks up to the feeding line directly to the tubes. Um, this, this size that we have here is a three millimeter diameter standard lore lock. Um, and then we also uh, are coming out with a quarter inch diameter and a half inch diameter for different size and different flow rates. Um, so again, these are meant to incorporate into feeding lines, perfusion lines, things like that. And you can get sensing in real time um, in those lines. So here's some examples um, of how these can improve uh, different bioreactors that are pretty inaccessible when it comes to other sensing modalities. So um, if you're trying to use something like a dip probe or if you're using a PBS bioreactor, which I know are pretty popular with a lot of uh, people who are working with stem cells, it's not very easy to get sensors into the smallest size of the PBS bioreactor. This is the smallest size here. And what you can see uh, is that we've used the optical sensors and we've used the star adapters to um, basically outfit this PO bi or PBS bioreactor so we can measure dissolved oxygen and pH um, with a really low profile and it's very simple to do. Here's the G-Rex. This is one we're really excited about. Um, I, I don't know if there are any G-Rex um, users out there, but these things are really starting to gain traction. They're very effective um, for oxygenating cells, uh, which is really important. So, you know, so Wilson Wolf, um, you know, he kind of got the idea that cells are not being oxygenated enough at the bottom of things like T flasks and the G-Rex really addresses this. Um, but we are also able to put sensors in the G-Rex and we have various ways uh, to, to work directly with different G-Rex vessels with our sensing system. So you can see a G-Rex 10 on the left. Um, that's a small 3D printed device that couples the reader with the G-Rex so everything is held in place. And then on the right, again, you can see the star adapter and we've also developed um, a device that holds the G-Rex with the star adapter. So you can use different sizes of the G-Rex with the, our sensing system. And then here, this is a company called Sudan Biopharma. And uh, they've developed this awesome biosettler, which you can see pictured here. So on the left, um, and, and that's Dr. Kampala over there. <laughs> He's a really funny guy. Um, but you can see his bioreactor system and what you're looking at is the biosettler on the right, but on the left is the media reservoir. And you can see all of the wires and the tubes and everything that's coming out of that. It's, it's, there's a lot going on. So what this means is port space is extremely valuable. And so Sudan um, uses our fiber optic probe that I introduced before to basically conserve port space. And you can see on the right, the biosettler. And the other nice thing about this is that the probe can be different lengths. 
and the and the way and this works perfectly in this specific application. Um, so the probe can measure what's happening towards the bottom of the vessel. A different probe of a different length can measure the middle uh, or more towards the top. And again, you're getting you're getting oxygen, pH, and temperature in each one of these probes. So there's three types of sensing for the small footprint of one electrochemical probe, which typically only does one type of sensing. So uh, I've talked a little bit about bioreactors, and, and now I want to talk about microfluidics devices. And this is another great way um, where optical sensors kind of fit. And, um, and this is another way to use the fiber optic system. Um, and, and I'm not sure how many people here are using microfluidics devices right now, like organ chips. Um, but speaking of the FDA, organ chips are something that are really gaining traction, especially because uh, they have the ability to potentially replace animal testing. So we can get with microfluidics devices, with organ chips, we can get uh, more physiologically relevant experiments where it's actual human tissue instead of using an animal analog that may end up failing, you know, phase two or phase three in a clinical trial and a lot of time and money is wasted, right? So, so organ chips are gaining traction for these reasons and optical sensors are a great way to incorporate. There are three ways we like to do this in the media reservoir, in the, in the perfusion lines, um, or also in the chips themselves. And I'll show those here in a minute. So again, a lot of advantages to organ chips, uh, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this, but if, if anyone here is familiar with them, um, I hope you're as excited as I am about, about these really starting to emerge. So here's a, a typical organ chip setup. You can see the media reservoir, you can see the feeding lines, and then the chip itself. So here we have, um, this is out of Texas A&M University, one of our collaborators who's doing organ chip experiments, um, and they're doing co-culturing mammalian and bacterial uh, cells in the single organ chip. And what you can see here are our optical dissolved oxygen sensors embedded within the chip. These are three millimeter sensors. You can see in, on the very left, uh, that orange sensor there, that's in one of the wells. And then the third well, there's also a sensor that's facing the other direction. So these are three millimeter sensors that are embedded in the wells of these chips to get real-time oxygen monitoring of this co-culture. Uh, this is another example. This is out of Wake Forest University. Um, this is another one of our customers and she has designed this organ chip. Again, you can see there are three pH sensors inside of this single chip. Each of these are three millimeter sensors again. So she's measuring pH in real time um, and she's testing lung tissue with an air and a liquid interface. And she wants to, to measure the change in pH um, when she does, you know, introduces different gases to the lung tissue. And then here's how we, how we set these up typically. So one thing we're really good at is 3D printing um, different, different um, ways to accommodate different things like organ chips. And you can see this 3D printed device that couples our fiber optic cables, which you know, come down through the device, it holds the organ chip in place, and the fiber optic cables enter um, where they can monitor these sensors that you can see placed in the organ chip. And then finally, there are a couple of other things, other products we have that build upon some of the studies I showed you earlier. One is the ID rocker. This is a, a standard rocking table, but the magic here is that our sensors and reading devices are embedded in this machine. And this actually allows a closed loop feedback control. So this rocking device is not constantly rocking. It sits level and um, you, the user can input an oxygen set point. And as the cells um, begin to respire and they metabolize and use the oxygen, the oxygen levels will dip. When it dips below the oxygen set point, the rocking device will begin to, begin to rock back and forth until the oxygen levels rise above the set point at which it will stop rocking. So Basically, this is a way for the cells um, to call for their own oxygen. The, the machine can mechanically respire, um, and this is a really healthy way to grow, to grow cells in tea flasks. Uh, petri dishes work with the system as well. And then uh, for people doing shake flask experiments, so we offer our own shaker system, but you know the obvious thing is if you're doing shaker experiments, you've got your own shaker table usually. So what we have, uh, and what's even more popular actually, we, we have everything necessary to, to outfit, to upgrade your shaker system uh, to using optical sensors. So you can, there are flask holders that we developed that couple our reading device 
with the shake flask so nothing moves around as, as it's shaking. And what's really cool about this is that you can get uh, real-time inline pH and dissolved oxygen sensing as the shaker is shaking. You don't have to stop shaking. It can continue shaking the entire time and you can get sensing all throughout the experiment. Um, so as I wrap up here, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what we have planned for the future. So, you know, dissolved oxygen and pH, these are the basics. Uh, our next project is a glucose sensor and then a lactate sensor. Um, we're getting pretty close with the glucose sensor. Um, and it, it, these are going, again, to be optical sensors. So we're adding to the sensor portfolio that you can do optically. So we're, we're providing a lot more uh, metabolites um, that you can add to your sensing portfolio for those interested in these types of things. And here's just a quick example of what can happen when you combine dissolved oxygen and pH sensing with another sensing modality. So there's a company out of Germany called Aquila, um, and they work with microbial and yeast cultures, um, especially in shaker systems. And they have a really nice biomass um, sensor that, that also works optically. So, uh, and you can see these here combined in, in the system. Uh, and, and so what you see here is in a shake flask, um, the workers at Aquila were using our system combined with their system to monitor pH, dissolved oxygen, um, and biomass. And, and in this case, in this graph, they're using a yeast. And what you can see here is the, the dioxic shift um, occurs just as expected in line with the oxygen as the oxygen levels dip. And the power here is that you're able to characterize and you know the expected uh, time for metabolism when you're growing in this microbial culture. And then here is E. coli. And here what you can see is as the oxygen drops, uh, mixed acid fermentation is taking place, and you can also see the expected pH drop. So it's just a really nice way to visualize the metabolism of your cells. And this, this kind of goes to show why different types of sensing are important. You have a great idea. You have a great insight into what your cells are actually doing and what they're actually experiencing uh, as they're growing. So the more things you're monitoring, the more information you have, the more your cells are able to communicate with you uh, to let you know what they need to be healthier and, and more productive. Uh, so here's the bibliography for anyone who's interested. Um, any, you know, anyone who wants to check out the presentation, I'm happy to send it along. Um, just please reach out to me. And with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for your time. I think I might have gone over by a couple minutes, so I apologize for that. Um, but please follow us on social media. Um, reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to talk. If anyone has questions, we want to be in communication. We love talking to scientists uh, and learning what everyone's working on. So. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass it back. Thank you, Jake, for um, giving us an overview. And it's, you know, the technical details about how we can keep the measurement of pH, dissolved pH, and uh, even the oxygen, and probably even the glucose, eventually, uh, using the technology. And it's extremely useful, not only just to keep cultures healthy and happy while we are uh, culturing them, but also from stem cell perspective, when we are going ahead for organoid cultures or trying to mimic hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or ischemic conditions. So uh, due to want of time, I would uh, prefer uh, participants to uh, send the questions through chat box and I would move on to the next speaker. So, um, Rob, we have made your co-host, and uh, so uh, Rob Day, he joined MyCore Biosciences in 2014 as Solutions and Support Scientist, and in 2019, he became the team leader of LICOR, an in vivo imaging team. Prior to LICOR, he has spent 10 years in various laboratories, teaching positions, and even at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at San Antonio where his work focused on understanding the mechanisms underlying diabetes-induced kidney damage. Rob received his master's degree in cell and molecular biology from the University of Texas at San, San Antonio. So the presentation is now yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction. And uh, let me share my screen here real quick. So I'm going to second what, what Jake mentioned, uh, starting his presentation. Uh, it's 
pretty early here in Texas, so I do apologize if uh, uh, I stumble a little bit. But hang on, I think I shared the wrong screen. Let's see here. Bear with me a sec. Do you guys see the uh, the slides? Yes. You do. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, well, again, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to chat with you guys a little bit today. Um, I jumped on while Dr. Dotto was still still presenting a little bit, so I know she's already been talking a bit about uh, some of the topic that I'm going to be bringing to you guys today, which really has to do with using near infrared fluorescent imaging um, for your in vivo studies, uh, uh, utilizing the Pearl Trilogy imaging system. Um, if you're not familiar with LICOR, uh, we have been around for a while. We were founded about 50 years ago. Uh, and our initial focus was primarily on um, design and instrumentation for environmental science research, and we, which we still do today. Uh, but about 20, 25 years ago, we kind of branched more onto the bio side of things uh, with the develop of, development of a uh, DNA analyzer and then later our Odyssey platform of systems, which we're probably most known for. Um, the, uh, the Odyssey systems are going to be near infrared laser-based point scanners uh, that are capable of performing a number of different applications. They can kind of be the workhorses of the basic molecular lab. And that you can do everything from fluorescent-based Western blots through plate-based assays where you're uh, looking at uh, protein expression within a population of cells in a microtiter plate to tissue sections, gel-based assays, so on and so forth. Uh, and then of course our Pearl Trilogy imager, which is our dedicated small animal system uh, that, that combines your more traditional bioluminescent imaging as well as your near infrared fluorescent imaging um, are available. So today, you know, really what I want to kind of go through is, you know, focus on the in vivo side of, of things that, that LICOR can help you guys out with uh, to help advance the research in your lab. Um, so let's start off by talking a little bit about some of the advantages of near infrared fluorescence. Now, you may be asking yourself, why am I starting off this presentation by showing a picture of a Western blot and a chemiluminescent Western blot at that when this is supposed to be a talk more focused on in vivo imaging? Um, basically, this is just throwing that out as an example that there are a number of assays that we use in the lab every day that utilize enzymatic reactions to measure some type of signal output. So whether you're doing a Western blot or something like an ELISA or for in vivo work, you're doing bioluminescence. The principle behind them all is basically the same, right? Regardless of the application, they're all gonna require that the addition of a substrate of some type needs to be added in order to detect your target of interest. And so while this enzymatic amplification of signal generally produces a very high level of sensitivity. Uh, it, it's always important to remember that these enzymatic reactions are constantly changing. You know, keep in mind you got that signal that's increasing, plateauing, and eventually fading over time. So they're dynamic. And there's a lot of variables or a lot of factors that can affect the activity of that enzymatic reaction. Things like time and temperature and substrate, uh, the type of substrate versus the amount of substrate you use, just to name a few. And so these things can make enzymatic reactions difficult to accurately reproduce day to day and to really get the type of consistent quantitative results that we're oftentimes after. Um, you know, you're basically trying to hit a moving target, if you will. So as far as in vivo imaging goes, bioluminescence would really fall into that category of enzymatic assays. Um, you know, the principle behind it is pretty basic. You have a cell line of some type that you have transfected to express a luciferase gene. And then when you add a substrate of some type, for example, luciferin, and the presence of ATP and molecular oxygen, you're gonna get an unsoon enzymatic reaction that ultimately produces light as a byproduct. 
and, and that light can be detected by an imager um, for uh, some type of analysis. Now, bioluminescence works. You know, it's it's an assay that we have used for a long time. Um, and like I said, it works especially well for very specific types of imaging experiments. Um, for example, gene expression studies. Um, some studies though, bioluminescence might not be the best option for you, you know. For example, um, you know, if you are in the process of trying to develop a therapeutic, all right, um, there's some of the limitations associated with bioluminescence are the fact that because it requires the use of non-native or transfected cell lines, you're limited to research purposes only. Um, highly unlikely we're going to reach a point where we can genetically modify a human to express luciferase. Um, so there are times that, like I said, bioluminescence will work very well for your studies to answer the types of questions you're asking, but there needs to be an alternative. And a good alternative for that is fluorescence. Uh, this is a good way to get around those limitations of an enzymatic reaction um, in that you're able to get a much more stable detection system using fluorescent dyes or fluorophores. Um, now, Using fluorescence, like I said, it eliminates that variability that you see, but it's important to remember that not all fluorescence is created equally. So as researchers, we tend to be very familiar with uh, dyes and fluorophores that emit down in the visible portion of the spectrum. Uh, this is where you're going to find your Psi-3 and Psi-5, uh, Fitzy and Dappy, uh, or if you work with fluorescent proteins, this would be where GFP would be located. Um, and so we can use these fluors or, or these fluorescent proteins like GFP for a number of applications, but there are some drawbacks to imaging in visible wavelengths. And that really has to do with just the high amount of autofluorescence that occurs um, below about 700 nanometers. And so with any fluorescent application, if you have high autofluorescence or high background, it's really going to limit your lower level of, uh, or your lower limit of detection or limit your sensitivity overall. Now, if we move into the longer wavelengths of the near infrared, particularly between about 700 and 800 nanometers, there's little to no autofluorescence, uh, which is gonna translate to much better sensitivity being achieved. Now, if you're doing something like a membrane-based assay, like a Western blot, this is important because membranes of, nitrocellulose or PVDF are both going to light up under visible wavelengths. Um, whereas doing a infrared fluorescent western blot, membrane background is lower, you're able to detect uh, much fainter bands on your western blot. This is the same uh, for your cell-based assays. You know, all cells are going to have a certain amount of autofluorescence when they're exposed to visible wavelengths of light. Um, for example, here we're just looking at unstained, untreated, fixed 3T3 cells uh, that were imaged under a microscope. And as you can see, under your red, green, and blue filters there, uh, these cells are just lighting up a little bit. Now, shifting out to the infrared, going out to 800 nanometers, even triple your exposure times, that, that cellular autofluorescence is virtually non-existent. So this is going to result in much better sensitivity for your cell-based assays. Now, for in vivo imaging, this is just as important. Not only do we need to get deep penetration of that excitation light into our tissues and our organs, but we need to be able to measure that emitted signal from the fluorophore that's bouncing back out of the animal and um, is, is basically going up towards the detector of the imager. So here what we're looking at is just a representation of uh, the extinction coefficient of hemoglobin. So this is using an example of at different wavelengths, how much light does hemoglobin absorb? And what you can see down in the visible portion where we're gonna see our GFP proteins, our RFP, and all those other visible fluorophores that I mentioned earlier, you're gonna have a lot of that signal just gets absorbed directly into the tissue and doesn't get out to the detector. So if anybody has ever tried working with GFP before, GFP imaging is great when you're in cells, 
but trying to do it in vivo, any targets deeper than right below the surface of the skin can be extremely difficult to detect. Now, once you get out past 900 nanometers or so, you have water starting to absorb light. And so background and tissue absorption goes back up. So this near infrared imaging window between approximately 700 and 800 nanometers really is a sweet spot for the best sensitivity possible for a fluorescent in vivo imaging. Now, if we were to look at a, an example of that in the context of a real animal, here we have a mouse uh, that has not been treated with anything. There was no dye or probe injected into this animal. And all we're doing is, is, is looking at a white light image versus 700 nanometers and 800 nanometers on our Pearl Trilogy system. And then there are tubes of iodide 800 CW as well as Psi 5.5 as reference. And if you compare these two, just kind of the general tissue background that we're seeing between 700 and 800, the difference is night and day. Um, now, 700 nanometers, which is in the infrared, it's right there on that transition. It's on that cusp between visible and infrared. So background is going to be a little bit higher than what you can see further out uh, into the infrared. But just imagine how much greater this background would be the further down into the visible wavelengths you go. Now, what probably stands out to you guys in this image is going to be just how much the abdomen is fluorescing here. And again, nothing was injected into this animal. This is all due to autofluorescence of the animal chow. So the, the standard chow that we feed to our laboratory mice and rats is generally very high in chlorophyll content. And chlorophyll is going to fluoresce, uh, particularly at 700 nanometers. So this is something to be aware of and um, to take precautions for. There are purified diets that are chlorophyll free that you can transition your animals over to prior to your, Im your imaging experiments uh, to really flush out any of that nonspecific signal. And this is gonna be especially important if you plan to do any type of uh, imaging in the gut or the abdominal region of the animal. So, Near-infrared fluorescent imaging, again, is going to have a lot of advantages just in terms of, you know, the high levels of sensitivity uh, and that stable signal. It's non-enzymatic. Um, but because there's multiple detection channels uh, are often available with fluorescent imaging, it means you can multiplex. You can probe for multiple targets at the same time. Um, overall, fluorescent imaging is extremely easy to incorporate into your research. You know, with bioluminescence, you are going to have to transfect a cell line to express luciferase. Um, that can be time consuming if you don't already have those cell lines established. Uh, with fluorescence, it really involves taking a probe of some kind, labeling it with the fluorescent dye, and then you inject that into the animal. So there's not a, a ton of prep work that has to go into, um, you know, setting up those imaging experiments. I think the, one of the biggest advantages of fluorescent imaging is the fact that there's a great deal of potential for clinical translation because it doesn't require the use of transfected cells. So for researchers uh, that are in the process of developing, say, a targeted therapeutic, I think this is an especially important feature. Now, there are a number of targets for which we can use near infrared imaging to uh, detect different molecular events. Um, you know, we could say target a cell surface receptor. Um, these are fairly common targets as their overexpression on the cell surface is oftentimes correlated with different disease states. So you could take, um, let's say a targeting agent, maybe a peptide like EGF uh, and label that with a dye inject that into an animal, allow that to sweep through the body, and then bind to any cells that are overexpressing the EGF receptor, like you'd find in many different tumor states. Um, so that's, that's one very common method of using near infrared imaging for, uh, for uh, detecting molecular targets. Now, another option would be to target a transporter. So something like GLUT1 can often be targeted with a dye-labeled molecule like uh, 2-deoxyglucose. 
So here we're taking advantage of um, or targeting cells that are undergoing increased rates of metabolism. You know, in different tumor uh, stages, we see this. Maybe during states of inflammation, you're going to see increased glucose uptake into your cells. Uh, and so in this case, that labeled ligand gets bound by the transporter. It gets incorporated into the cell and allows for that amplification of signal. Likewise, we could also take antigens and target those in the same way by using a dye-labeled antibody. Now, another method could be enzymatic activation or using an activatable probe, uh, which would initially be non-fluorescent uh, due to the use of a quencher molecule. But in the presence of a particular enzyme like a protease, that molecule gets cleaved and then light can be emitted, uh, which could be detected. One of the other most common methods uh, or targets for near-infrared imaging would be just a general nonspecific biodistribution. Uh, let's just take this labeled molecule and inject it into your animal, allow it to freely flow, and observe where does it accumulate within the animal. Um, this can be, be used not just for determining the general biodistribution, but you can look at what's the best delivery method, What's the clearance rate or the mechanism of clearance? Um, you know, is your probe uh, basically processed by the liver? Is it processed by the kidney? How long does it take to clear those probes out? Um, so a, a great deal of information can be um, figured out about your target and how it responds within uh, your, your organism that you're studying. Now at LICOR, we have a number of pre-conjugated, pre-validated optical probes that are available. Um, for example, we have that EGF peptide that's been labeled with one of our dyes called IRDI 800 CW. So this is uh, available to target that overexpression of the EGF receptor. Um, on a similar note, we have an RGD peptide that's been labeled uh, to target integrin expression on the cell surface. Uh, we can target metabolic state, you know, increased rates of glycolysis, inflammation, hypoxia using 2-deoxyglucose. We have another agent called bone tag, uh, which is a tetracycline derivative, which will incorporate into bone. And so this can be used just as a, basically tagging your bone as a, as a structural reference, um, or if you are actively doing research, studying bone structure, bone mineralization, bone repair, uh, that can be a useful probe for you. In addition to that, we have universal contrast agents like polyethylene glycol. Um, you know, depending on how you inject a labeled PEG uh, compound into an animal, you might be able to specifically image the vasculature versus uh, the lymphatics. Uh, this is great for, for tumor imaging as well. Now, in addition to these uh, kind of ready-made optical probes that we have available, we have a number of dyes that are available in a reactive form. So, these are basically available for you to perform your own bioconjugations and label whatever type of molecule you want to use as your probe, whether that's a peptide, a targeting antibody, uh, a small molecule drug, a nanoparticle, or even if you just want to directly label cells, you can, you can use these different reagents uh, uh, for that. Now let's look at a couple of examples. Now in this case, tumor imaging is definitely one of the most common uses of uh, the pearl system and, and near-infrared imaging in general. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have a number of different probes already available specifically for tumor imaging. Uh, in this case, we have two different cancer models. On the left here, this is a nod skid mouse that had had prostate tumor cells uh, implanted orthotopically and were allowed to grow for several weeks. Uh, and then these, uh, tumors were then detected using that iodide 800 CW EGF peptide. So again, here we're taking advantage of that overexpression of a receptor on the surface of those tumor cells. Here in another example, um, we are detecting this tumor using the 2-deoxyglucose. So again, this is based on that, that um, probe being taken up by the GLUT1 transporter in those cells uh, that are undergoing increased rates of metabolism. That 2-deoxyglucose, again, can also be used for uh, disease states like inflammation, arthritis. Uh, here we have a DBA collagen antibody-induced arthritis model uh, where 
if we compare these control animals to arthritic mice at the bottom, we can clearly see the accumulation of this labeled 2DG in the feet and ankles of the arthritic mice. As far as lymphatic and vasculature imaging goes, again, this is where we're going to use that polyethylene glycol or PEG compound. Um, you know, depending on how you inject it, uh, will determine where it goes. So here up at the top, we can see just within um, you know, 15 to 20 minutes following intradermal injection on the right side of the tail here, we can see that agent is draining there into the sciatic lymph node. Uh, whereas if we did an IV injection, we're able to um, actually detect a tumor in the surrounding vasculature uh, right there in this nude mouse. Now, with you know, fluorescent imaging, if, if, if we're doing the GFP imaging, for example, so I mentioned one of the challenges with that is deep tissue targets, right? Anything below the surface of the skin is difficult to detect, right? So with infrared, we have the sensitivity that we're actually able to detect deeper targets, right? That light is gonna, gonna get down in there deep enough to be able to detect that, for example, the lung imaging. Um, lungs can be difficult to detect anything in because there's a lot of other tissue. You've got bone that you're imaging through. Uh, but here we're showing an example where tumors within the lung can be detected. What we have here is a, uh, this is an inducible lung tumor model uh, where a mutant form of crest was expressed. And so these animals developed multifocal lung tumors. And so these researchers wanted to treat these animals with several different drugs and really just monitor them for changes in tumor burden. And so, oh, sorry about that. Slides went all over the place. All right. Uh, so here what we can see on either side of the animal, both the left and the right flanks, we were able to detect uh, a fluorescent signal, which would indicate uh, that a tumor is likely. So upon uh, sacrifice of the animal harvesting the lungs, ex vivo imaging on the pearl did confirm that there were tumors present in both the right and left lobes of the lungs there. Now brain imaging is another thing that can be tricky sometimes. Not so much as far as can we image it, but can you get your probe actually into the brain? Um, if you can actually deliver your probe there, then it can be imaged using infrared imaging. Um, so whether you have to uh, do a direct injection, intrathecal or intracranial injection, or or you know modulate the permeability of the blood-brain barrier somehow, or if your probe can just freely cross the blood-brain barrier, if it can get in there, we can image it. What we have here is an example of an inducible Parkinson's-like model. Um, and we are detecting apoptotic cells in the brain using a probe called PSVU-794. Uh, this probe binds specifically to uh, phosphatidylserine residues in these apoptotic cell membranes. And so if we compare that to a control animal that received a non-targeting dye, you can see there's a significant, a, a far significant more signal uh, in the Parkinson's mouse than the control. Now here's some examples of the bone imaging um, with the bone tag. Now one of the things about fluorescent imaging is that it's not oftentimes thought to be very high resolution in vivo. Um, you know, if we think about the other images that we've shown previously, you're generally going to see a spot or a blob of signal. Um, but here you can see that it is possible to get fairly high resolution images and, and really make out structures deep within the animal using these fluorescent agents. So here with the bone tag, you know, we can clearly make out, you know, each in, of the vertebrae here, the individual ribs, and all the bones there within the feet and the ankle of the mouse. Now, something else that's kind of exciting to, to, to think about is the, the potential for infrared fluorescent proteins. So I've brought it up a couple of times today, some of the challenges with GFP. Um, so, over the past you know, 10 years or so, a number of infrared fluorescent proteins have been developed that all emit light at or around 700 nanometers. And so, uh, for example, 
713, IRFP 713 is a really good example of that. And so that can, you know, kind of give you the advantages of GFP, but the sensitivity of infrared uh, and can serve as a substitute for GFP or for uh, your traditional bioluminescent imaging. Here in this mouse, uh, two different cell lines were injected. Uh, here we have a cell line that was stably expressing IRFP 713 versus another cell line that was uh, expressing luciferase. And so in order to detect this signal on the bottom in the green, a substrate luciferin substrate had to be injected, an incubation period had to take place uh, to allow that signal to start generating um, and then could be imaged. Whereas the IRFP signal is detected without any type of substrate at all. Now, one useful application for this could be, for example, tracking stem cells. Uh, here we have an example um, where a group was kind of comparing GFP versus IRFP uh, expressing cardiac mesenchymal stem cells uh, in infarcted hearts. And so this was two days following uh, myocardial infarct uh, and cell transplantation. Uh, they found that the mice that had been treated with stem cells that were uh, expressing IRFP, uh, there was signal detected within the chest of the mouse. And this was confirmed ex vivo using uh, looking at some tissue sections from the heart there. Now, in addition to cell tracking, you can do uh, biodistribution of your, your, your labeled nanoparticle in this case. Um, this group was looking at two different cancer models, a uh, uterine as well as an ovarian model. Uh, where they were injecting a labeled siRNA nanoparticle that specifically targeted a protein involved in tumor metastasis. And really, they had two questions with the study. One was they wanted to find out what's going to be the best delivery method of their nanoparticle, either IV or IP injection. And then after that, they wanted to find out about the biodistribution. They wanted to see how does it clear and does it localize to any tissues other than their tumors? Well, as you can see from their in vivo images here, the largest accumulation of signal where the tumors were located uh, was in the animals that had been given the IP injections. So definitely indicating that IP would be the preferred method of probe delivery for that therapeutic. And then this was confirmed looking at ex vivo images that were also taken on the PEARL Whereas if you look at the bottom of these figures where the tumors are located, signal is detected in the tumors only with the IP injections and not with the IV. As far as general biodistribution goes, they see that aside from kidney and uh, kidney and livers in the uterine model, uh, which would be uh, basically the road of clearance, uh, there was no accumulation of that nanoparticle to any other tissue. So it was specific for the tumors there. Now, another thing you can do with fluorescent imaging is combine that with other imaging modalities, right? So there's a, a large number of other molecular imaging techniques available. They all offer, or, or they all answer or address slightly different questions, but they oftentimes complement each other. So it's possible to take a probe and dual label it. In this case, this group had implanted prostate tumors on both flanks of a mouse. One tumor was positive uh, for prostate-specific membrane antigen. The other one was negative for that. And then they took a PSMA targeting agent that was dual labeled with IRDI-800-CW, as well as uh, Indium-111 for SPECT imaging. And what you can see here in both modalities, you're able to see that the PSMA positive tumors are lighting up. The tumors that are negative for PSMMA have no signal detected. In both cases, you can get some uh, uh, clearance information as far as kidneys and bladder uh, lighting up as well. So this just goes to show that the ability to use a single agent to image using multiple modalities is possible. Now with that, let's talk a little bit more about the Pearl Trilogy system. And I know, uh, again, in some of the other talks that you guys have had today, uh, and I believe tomorrow also, you're going to be seeing some more information about the PEARL. Um, but this system really is unique uh, among small animal imaging systems, I think, for, for a number of reasons. Um, 
most importantly, I think would be the dynamic range of this instrument or how much signal can you actually acquire in a single acquisition. Um, the Pearl has a dynamic range uh, basically broader than anything that's gonna be biologically relevant. So what this means for you guys is that your weak signals and strong signals can all be detected at the same time. This will be especially important if you're doing any type of longitudinal imaging, maybe imaging the same mouse at multiple time points over the course of a couple of weeks. Because the dynamic range is so broad, you won't have to change any of your camera settings or make adjustments. So you'll really be able to do comparisons of your images taken at different time points. Take that dynamic range, on top of how easy it is to use these systems, the sensitivity uh, and the, the, the highly reproducible nature of this system um, really allows you to get some high quality data from this. Now, expand on that a little bit. Here's an example of the wide dynamic range. Again, with many imagers that have a limited dynamic range, they're gonna saturate as signal increases with tumor growth. Uh, so this might require some camera adjustments uh, or reduction in exposure times, but this can also result in an image that looks very similar to previous images where in, let's say the case of looking at tumor growth, it might look like the tumor was smaller than it actually was. Uh, so that makes it very difficult to assess that tumor growth. On the other hand, here with the pearl, what we see is that because that dynamic range is so broad, we don't have to make any type of camera adjustments whether it's week one, week three, or week five, we're able to use the exact same acquisition settings and really be able to track the progression of that tumor over time. Now, there are, you know, if, if, if your lab is like the typical imaging labs, you've got a lot of equipment in it. And a lot of that equipment can be very complex to operate, require continual training. Um, that can make it difficult to get good results sometimes. One of the things that we tried to do when we designed the Pearl was make it a system that was extremely simple to use. Uh, and that's from everything from the outside of the instrument where there's not a lot of you know, filters or uh, you know, camera adjustments, anything like that you have to make to the acquisition software where it's really just a single click of a button. This camera button will start acquiring an image and within 30 seconds you have your data. So by making a system easy to use, that minimizes some of the user to user variation or variability or error uh, that can take place when we're doing these imaging experiments. And ultimately that just helps you have more confidence in the data that you're obtaining. Now that sensitivity for deep tissue imaging is extremely important. You know, this is the, the characteristics of low background due to working in the infrared as well as the optical design of the pearl gives us that ability to really be able to take deep tissue targets, and very early stages of, in this example, tumor growth, all right? Here, if you're wanting to track those molecular events over time, you know, this is really imperative to be able to have that. Um, as seen in this image, you know, even these deep tissue orthotopic tumors like we have here can be imaged well before this is a palpable tumor, uh, in this case, as early as three weeks after induction. Uh, and because the dynamic range is so broad, again, we're able to track that all the way out to your endpoint. With any top-down type imager, there's always the concern if there's going to be any variation across your imaging field. Um, you know, you'll generally see a bright spot in the center that might, um, you know, kind of dim out as you get out, out to the outsides in like a fishbowl effect. Uh, and so, there could be concerns sometimes that if you place your animal or you place your tissue in a different orientation on that imaging bed, are you gonna see a different result? Well, the patented optical system on the Pearl was designed to have extremely even illumination of our imaging area, as well as even detection. So in this case, if we took a brain uh, that uh, was taken from a mouse and imaged it in the same location three different times, you're gonna see the exact same uh, data. Basically that CV is practically zero. Whereas if we moved that same brain to eight different locations across the imaging area, CV is still well below 3%. Right? Um, other imagers that might have variation upwards of 25% across the imaging area with the pearl, that's something that you no longer would have to ever worry about. Now, 
at the very beginning, I mentioned our other imagers like our Odyssey CLX system. And the Perl and the Odyssey CLX actually pair very well together into what we call our small animal imaging workstation uh, uh, confirmation. And the reason for this is the types of applications that we can do on the Odyssey complement your in vivo imaging. For example, Western blots, cell-based assays, things like that. Those are assays that can be performed prior to your imaging experiments. You know, anytime we're about to inject a probe or a drug uh, into an animal, we want to do some characterization studies before that, right? We need to know how is it gonna bind? We know, is it specific for my target? We need to learn things like dosages. Uh, and so we can use assays like these plate-based in-cell Western assays to be able to, you know, calculate IC50s and, and, and plot out dose response curves and assess the binding affinity of, of, of our probe to our target. Um, you know, we can then do our in vivo imaging on the pearl and once you've reached your endpoint and you harvest your organs from that animal, we can do whole organ imaging on both systems, the Pearl as well as the Odyssey CLX, as well as microscopic tissue imaging uh, on the CLX as well. So there's a lot of information that you can get from both systems here, uh, both before and after your in vivo studies. Now, as I'm starting to wrap it up, the last thing I really want to touch on here is the potential for clinical translation. Uh, and this is going to be especially important for those researchers that are uh, in the process of trying to develop some form of targeted therapeutic. Um, the uh, LICOR IR dye technology has actually already been used in more than 20 clinical trials. Uh, the majority of these using the IR dye 800 CW, which is the same dye that I've we've used in all these previous images I've shown today, um, for applications such as uh, fluorescent image guided surgery, uh, ureter delineation, photoimmunotherapy, so on. There's 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 a number of different dyes that we have uh, that that have been studied in these trials. The fluorescent image guided surgery is something I think really has a lot of potential moving forward. Um, you know, here's an example where you can see three different uh, tumor types, whether it's colon, breast, and head and neck tumors uh, that have all been, uh, uh, these mice have been injected with a targeting antibody uh, that was labeled with IRD 800 CW. And so you can see how the surgeon would be able to, uh, you know, visualize these tumors uh, and, have a better chance of actually excising or resecting the full tumor uh, and, and, and getting cleaner margins. Um, you know, speaking of clinical trials, there's actually another one uh, that's ongoing right now where pearls are being used. So it's a similar fluorescent image guided surgery type, uh, type trial, but they have a pearl that they keep right there in the wet lab. And so as the surgeon resects the, the uh, tumor from the patients, they can do a quick check on the pearl uh, for margins before they send it off to pathology for, um, uh, for sectioning. So, so as we wrap up here, you know, the, I think the, 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 one of the big points that I want to make is that, you know, whether you're doing basic research or you're in the process of developing a therapeutic, we know that's a long process. It can be tedious. Uh, and there, there's really a lot involved from that discovery and screening through all your optimization experiments, your preclinical studies. And to be successful, you really need to have confidence in the assays that you perform and the data that you obtain. Uh, so at LightCore, like we have a number of tools that have been designed to help you um, with all your research. And while today we really focus more on the in vivo side, there's other things we can help with from your quantitative Westerns to your cell-based assays in vivo, ex vivo imaging. Um, we have a protein profiling service, you know, reagent software solutions. Really, the list goes on and on. Um, so, you know, if you if you do ever have questions or you need anything, please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, either directly to Lycor or to our distribution partner, Incarp. Um, as uh, you know, we we definitely want to do everything we can to help ensure that you guys are getting the best quality data possible. With that, thank you very much for your time.
Uh, and if anybody has any questions, I, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so there is a quick one question, which I can see in the chat box. So will exposing patients to uh, 700 and 800 nanometer be harmful? Will the methodology be the same as for a small animal? Um, you know, it's, it's from what I've seen, I haven't seen any studies so far that are saying that it's, there's any type of toxicity to it. Um, yeah, there are, like, there's over 20 clinical trials that have already been underway um, using the iodi 800 CW, uh, and so far it's proven to be uh, uh, safe and effective. Thank you. Um, so thanks a lot for uh, joining our symposium in such an un unearthly hour from your place. Uh, <laughs> that means a lot, and it was not a recorded talk, and it definitely uh, was helpful for all of us. So uh, with that, we will end today's session. I know that we have pulled out at least 45 minutes or more than that from all of you uh, with the symposium. And that was a little bit of due to online glitches and problems which we, we had expected, but that's fine. That much we can do for science. And I hope to meet you all again tomorrow, 9 a.m. again for the uh, symposium second day. So tune in again tomorrow, 9 a.m. Bye for the day.